Good evening. In compliance with Chapter 551 of the Texas Government Code, I call to order a public hearing of the Board of Trustees of the Austin Independent School District for Thursday, June 23, 2022 at 7.02 p.m. A quorum of the board are physically present at AISD central office to conduct this meeting. Board meetings are open to the public based on space availability to ensure social distancing and the health and safety of our community and staff. This meeting is being is streaming live on AISD TV and Apple TV. It's also being broadcast on cable channel 22 through Spectrum Grande and on channel 99 through AT&T Universe. Closed captioning in English is available on these platforms for individuals who are deaf or hard of hearing. And to our audience tuning in remotely and here in person, welcome and thank you for being here, for joining us here tonight. We will move to the approval of the agenda. Secretary Singh, do you have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Having a motion by Secretary Singh and a second by Trustee Zapata to approve the agenda, all those in favor, please raise your right hand and the motion passes by all those on the dais. Next is an opportunity for the public to share comments with the board. This time allows speakers to comment publicly pertaining to the adoption of the recommended FY 2022-23 budget. Members of the public wishing to participate in the public hearing portion of our meeting called the dedicated AISD phone line in advance of the meeting to sign up to speak in person or to audio record their remarks. Tonight we have five people signed up to speak in person and we have three who have left a recorded message. We will begin with the in-person testimony and in order to provide as many opportunities for input as possible within a limited time period at this meeting, each speaker will be allotted one minute. No substitutions or yielding of time to others is permitted and callers who signed up to speak in person are welcome to come to the microphone when their name is called and we will call um, three names at a time as you come to the microphone, there's a device that will light up as you move through your one minute of allotted time. When the buzzer sounds, please make a final thought in one sentence. And again, we ask that whether you come to give a complaint or praise that you reference the staff member by position or by abbreviated last name. We ask that all audience members, whether speaking or not, to please show respect for others at all times. And tonight's speakers are, the first three are Candace Hunter, Bree Rolf, and the third is Megan Vasquez. And as you make your way up, Candace, I'm just gonna mention the other two, Jacob Morgan and Eric Ramos. So you may proceed. Good evening. I'm sure you've done your own research into the essential areas redesign, and like any reasonable individual, you have questions about this plan, its execution, and its perpetuation of inequity toward historically and currently underserved students. This evening, I will just share with you some of the questions I have. Currently, on AISD careers, there is at least 45 positions posted for PETAs. Clayton and Zilker simply state multiple positions. Is this all the workforce it will take to execute this redesign? Have all the other schools filled their positions? Has there been a training created for PETAs by human capital, or will this be thrown on the physical education teacher? Since TAs will not be the teacher of record, nor will they be in the room with the teacher of record, what is the protocol for accidents and injuries? What is the district's liability? What support will be provided to them when completing progress reports, entering grades, and entering PACER test score information? And finally, with campuses needing to hire teachers, principals, and even parent support specialists, will all the PE teachers and PETAs, additional art and music teachers be hired and ready to start in August, or will campuses begin the year like last year and Title, school, title I schools every year expending time and energy hiring all year? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bree. Hello, my name is Bree Rolf, and I teach at Bowie High School, and I'm a proud member of Education Austin. I'm asking the board today to consider the unintended costs of the essential areas redesign. In a time where at the last meeting everyone was calling for stability, this plan will not only cost the district $8 million, but will upend our current system and further destabilize our students and teachers. It will overburden PE teachers and create an unsafe environment for students. 
there are no considerations for special education students who need adaptive PE. 50 of 78 elementary campuses will, will lose minutes of art and music, which will have a ripple effect all the way up to the award-winning high school programs, one of which I work at. These effects will be felt for a long time. Furthermore, this change is not necessary for meeting physical activity minutes as the district is already in compliance. Please do not approve this costly proposal, pass a contingency budget until we can find a plan for giving much needed planning that works for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Megan Vasquez, and I'm a PE teacher, APER president, and proud member of Ed Austin. I'm asking the board to consider the unintended cost of redesigning the essential areas. This week, I attended trust-based relational intervention sessions to learn strategies to meet the complex needs of my most vulnerable students. In these TBRI trainings, what kept coming up is that students need predictability, consistency, stability, and a space, safe space to learn. This redesign go goes completely against best practices. No one intends to have 100 students in the gym, but inclement weather and demands for common spaces will make this a reality. In February, we asked our APER members, if this proposal goes through, how likely are you to quit? We received 30 likelies. We have 84 elementary PE teachers. Currently, 15 have already resigned. 11 have left their campus and transferred internally to a campus with a better staffing allocation. 19 music and 10 art teachers also resigned. The boots on the ground are begging you to course correct, to fix this mess before students are on campus and before we lose even more talented professionals. This is not an operational issue. This is a budgetary item. If you pass this budget line, you are approving inequities from campus to campuses the dismantling of our quality essential areas program and you're risking student safety. The money could be best, better spent. Our classes are the classes that make children feel whole and guide them through life after testing. Please do not spend $8 million on this redesign and pass a contingency budget until we come up with a plan that reflects our AISD values. Thank you. Jacob. Hi, my name is Jake Morgan. Uh, I teach at Bowie and I'm a proud member of Education Austin. I'm here today to use my last chance to speak to you all on behalf of my colleagues in Austin ISD as well as the students who would be affected by this proposal. Please do not pass a budget that includes the essential areas redesign as it is now. I've not heard from a single student, parent, or teacher who approves of this $8 million investment in programs that will overwork our teachers, spread TAs even thinner, and ultimately cut art and music for 50 of our 78 elementary campuses. Art and music save my life. They are such essential parts of an education that focus on the whole child. Please take this last chance to listen to those you serve and pass a contingency budget until we can come to a solution that gives teachers planning time while continuing to deliver the education that our students and community need. Thank you. Thank you. Eric. Okay, so first off, I want to start by saying while I'm not an elementary teacher, I do want to make it clear that I do support what they're standing and they are the experts in this, so I hope y'all will listen to them. But the reason I'm coming to speak today is that the information session a couple weeks ago, when talking about the budget and special ed staffing, you were told how things are supposed to work, not how things do work, especially on campuses like mine. When we have to spend so much time telling you why all our inclusion staff has to be at two places at once and give up our off period, and we still don't meet everyone's minutes, and we are met with, instead of more staffing, make it work. So I want y'all to know when you are voting on a staffing what really happens, not what's supposed to happen. Because there is a difference. And I don't want y'all to look bad because you supported a budget that supported staffing in a way that is not happening. It is not very easy to get extra staffing or to prove that you need it. Thank you. Thank you to our, uh, in yes ma'am. Yes, sorry. Let me just check one thing here. So we have one more speaker in person, and so we apologize there was a, a miscommunication. But there is one more speaker that's speaking tonight, and I want to call her up, and it's Emily Sawyer. Thank you. Um, Emily Sawyer, I'm a parent in AISD. I'm commenting on this budget vote. The budget will tell the real story no matter what the narrative we try to spin. As you, the board, passes a budget and the administration enacts the budget, the Equity Literacy Institute reminds us that we should examine every decision by asking, how will this impact the most marginalized members of our community? 
Not how will this maintain or improve things for those who already have the most, but how will this benefit black and brown students, students whose first language is not English, students who are new to this country, students with disabilities? If the, answer to the answers to the latter questions cannot be found in this budget, then perhaps it is not telling the story that matches our mission, vision, mission, and values. As we know, the elementary essential areas redesign poses significant negative impacts on some of the student groups that we most marginalize already. I implore the board to pass a contingency budget and revisit whether this redesign is actually necessary or the right solution to providing elementary, teach elementary teacher planning time. Thank you. Thank you. So first of all, thank you to our in-person speakers. We are now going to play the recorded message for public testimony, so uh, trustees, please listen carefully. Good evening, Dr. Ali Zalde and trustees. My name is Becky Shaheen, and I am a parent living in District 6. I am calling today in regards to Agenda Item 3.1, the budget and the proposed essential areas redesign. Board members, we elected you to represent us, the constituents, and it's important today that you listen to us in our efforts to support our students. Today, we ask that you not approve the essential areas redesign as it is not in the best interest of our students or staff alike. One component of this plan is the reduction of art and music offerings for our students. Under the proposed redesign, students at 50 of 78 elementary campuses will receive fewer minutes of art and music instruction than they did last school year. Art develops critical thinking, creativity and motor skills, music supports math and language development, and as a former school counselor in the district, I will add that both have a positive impact on the student's mental health. Cutting art and music minutes does not serve our students, especially students who are already disenfranchised, like those receiving SPED services and black and brown students. Imagine a world with less art and music. It is not good evening, Dr. Elise Alde and Board of Trustees. My name is Angela De La Cruz, and I am a second grade teacher and a proud member of Education Austin. I am also an alum of AISD. I am calling today about agenda item 3.1 to express deep concerns for the essential areas redesign proposal. Some of my fondest childhood memories with AISD are from the rich essential areas programs offered with the ABC rotation. Currently, all students receive the same allocation of music, art, and PE minutes in our three-day ABC rotation. With this new proposal, there will not be a unified or equitable system. Instead of an organized school district, we will be a district of schools operating by campus preferences. Entire grade levels will be attending PE without enough space to accommodate a safe quality physical education. This plan will cost $8 million and negatively impact AISD's core values of providing a safe and equitable whole child education. Please do not approve this costly proposal. Pass a contingency budget until we can find a plan that works equitably for all of our schools and students. Thank you for your time. My name is Christine and I am a parent of an elementary student and a proud member of Education Austin. I am calling about agenda item 3.1 to express our deep concerns for the essential areas redesign proposal. Currently, all students receive the same number of music, art, and PE minutes in the three-day ABC rotation. With this new proposal, there will not be a unified or equitable system in the district. This plan will cost $8 million and negatively impact AISD's core values of providing a safe and equitable education for the whole child. Is $8 million responsible to spend when we have 533 teacher openings, 172 TA openings, and 53 days till the first day of school? Please do not approve this budget proposal. Pass a contingency budget until we can find a plan that works for all of our schools. Thank you for your time. So this concludes public testimony. Trustees, are there any questions or clarifications you'd like to make? Okay, and if not, our next item will be a presentation on the adoption of the recommended FY 2022-23 budget. Dr. Lizalde. Thank you, President Rodriguez, members of the board. <clears throat> our chief financial officer, Ed Ramos, will walk us through our um, final proposal. Okay. President Rodriguez, Dr. Lizalde, members of the board, uh, before you we have a uh, part uh, of the adoption, uh, budget adoption process, uh, which is part of board policy, uh, CE legal, and also part of the Texas Education Code 44.001 through .006, uh, where we have our public meeting to discuss the budget uh, and the tax rate. 
uh, for July uh, 1st uh, uh, districts. Our board uh, must adopt a budget by June 30th uh, before any funds can be expended uh, the next fiscal year, which is the 22-23 fiscal year. So in, in going over the uh, information, one of the first things that we looked at, next slide, is our strategic plan, our priority, and our scorecard goals. So uh, as part of the, the board's priorities and scorecards, we uh, were tasked with looking at uh, fiscal stewardship uh, as a prioritization. Uh, that included looking at our first rating and making sure that we did uh, and, and put our best effort forward to ensure that we maintain that superior rating. Uh, as far as uh, when uh, TA looks at uh, the first rating, uh, two of the bigger areas that they look at that specifically affect Austin ISD uh, are the fund balance, uh, because that basically determines uh, a district's financial stability. So that was one of the areas that we looked at as part of this budget process. Uh, another uh, piece of our priority is the bond rating. And so uh, our uh, board goal is to maintain uh, at least one of the top two levels of the highest uh, bond rating uh, that is allowed to a school district. And so for Austin ISD, our bond rating is currently a AAA bond rating. That is the highest bond rating that a school district can receive. Uh, we are one of about only six districts in the entire state that have that strong bond rating. As far as when uh, the bond rating agencies look at our uh, overall bond rating, they look at our financial management. How are we as a school district managing our overall budget? Uh, they look at our uh, fund balance. Uh, and then they look at the, our budget's long-term outlook. So uh, in looking at our declining enrollment, did the district take the necessary steps uh, to balance the current year budget as well as look at the following school year's budget uh, to make sure that we are financially stable. So those are some of the tasks that we looked at as far as the uh, strategic plan, uh, priority, and scorecard goals. Next slide. So before you use a summary of three of the funds that we must uh, adopt as part of the budgeting process, we look at the general fund, the food service fund, and the debt service fund. Um, overall, we are looking at, uh, on the general fund, uh, a budget deficit of $26.2 million uh, when you take into account our revenues of uh, $1.655 billion. Then you take, uh, you reduce that by our recapture payment. Our recapture payment has grown and escalated to $846 million, and that is what we are estimating uh, next year. If you remember our current uh, recapture payment, we are estimating at 761 million, which we will pay at the end of this month. Our operating costs, 836 million dollars, is what we are looking at to operate uh, the district. One of the benefits that we have are ESSER three dollars. Uh, we are supplanting uh, ESSER three dollars for COVID-related uh, costs. Basically, we are reimbursing ourselves uh, for COVID-related costs uh, next year at 31.2 million. So once you include those ESSER three dollars, we are uh, estimating uh, a net uh, increase to fund balance of $5 million. Uh, on the food service fund, uh, we are estimating, uh, worst case scenario, a $2 million uh, budget deficit. Uh, one of the reasons for that is because we no longer have the option of the uh, summer school uh, feeding program that uh, historically, uh, because of COVID, the federal government did allow for the entire school year. And so now we are back to the regular national school lunch program. Uh, the reimbursements in that program are not uh, as high as the uh, SSO program that we have had the uh, uh, honor of being able to use during the COVID pandemic. And so we are, again, looking at a $2 million shortfall. Uh, but we will make adjustments throughout the school year to make sure that uh, we finished with a balanced budget on the food service fund. Uh, debt service fund, what does it take to uh, pay our uh, mortgage payment? $174.4 million. And so we are uh, looking at with the tax rate uh, we are proposing on the debt service side of 11.3 cents, we will cover uh, our debt service payments. One of the things uh, to really look at is our uh, 800 and th that $835.7 million figure, that is what it costs us to operate Austin ISD operationally as a district. 
That is a, and you'll, you will see it in the next slide, but that is a $33.7 million decrease from our current year. So we have decreased our overall expenditures, what it takes to uh, operate this district by 33 $0.7 million. Uh, one of the things to note that even though we have reduced our overall expenditures by $33.7 million, we continue to invest in our employees. And so our budget, uh, you will see uh, uh, in this presentation, uh, is comprised of 86.7% of our operating budget is in payroll. So we continue to invest heavily uh, in our employees. Uh, last year it was closer to 86%, so we have uh, slowly began to increase that to almost 87%. That is uh, one of the highest percentage, uh, percentages in the area, in the, in the area of payroll uh, in the Central Texas area, just as an FYI. Um, next slide. And so this gives a, a good historical snapshot of kind of where we've been uh, with our uh, revenues, uh, recapture, our tax rates. If you look at uh, the, ninth, uh, the 2021 school year, we had an m and tax rate of 0 0.9897. As a result of House Bill 3, uh, you have uh, seen our property values escalate, uh, and we are estimating that 18% growth rate. So as a result, that will drop our m and tax rate. And so we are estimating uh, our m and tax rate to drop by six and a half cents. So when you look at the 22-23 fiscal year next year, uh, our m and tax rate will be 0.8836. So that is a six and a half percent uh, reduction from our current tax rate of 0.9487 on the m and side. One of the things that you'll also notice is our revenues are increasing next year. Uh, from $1.5 uh, billion uh, to $1.655 billion. And so that give, kind of, uh, if, if, you're, if you're a community member or a parent, you, you see that number and you think, well, Austin ISD has more funds to spend. Our, our revenue has grown. Uh, one of the areas that really hurts the district, and, and we continue to discuss it, is, of course, recapture. And so for this current school year, uh, we are estimating our recapture payment to be $761 million. Uh, next year, that has escalated to $846 million. And so in, in looking at what it takes for us, again, to operate the district, $836 million next year um, compared to $763 million this year. And so as far as overall, we are projecting to end this year with an $18.1 million surplus. Uh, much of that is a result of how we have reclassified uh, our ESSER funding, reimbursed ourselves for COVID-related expenditures. Uh, when we look at next year, uh, we are again looking at that $26.2 million shortfall. Uh, but again, we are continuing to reimburse ourselves with ESSER dollars for COVID-related expenditures. And so we are anticipating an unassigned fund balance for next year of 22%. Uh, keep it in mind that our uh, local board policy is 20%. Next slide. This really gives a good picture of uh, our overall expenditures, uh, where we're spending our money and where th those funds are going. So when you look at what we adopted back in the 21-22 school year, uh, we adopted a budget of almost $1.6 billion in expenditures. Uh, when you look at next year, we're at $1.681 billion. And so it, again, it looks like we're spending, uh, expending more funds uh, as a district. When you look at the uh, snapshot on the right-hand side, that gives a true picture of what's actually happening uh, in this district. And so when you look at what it has taken us to operate uh, Austin ISD, uh, last year we adopted a budget of $869.2 million. Uh, this next school year, we're, we are projecting an uh, operating budget of $835.4 million. So again, we as a district are operating with $33.8 million less next year than we did this current school year. The huge, the, the large increase in our expenditures is actually coming again from our recapture payment. Uh, originally when this budget was adopted last year, uh, we estimated a $709.4 million recapture payment. Uh, that was assuming a specific uh, student enrollment uh, once our doors opened, uh, our students came, and, and then we had the impact of uh, both the Delta and the uh, Omicron variant. 
uh, we had to adjust that uh, recapture estimate to 761 million. So that is what we will send to the state this current school year. Next year, $846 million is what we estimate. So last year to this year, our change in recapture is $136.5 million. That is uh, where we as a district are taking the large hits, uh, and, and it continues to be a, a problem for us. Many school districts in the Central Texas area, you, you are starting to see that because of the high growth in property values, they are now becoming recapture paying districts. Uh, so before where some districts around us like Leander, uh, Pflugerville, even Hutto, uh, did not pay into the recapture system, uh, next year uh, we are estimating that they are now going to be paying into recapture. And so when you look at our budget, uh, and we did our best to pass a balanced budget, uh, these districts that I just mentioned are looking at uh, passing deficit budgets. So this is starting to become the norm rather than uh, the exception uh, throughout not only Central Texas, but uh, the state of Texas. So something has to be done uh, with our current uh, state funding system. The, the true answer is uh, an increase in the basic allotment or the per student uh, funding that we receive uh, as school districts. Uh, if the state were to increase uh, the basic allotment or, or the per student uh, that, uh, spending uh, that they uh, give school districts, that would reduce our recapture payment. So that would, in essence, drastically help our school districts. We're also looking at uh, asking them to give us a discount for paying our recapture on time. Uh, if you look at uh, next year's recapture payment, $846 million, uh, a 10 percent discount would save us over $84 million, and, and we can do uh, a lot for our employees uh, with $84 million as a district. Next slide. The assumptions that we assumed in creating this budget, uh, we assumed a flat enrollment uh, for next school year. So our enrollment of 74,713. We wanted to make sure that we were conservative uh, with our estimates because this past year uh, we overestimated our enrollment projections. Uh, we uh, assumed a 93% average uh, daily attendance. Our property value growth, we now have a very uh, solid number. We know that our property values grew at 18%. Early on uh, during our, our budget discussions, we were anticipating an 8% growth rate, which is high. Uh, but now we know that that growth rate has skyrocketed to 18%, uh, which is uh, adding and compounding the issue with our recapture payment. Uh, our uh, overall appraisal and collection fees are growing at 2%. And our maximum compressed uh, tax rate, the, the base tax rate that we now have to compute uh, as part of the new uh, House Bill 3 uh, tax compression system is now at uh, 0.8046. So that is actually the base tax rate uh, that we can have as a school district, which that is the base rate for school districts throughout the state. You add your golden pennies to that, and that's where we come up with our MNO tax rate. Next slide. This gives a summary of where we have invested uh, our uh, operating dollars and where we have uh, decreased our operating budget for next year. Uh, one of the things that you will see is that uh, our largest investment uh, on the right-hand table, uh, 21.1 million is what we invested in our employees uh, out of the $28.7 million increases uh, to our budget next year. And so that included uh, uh, teacher and librarian increases, uh, those averaged about 3.7 percent of a midpoint raise. Uh, we also are looking in addition to that, and, and I'll uh, go over that in a, a, a future slide, but we're also looking at a $2,000 retention stipend for all employees, uh, and that will come out of ESSER 3 funds, uh, so that adds to that 3.7 percent uh, increase to our teacher group. Also, we're looking at uh, using ESSER dollars for a $500 uh, uh, retention stipend for uh, teachers uh, who are uh, with five or more years of experience. And so we have included that in our compensation package. Uh, we are, as far as the overall decreases, uh, we reduced our overall employees by 599 uh, FTEs, or full-time equivalent employees. And so that uh, translated to uh, an overall decrease of 47.6 million 
Uh, the biggest decreases came in central office and, and operations. Uh, the staffing and the budget, uh, those reductions in those specific areas uh, calculated to 27.2 million, and that was a reduction of 362 uh, full-time uh, employees. Uh, the campus budget reductions, uh, 8.3 million, uh, that included uh, 237 less employees. Uh, th the reduction in employees in that area was because of enrollment. Uh, we had over-projected enrollment, so in essence we were uh, overstaffed as a district. And so we achieved uh, those reductions through uh, vacancies as they occurred uh, in the district. So one of the things that we wanted to do, and we knew we needed to do this year uh, to be able to give a compensation increase, is we had to cut deep. And so that is uh, exactly what we did. Uh, we cut 10% uh, 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 and then over 600 employees in the central office uh, and operational areas. Uh, and, and we needed to do that, one, to uh, balance the budget, and two, to make sure that we continue to uh, offer our employees a compensation increase. W without a compensation increase, uh, we, we would begin losing our employees to uh, other school districts. Uh, and, and if you look and, and you hear in the news this year, uh, we had several vacancies throughout the school year. That is not an Austin ISD issue. Uh, we have uh, that issue uh, throughout uh, Central Texas, throughout the state of Texas. So school districts throughout the state are uh, fighting uh, and, and, and dealing with the issue of vacancies throughout their uh, professional ranks, their hourly ranks, and so it is uh, a reality that we have to deal with as a district, which makes it more imperative uh, that we continue to try to uh, offer uh, aggressive compensation packages to our employees. Next slide. And so this is a graphic that our human capital department uh, created, which really summarizes uh, what we are proposing for our 22-23 uh, uh, school year uh, with regards to compensation. Uh, our minimum uh, starting hourly rate is now $16 an hour. Uh, that is one of the highest uh, in, in the central Texas area among ISDs. Uh, several other school districts are at $15 an hour, so they have also increased uh, their starting hourly pay. Uh, our bus drivers, we are at $21 an hour starting uh, at a starting rate, and that is in line uh, with many of the other school districts around us. Uh, librarians and teachers, uh, we did uh, propose a 2% uh, increase of, at midpoint, and then we also increased their base pay by $1,000. So that uh, did include the librarian and teacher groups. And again, that was an average of a 3.7% uh, increase. We also are offering out of ESSER dollars uh, a Reading Academy stipend of $1,000. Uh, and then we have a, a retention stipend of $500 if you are a five-year experienced teacher or more. Uh, and then we have our PPFT program uh, in this district, which also increases uh, teacher pay based on uh, different categories. And then our counselors also are receiving the uh, 504-5 retention stipend as well. Uh, one of the big areas that we looked at to continue to, to retain our employees uh, knowing that uh, we, we couldn't be as aggressive as we would have liked, uh, not only with teacher pay, but with our hourly employees. Uh, because of that, we did offer and are offering a $2,000 retention stipend for all employees next school year. And so any full-time employee, any active full-time employee uh, who is employed with Austin ISD as of September 1st, of 2022 will qualify for this $2,000 retention stipend. It will be paid out in uh, the month of November and the month of March. Those are strategic uh, because of the holidays. And so when you look at an hourly employee, a $2,000 uh, retention stipend is gonna be huge uh, for that employee group. It, it really uh, raises the, the percentage that they are receiving next school year. So again, uh, the goal was to offer uh, an aggressive retention stipend so that we can uh, continue to retain our employee workforce. Uh, if you are part-time, you would qualify for a $1,000 uh, retention stipend. We also offer, one of the things that, that really is, is, is not mentioned sometimes is what we offer as benefits. And so as a school district, we, we are proud to say that we do offer an employee-only, zero-cost health insurance plan. 
And so there are districts around us that do not offer uh, a zero dollar employee only health insurance plan uh, because we are uh, uh, self-funded as a school district with health insurance. Uh, we are able to uh, structure our plan in a way uh, that if you uh, choose uh, an employee only plan, you will pay zero dollars as an employee of Austin ISD. This next graph really shows where we are compared to our competitors. Uh, and, and we looked at uh, Del Valley ISD, Leander, Pflugerville, and Round Rock. These are the larger suburban districts uh, in the area. And so we wanted to make sure that we didn't lose ground with teacher pay and, and we were competitive uh, with overall teacher pay. So the, the purple line, uh, the one that you actually, you actually see spike in year five, that is Austin ISD. And so we are, if you look at uh, years uh, zero to five, very competitive. Uh, that includes PPFT in those calculations. Uh, when you look at the 10-year teacher, uh, we do have Del Valley uh, passing us. Uh, then 15 and 20 years, uh, we are still competitive in those areas. This graph does not also take into account that $2,000 retention stipend. Uh, so that is another uh, benefit uh, where we try to make sure that we were still aggressive with teacher pay. Uh, one of the things that we have said is, is our goal is to become uh, the highest paying district in Central Texas with regards to our teachers. Uh, that, we, we cannot do that overnight. That's usually a two to three year budgeting plan. This is year one. Uh, so our goal is within the next two years to be the highest paying district uh, in Central Texas with our teachers. And why do we want to do that? Because we know that the cost of living in Austin is, is really uh, getting uh, way, way up there. Uh, and so in order for us to attract our teachers and to retain our teachers, we, we want to be uh, very aggressive with our pay to give them a reason uh, not only to stay, uh, but to make sure that uh, we continue to invest in our employees throughout this district. Next slide. And so here's historically where we have been with not only enrollment, but recapture. And, and one of the challenges that we face as a school district is our enrollment has continued to decline over the past several years. Uh, we saw a large decline between the 1920 and the 2021 uh, school year uh, of almost 6,000 students. One of the things that you will note though is that we have drastically slowed that decline down. So even though in the 2021 school year, the current school year, we over projected our enrollment. When you look at the actual numbers of 74,982 uh, in 2021 compared to our current school year of 21-22, uh, we only lost 269 students. So the enrollment uh, decline has slowed drastically. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that when we estimated our budget, we estimated a flat growth rate. Uh, but that graph is telling that we are slowing down our enrollment loss uh, from uh, over 6,000 uh, one year to now 269 students. Uh, but one of the things that occurs when a school district is growing in property values and is losing enrollment, uh, our recapture payment is, is escalating. And so that is what you see uh, next year, uh, $846 million again is what we are estimating in recapture payments. Next slide. This graphic basically shows, uh, again, compares that recapture payment to our total operating cost. So if, if our total budget was a dollar bill, if you tear that dollar bill in half, that is what is happening in Austin ISD. So we are sending half of our total expenditures, what it takes to run the district, back to the state of Texas. And so in essence, Austin ISD is funding uh, another district our size uh, with our local tax dollars. And so that is a huge uh, concern. It continues to be a huge concern for us as a school district. Um, we are in the lower third quartile as a state as far as funding per student nationally. And so we know that the state of Texas uh, has a far way to go as far as uh, how they fund uh, on a per student basis. Uh, one of the challenges that we face also as an urban district is that 52% of our students are economically disadvantaged. And so when, when you look at the original recapture system, 
it was created where wealthy school districts would assist uh, and share in the cost of uh, education and assist it, uh, poorer school districts. And so uh, what we are finding is now that is not the case. Uh, we, uh, so usually a school district with a high number of economically disadvantaged students uh, would benefit from such a system. Uh, now, even though we are at 52% economically disadvantaged, uh, we are one of the victims of this system where we send uh, over half of our tax collections back to the state. And so that is really a problem. Uh, our issue is that uh, property value-wise as a school district, we are uh, property wealthy, but personal wealth, when you have 52% of your students uh, as economically disadvantaged, the personal wealth uh, is not in Austin ISD. Um, and so again, uh, it is a current issue with the current funding system. Uh, we will do our best to take that battle to the legislature, this next legislative session, uh, but we do know we have a lot of work to do. Uh, and again, uh, with the high property value growth in the area, more and more districts are now starting to be part of this recapture system. And so Leander again, Pflugerville, Huddo ISD now pay uh, into recapture. And as a result, they are looking at passing deficit budgets for uh, next year. Next slide. As far as our overall tax rates, one of the uh, uh, advantages that we have despite uh, the uh, issues with recapture, uh, our high uh, percentage property growth does allow us to reduce our overall tax rate. Uh, so next year, we are estimating a total tax rate uh, of 0.9966. And so again, that is six and a half cents less uh, than our current tax rate. Uh, when you look at the other school districts and what they are estimating uh, for their tax rates next school year, again, these are all proposed rates. Uh, school districts don't set their tax rate till August, uh, September timeframe. But we should be uh, the lowest uh, taxing school district in Central Texas. So that is uh, a huge number for us, uh, just to show our community that we are one of the lowest taxing districts uh, in the state uh, and in Central Texas at 0 .9966, again, what we are estimating for next year, uh, a six and a half cent reduction from our current tax rate. Next slide. And so we have always uh, continued to have conversations about our fund balance and, and the need to uh, make sure that we uh, uh, maintain at least that 20% uh, fund balance uh, number uh, just to ensure not only uh, follow local policy, uh, but ensure that we maintain that financial stability as a school district. Uh, and so this are, these are projections of what would happen if uh, our current uh, enrollment continues to uh, stay uh, where it is and our property values continue to grow. And so th basically the picture that this uh, graph paints is that we are going to have to continue to really look at our budget uh, on a year uh, by year basis and, and respond to uh, what is occurring uh, in, in this economy and in our current uh, state funding system. So if our values continue to escalate as they have, uh, and our enrollment continues to decline. So let's say next school year, uh, we open our doors and we are below what we had projected as uh, far as overall enrollment. We would have to, again, uh, continue to look at uh, reducing uh, our, our budget in different areas. So again, uh, the work doesn't stop uh, with this budget. With some of the hard decisions and difficult decisions that we made as a school district this year, uh, that doesn't stop the work. We, we are continuing to look at efficiencies uh, as a school district. Where can we maximize uh, revenues? Uh, and, and where can we uh, reduce uh, inefficiencies as a district? The, the, the goal, again, is to funnel as much as we can into instruction, uh, into uh, compensation for our employees. So we will continue to do that as a school district. Uh, but again, we face some challenges, and, and it's not because of our uh, spending and, and kind of where or what it takes to uh, operate Austin ISD. Again, you saw that we are operating with $33 million less dollars uh, next year than we did this year. Uh, our issue is, again, the current uh, funding system and, and how recapture is really uh, affecting our, our overall budget as a school district. Next slide. 
This basically shows uh, what uh, our uh, the, the, the current system is doing with our property owners, our, our homeowners. And so when you look at last year, the average market value was 544,219 for an average home. Uh, next year, uh, for 2022, uh, as you know, again, home values have been skyrocketing. So the average home value uh, in, in Austin ISD next year is 830,764. One of the things to remember is though, um, uh, you look at the average taxable value, what they call the assessed value. And so last year, the average taxable value was 468,034. Uh, by law, with House Bill 3 and Senate Bill 1, uh, a homeowner can only be taxed uh, an increase of 10% of their assessed value. Uh, so when you look at that, uh, on average now, uh, that number becomes 523,040. And so that is the actual number that a homeowner is taxed on. So when you receive your uh, uh, appraisal estimate from the Travis Central Appraisal District, look at that assessed value because that is the value that you will be taxed on, not the actual market value, not the growth uh, that your home uh, has seen. And so when you look at, again, our tax rate, uh, this current school year, 1.0617. Uh, next year, we are reducing that by an estimated six and a half cents to 0.9966. Uh, also, one of the benefits that we have uh, if you are a homeowner is uh, during the May elections uh, that there was a constitutional amendment that was passed that allows uh, a reduction in homestead value and that increased from 25000 to 40000 So that also assists homeowners with uh, the amount of taxes uh, that they, they do have to pay. And so on average, uh, with uh, taking into account the assessed value uh, in homes, taking into account our six and a half cent uh, tax rate reduction, uh, the average increase uh, a homeowner may see in their bill uh, for Austin ISD is $244. Uh, again, you would have to take your uh, home to make these calculations, but these are uh, based on averages throughout the uh, Travis County. And then this is a summary of our ESSER II and our ESSER III federal dollars, uh, where we have uh, expended uh, these funds for the 21-22 school year and the 22-23 school year, where we are projecting uh, to expend these funds. And so you, you see the categories that we have uh, as far as uh, the areas that we are looking at uh, spending some of these uh, funds to address COVID-related expenditures, uh, academics and school leadership, uh, enrollment engagement, technology facilities. Uh, District-wide, uh, we had a vaccine incentive. Uh, next year, we will be looking at, again, that retention uh, stipend uh, out of ESSER uh, three, And then, of course, supplanting, uh, reimbursing ourselves for COVID-related expendi expenditures, uh, both in 21-22, 22-23. And then the last year that we have to uh, expend these uh, federal dollars is the 23-24 school year. Uh, and that only applies to ESSER three dollars. So once we look at the 24-25 school year, uh, that year will be a challenge uh, for uh, school districts throughout the state uh, because there will no longer be ESSER funds to assist uh, with uh, COVID-related expenditures, with learning uh, 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 how, to, how to catch students up uh, with the uh, effect that the pandemic has had uh, on their ability to learn and access to uh, ed education. And so, uh, again, looking at our overall ex uh, total uh, funds that we receive from ESSER 2 and 3, uh, in ESSER 2, 69.3 million, uh, ESSER uh, 3, 155.6 million. And so this just gives a summary of uh, where we have expended those this year uh, and our budget uh, with these funds for next year. And with that, I open it up to questions from the board or the public. Thank you. Um, Mr. Ramos, trustees, are there any questions? Tr Trustee Lugo. Um, thank you, Chief Ramos, for the presentation. Um, and just so that folks are um, attuned to one of the corrections that was made on the budget. Can you speak a little bit to the multilingual, the bilingual, excuse me, the bilingual line, line item that we had talked about last time? I think there's the, the response is actually in board docs, but if you could just 
speak to that? Yes, so originally uh, when we uh, looked at our uh, board info session, we did have an incorrect amount uh, with bilingual education. What we found is that we coded the bilingual stipends uh, as special ed stipends, and so it looked like uh, we were reducing uh, uh, investments in bilingual education by 79%. That number is actually 27.1%. And, and the reason that it, it is a 27.1% reduction uh, is because we are, are paying less in stipends. So uh, the bilingual uh, education services uh, PIC code uh, 25 uh, specifically addresses bilingual stipends. Uh, and so our actual cost for next year is 6.4 million. Originally it was, I believe, 2.9 million, so that was incorrect. Uh, but basically we are paying uh, less in bilingual stipends because of our uh, decreased enrollment. So we have less bilingual teachers in the district. And then, um, again, I know this is in board docs, but just to uh, uh, bring people's attention to it, I think there was a conversation about um, the budget, um, the proposed budget for CTE, and then the proposed budget for special education. Mm -hmm. So as far as the, the proposed budget for CTE expenditures, uh, it had a reduction uh, in, in that specific category of 38.6%. And I'm gonna bring in a comp ed as well, a reduction of 22.9%, and then dyslexia, a reduction of 17.2%. What's actually happening there is that we are coding uh, our teachers into basic education. Once we have the schedules and we know the uh, amount of uh, periods that teachers are teaching in these specific areas, we do go back and reclassify into the correct categories. So you will see those uh, percentages increase uh, as that occurs. Thank you. And then um, one other question, and I'm not entirely sure what this question means. It was sent to me. It was, uh, it was uh, brought to my attention. So the question is, uh, you know, something about a 20% property tax homestead exemption. Is that the same thing as the, I just lost it, the, um, uh, it's the 65 year old and older exemption. So on page 14, um, that the last little bit, um, last paragraph on that page talks about the residence homestead uh, for a person 65 years of age or older. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not entirely clear whether that's the same thing as what this other person was talking about, that there's like some sort of, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so, so that may be referring to one of two things. So in, in the May election, uh, two propositions passed. One was increasing the homestead exemption from 25,000 to 40,000. The other one basically addressed uh, property or homeowners that are 65 or older. Uh, depending on when they applied for that paperwork, uh, they were not able to access uh, the same benefits that regular homeowners were accessing. And so that vote corrected that issue. So now anyone that's 65 or older does uh, have their property values uh, frozen uh, and they do have the same benefits as uh, regular homeowners now. And so just to be clear, that's not within our purview. That's, that's not within something. our purview. Yes. Thank you. That's correct. Thank you, um, Trustee Lua. Trustees, any other questions? Tr Trustee Singh. Um, thank you so much, Chief Ramos. Uh, you um, did such a good job answering so many of our questions, so thank you for doing that. Um, I want to thank the administration for investing and paying our um, our staff. Uh, I, I think that's fantastic to see um, the reading academies, the the raises, the um, little um, incentive um, stipends and all of that. So thank you so much for investing in our people. Um, I did have a couple of questions. Uh, if we can move to the, if we can look on the, um, pull up the recommended budget supplemental data <laughs> file and um, look at page 13. That is um, a really good overview of the essential areas costs. 
Um, I don't know if that's something that someone can pull up. I see Jacob sweating it out over there, so thanks, Jacob. But essentially, would you mind um, talking a little bit about the cost and um, how that's being offset? Mm -hmm. So one of the questions that the board had for us is, is what is the essential areas costing the district? And so when you look at the total overall cost for the program, uh, you look at the uh, 55 FTEs for the essential area teachers, uh, that was 3.8 million. Uh, then you look at uh, the uh, total number of teacher assistants uh, that are required uh, for that program at 3.8 million. Uh, so the total cost came out to $7.6 million. Uh, one of the things that also helped us offset that overall cost uh, was the changes to the teacher formula at the secondary level from 28.1 to 29.1, uh, and also uh, the uh, eco dis weighting uh, in staffing from 0.2 to 0.1. So that resulted, uh, and also the loss of enrollment, uh, because we again over projected uh, last year. So those savings uh, amounted to $5.7 million. So when you net those savings from the total cost of, of this program, uh, the true cost, the additional cost to the district is $1.9 million. And that is what uh, the figure on the top uh, table shows. Okay, and then, um, so the, the PE teacher, the 1.9 in the PE teacher, um, is that considered a savings there or is that an additional cost? That's an additional cost. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, got it. And then, um, for the, okay, and so to do the essential areas, we have to hire 55 FTEs of essential areas teachers and 102 FTE of teacher assistants, correct? Correct. Okay, and do we, I know that what I learned um, earlier today was that we typically don't hire teacher assistants until closer to the start of school. Um, see, I listened to you, Ms. Stevens. Um, but can you give us a sense of like how, um, how many of these positions have been filled? So out of the 55 additional teachers, it's split between PE, music, and art. Mm -hmm. And so right now, I've, there are seven art vacancies, 17 music vacancies, and one PE vacancy. Okay, so. great. And then um, for the essential area TAs, the 102 FTEs, do we and have any idea? I, I do not. Okay. I do not. And those include the, um, does it, those include the PE TAs? Those are all PE. Oh, they're all PE. Those are all PE. The 102 were all PE. Okay. All right, so, um, okay. And our, I guess one of the things that came up in a conversation with, with us today earlier was um, that the administration is working with um, campuses to understand the special education um, programming, because I know we are committed to ensuring that students don't le lose those services and um, that we might have to hire some more special education staff as well, right? Right, so right now, our, the PE teachers mm -hmm. that we included in the 55 are your general, general PE teachers. Um, within the special education department, they have a sub-department mm -hmm. that is adaptive PE. And so we met with the adaptive PE department and they have a staff of, I wanna say like five mm -hmm. adaptive PE teachers right now. Mm -hmm. And so they were meeting to look at individual IEPs to see what they would need to do to work their schedules. And if they needed to hire more, that would come out of the special education grant. But when you hire for adaptive PE, you're hiring PE teachers and providing them with additional training. There's not a different certification mm -hmm. to be an adaptive PE teacher. Okay. Do you have a sense yet of how many more PE teachers we would need? In adaptive the, PE? Yeah, that would be especially. I right. think, and okay, I'm gonna. I'm gonna a, a ballpark. Kinda, okay, I'm gonna give you a ballpark. a ballpark. I believe that the difference was 
a difference of seven. Okay. So I think they would have to do seven additional ones. Okay, thank you. And then um, can you also, I'm gonna share some of the things, and you already know what I'm gonna say because we already talked earlier today, but I wanna make sure that, um, that folks know. Uh, can you talk a little bit about um, how just generally, so a concern that's come to me is that special education, a few special edu education teachers have reached out to me and said, hey, I'm going to be pulled out of, um, you know, working with students and doing the IEP minutes with students to help in, um, to help with um, PE. And so, but it sounds like... <laughs> So, like, so do they uh, ever? Is that real? No, <laughs> no, it shouldn't be. Um, so, so uh, that's what I said. Is an adaptive PE teacher is a is a PE certified teacher, and that is not an area that okay. we have on our list that is a hard to fill area. So we hire a PE teacher, and then they receive special training on top of that. Okay. And I think when we talk to the the division of adaptive PE they felt comfortable in the fact that they could find those additional personnel okay. for their PE teachers. Okay, so special ed teachers are not going to be pulled Co out of their work. Correct. They don't have the training to PE. do that either. Like we don't okay. we don't take regular classroom special education teachers to the gym. and train them in what the adaptive PE is. Okay. Okay. I appreciate that clarification and um, Okay, and the other question I had was related to um, <clears throat> some of the concerns that were raised really in public comment and we've been hearing about over um, the last few months was regarding safety uh, in this, with this whole proposal. And, um, you know, we all know that our schools were not really designed to do grade level PE. And my understanding from talking to Mr. Hicks is every campus has come up with the plan that they think will work best for their campus, um, which is great, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's a plan that is going to um, meet some certain standards or criteria of safety that the district has created because it sounds like we don't necessarily have that. Um, and so I don't know, that's not really a starting I, question. I was just gonna look say, at I you because you're there. Right, so, I, can speak sorry. In, I can speak in general pieces I know at one of the board meetings um, the original question was is could you know because the state says 1 to 45 so the question became of could we do 1 to 30 and that's when we added the additional teacher assistance so that we could get to the 1 to 30 number and part of that was because of you know the whole issue of you know what is a safe number to monitor and to you know, watch for PE and to interact with in the small group rotations and that kind of thing. I know originally that the school leadership office and operations have walked certain facilities if there was a question in terms of what areas they're using. And so I know that school leadership did work with individual campuses and that. Now, I think where I think probably just like on any other type of situation where the issue comes in is on inclement weather days because we do have inclement weather days <laughs> in Austin and so on those days it's like what's that plan for inclement weather days and so I know each of the schools addressed those days too in terms of what they would do. Okay. Yeah, I would love to hear, I see Mr. Hicks swooping in <laughs> to save Ms. Stevens, yes. <laughs> so we know uh, Gilbert Hicks, Associate Superintendent for Elementary Schools. Um, we know that there are some concerns around the plan, and what we are committed to doing as an Office of School Leadership is to maintaining ongoing listening sessions throughout the year as we implement the plan, and as concerns come up, we will pivot to respond to any of the challenges that we, <clears throat> excuse me for my voice, any of the challenges that we are, are presented with. Um, we'll also commit to surveying our staff throughout the school year um, <clears throat> with the co-created survey to ensure that we have identified those challenges ongoing and are able to pivot to those challenges as we see them as a result of the survey as well. And we're going to be looking at the effect effectiveness of our implementation throughout the year with those surveys. 
but we want to just say that we are committed to making sure that this plan works and doing whatever it takes to make that happen because it's about planning time for our teachers and, and disrupting the process that we've had for a number of years that did not allow for an equitable amount of planning time for our elementary teachers. I appreciate that. Um, and so, I, and thank you for talking about the listening sessions and the surveys to staff. I think that's gonna be um, really critical. Are you guys gonna be doing any of these listening sessions or surveys before school starts? We haven't developed the plan for what that would look like. Okay. But we can say, certainly take that into account. Okay, and then what's gonna happen if we, I mean, I understand the plan in theory, and I, I'm really glad that you guys are starting to think about, or have been thinking about increasing planning time for elementary teachers, but what's gonna, I mean, so there's a the theoretical plan, right? And then there's like what happens in reality. And so what is, you know, I know that we're all, we all wanna make sure that there's not gonna be a ton of disruption when school starts. So what I worry about is um, what happens if we, aren't able to hire these, you know, 55 plus 102 plus possibly some additional teachers. Are our campuses still going to be expected to deploy this plan and patch something something together and maybe have to combine classes or have teachers cover or you know that that's the kind of disruption that really we start hearing a lot from um, from parents and and teachers and so and obviously safety is an issue there, too So what what's what happens if we're not able to hire these people? So before um, mr. Hicks goes into that I think each of those would need to be on a case-by-case -case situation. We might have to alter the plan if it's like size of the school, how many vacancies there would be, I think you raised an excellent point. And so I think that was part of why the site-based decision making for this particular project was that each campus um, really utilize their facilities and their staffing in creating this while meeting certain minutes. I do think, um, I think we're gonna have to be talking, I'm just having come from the TASA conference this week Monday with the Texas Urban Council, um, everybody is worried about not just these positions, obviously. I mean, it's it's an issue that all urbans are. I know it doesn't really help anyone else when it's our school district in our situation, um, but our numbers and percentages honestly actually looked better than the other nine urban districts, not by a little. Um, actually by a, a pretty significant amount. The one thing that really stood out was the our community's um, dedication to teachers and to the schools because we did flatten out our enrollment from last year to this year, and not one of the other school districts did. And the reason I raise that is if our students do come, um, it also helps just with regard to that recapture payment in a in an exponential way could help us in a positive way too if we got an increase in enrollment and we would hope that we didn't see another 18 percent never seen before i just want to emphasize that that was more than double our very conservative cfo here in front of us of eight percent and it was 18. Um, so combining that, meaning maybe we would actually have some additional funds that we're not putting in the budget right now, mm -hmm. that maybe there's some other incentives that might yeah. even be able to be given to teachers. Okay. But I do think at the campus level, and I'd be curious, Mr. Hicks, like as you visited with your um, elementary principals and you all were walking through some of those inclement weather or contingency plans, what did you what did you all hear or see or create well obviously we're not going outside on inclement weather days and so um there are a number of spaces throughout our schools that they would use creatively to ensure that we were covered on those particular days 
Um, I mean, the, are there additional, some, some, some schools have empty classrooms and they would utilize those. Uh, some have covered play scapes, out, covered play spaces outside, play slabs outside, and they would use those as well. And then some have common areas within their school and they would use those as well. So it would be, again, on an individual case-by-case -case basis determining what that would look like. But everyone has thought through that. That happens uh, even with the smaller class sizes. You don't go outside on a, on a day when you have inclement weather, and so there are already options in place for those. Sometimes the cafeteria can be used depending on the time of the day. So there are just lots of different places that people think about and are considering. So I think this, that, that's good to know. Um, I know that I've also, you know, earlier today we were talking and, and um, you know, libraries and maker spaces were also mentioned as possible places for kiddos, and that, that definitely made my hair on the back of my neck stand up, I'm gonna be honest, um, because uh, for obvious safety reasons. And so I think my point here is what might be best, you know, the best plan that a campus might come up with still might not be good enough. Right, and right. So well, what I can say, Trustee Singh, is that we will not be using libraries or maker spaces for physical activity. Okay. I appreciate that. Um, and then I guess have the, have, and all of this is related to the budget because this is the one thing that's, that's holding me back. So I have to really understand it. So I, I, you know, I apologize for digging so deeply here, but this is my, this is the one thing that's, um, that I'm concerned with. Um, we, I, I guess, hey, Dr. Bays, <laughs> I would love to just hear with you because you're the one that's going to have to implement all this. Um, and, and I really appreciated what you had said to me earlier is that you guys were, and I believe that you really are going to be talking to folks. But um, can you just share, like, give some reassurance, like, hey, if we can't hire people or if, we, if the school doesn't have really proper spaces for inclement weather, that they're not gonna be forced to do this. Like, that's really what I'm, <laughs> I, I, I just don't want us to think about doing this if it's not gonna be safe. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I think <clears throat> Mr. Hicks just kind of spoke to it. And that's why we wanted to make sure that we answered that question about libraries and maker spaces. Cause earlier when you mentioned that, and we wanted to make sure that that wasn't a situation where uh, students will be having PE in either one of those spaces. And so uh, our commitment is to doing, you know, what we just said, listening throughout this process to make sure that we can troubleshoot or pivot any challenges that come up uh, and that we're supporting our campuses and our principals and making sure that our students are always safe in any instance that they come through the doors of a, a AISD building. And so that's where we are. Uh, those listening sessions will start next year, Trustee Singh, so we can hear again what it actually looks like at the implementation because we know change can be frightening uh, and we've done what we've done for a number of years and so we know that uh, again change is not easy and so we want to be able to listen and, and pivot where we need to i appreciate that and the other thing that um that i have asked earlier um you know if you're going to proceed with this i think it would be really helpful you know somebody who's representing a lot of parents in aisd they really need to know exactly what their child is going to get next year with regard to these changes like i you know, I would really love for parents to get like some sort of standard information sheet, like um, sharing exactly what the changes are gonna be in music, art, PE, and instructional time. I want parents to understand that their child may not be taught, there's a chance, you know, their child will not have a certified PE teacher um, teaching them PE every day i know they're sort of rotating through and all that but you know they they really should know because the last thing i think we want is for school to start and then suddenly have a whole bunch of angry parents right at the same time that we're trying to market a bond like so we've got to start building that trust now and and if we really i think if we really are committed and think that this i'm borrowing trusty lugo's phrase if we really do think this is a good plan and we're super committed to it then let's just lay it all out there and and i would say start now with with the engagement you know you have a group of teachers right here that would love to be able to talk to you i would say listen to them because we've heard not only from the uni we've heard from Education Austin, we've heard from uh, ATPE, we've heard from teachers who are not affiliated with unions. Like, it's, I've heard it from everyone. 
and it's not that I'm against this plan. Um, I just am still like not convinced like that we've really, this has been um, set up for success for our students. So I, I do want to remind um, trustees that we did conduct surveys earlier in the process when we were con uh, creating the action plans to ensure that we had data around all staff being uh, being able to participate and hear the plan ahead of time. And then principals also did talk about their plans in parent coffees and at CAC meetings and at PTA meetings. So the engagement process has already began and it's not that we're starting from scratch with that. What we are committed to doing is continuing that portion of the engagement as well, as well as adding the listening sessions for everyone to that too. Okay, um, and, and you said that's gonna, so that's gonna start just later, it uh, sounds like. Well, well but as, as, between now and the start of the school year or right after the start of the school okay. year, we don't have a plan fully baked yet on what date it would start, but we are committed to doing it. Okay, I appreciate that. And, and I do hope that we can find a way to give our teachers more planning time. Um, so I, I do appreciate that effort. And, and I, think, I think there are some campuses that do want this, that do think this is really great. So that, like, I'm not saying like, I mean, in an ideal world, I would love to see us pilot this at a few campuses in the fall and then learn from that and then do a broader rollout, especially when you look at the fund balance, which is, I promise, the last thing I'm gonna bring up. Um, could, if we could just pull up that one graphic that had the fund balance projections. And Chief Ramos, was that in the PDF presentation? Oh, yeah, it was on the PowerPoint, 13. slide 13. Okay, I knew. <clears throat> so, okay. So this is where we get really geeky here. All right. So looking at the 2023 recommended, I know it wasn't easy to get us down to, this, to meet this 22% fund balance, so yay, thank you. But what kind of really gives me pause, and I know we've seen this many, many times, but now we've got a vote tonight. And when I see a 15.3% fund balance, um, I have never seen that in the years that I've been paying attention to this. We always have at least one or two years of cushion. <coughs> and um, next year's board is gonna be cursing us. <laughs> you know, or at least some people might be cursing us for, for approving a budget that gave them no cushion for next year. And so that's the other concern that I have with this plan is we are investing $7.6 million in a plan that's not been tested. So there's a fiscal aspect to this too. Um, and and when and the that $7.6 million is staff. That is not a liquid thing that we can, you know, say, oh we're, you know, we're gonna change that because those are human beings, right? And so that's gonna stay. And that's a concern for me. So um, that's all I'll say for now. Thank you. Thank you, trustees. Other questions? Trustee Boswell. Um, thank you all for this and for the work that's gone into it. Thank you for everyone who spent time answering questions um, for a very long time. Thank you to everyone who's written in to share their thoughts about all of this. Um, I have a few questions um, and a comment. Ed, um, Mr. Ramos, I just wanna say thank you for connecting all of these hard choices to what's happening at the state capitol, what's happening in state policy to the basic allotment to, to really, this is a question of Texas being um, funding at a very low per student rate that we're fighting as well as everything else. And I really appreciate you as we're making these hard choices, reminding people that that's part of of what we need to focus on as well, that we do the best we can locally and um, to get that real change, but we need to unite with people across the state. So thank you for that. Um, I have a question about the 20% um, number. Thank you for correcting the information and explaining all the multilingual education. 27% um, still feels like a big drop. Is that, does that reflect 27% fewer students and teachers um, who are using multilingual who are who are bilingual have bilingual stipends 27 percent fewer students who need that is that a one for one so, so what what occurred this school year and when you look at the estimate um, 
Let me try to find that page. So when you look at the estimate for the 21-22 school year, keep, keep in mind that we overestimated our projections, our student enrollment. And so we overestimated the number of bilingual stipends that we would pay in 21-22. And so that's what we budgeted. Uh, but we now know that we were 3,000 students above, uh, we over projected by 3,000 students. This year we've corrected that, and so we, we have projected for a flat enrollment. So now we are actually estimating a more accurate number of the actual stipends that we will pay to specifically bilingual qualified teachers. And so the number that you see there, that 6.3, 6.4% is an actual number of stipends that we will pay uh, compared to the 8.8 .8 million. Keeping in mind that that was budgeted, that's not actual. Mm -hmm. So once uh, the end of June gets here and we look at actuals, uh, that number will probably be lower, closer to maybe uh, 7 million, a little over 7 million. So that percentage decrease is keeping in mind from budget adopted to budget adopted. Mm -hmm. And I, I do want to add the, to, the, to your question, Tristy Boswell, is the largest number of kids that we lost were at elementary. So you're going to see a different um, ratio of what it would have affected if, because when you think about it, well, did that happen across all grade levels? No, our largest loss were at, were at elementary um, grades. So you, you would see a bigger effect on those stipends. That makes sense. Thank you for that. And do you feel like we lost a disproportionate number of students who are English language learners and emergent bilingual as well? Yes, um, and partially because the outpricing mm -hmm. of, of our community. Yeah. And so we're going to get, I mean, even fewer folks that are able to stay within our boundaries and then, you know, the recapture. I mean, so it's the property value, then it's the taxes, because even though we had a lower tax rate, you still had an increase in dollars that we each had to pay for taxes. So it's really hard for, for us, like, yes, it's a lower tax rate, but with property values going up so much, you still, you still have to come up with more dollars. And you're like, wait a minute, how did the tax rate go down and my tax bill went up? Yeah. Yeah. And that is our reality. And to clarify on that, Mr. Ramos, we are not choosing to lower our tax rate and have less money. We are required to lower our tax rate. That is correct. And have less money. That's correct. For the current state uh, funding guidelines and formulas, uh, as our property values grow uh, at a higher percentage than the statewide average, we have to uh, reduce our overall tax rate, which is uh, what House Bill 3 did with uh, uh, tax compression. Yep. Thank you for making sure people realize that. So Cause to reiterate your point, tax compression is a state requirement yes. that we have to do. Yes. Um, and that was part of the legislation so that, you know, there was, I guess, uh, credit given to individuals for lowering the tax rates. Yes. Thank you. I just want to be really clear on that, that we're not, yeah, choosing to do that. And, and yet we're all paying more, so yes. Um, and then I have just a couple of follow-ups. I think most of my questions about the planning time have been um, asked and answered, and, and I know we've had a lot of conversation, a lot of back and forth about this. Um, so, and, and, you know, I don't think there's question that people support more planning time. It's the how. And I, I'm trying to square how the expertise that is in central office and I think a really um, a plan that people really believe in and invest in doesn't match the expertise I'm hearing from campuses and from families. And we've been hearing since February really a flood of comments that this is not going to work at the campus level, real concerns. I think if we look back at um, what we talked about on Tuesday with the testing, that the testing came after the end of year test came after STAR, and, and that was something people from campus said wasn't going to work, and now we know it didn't. I'm really concerned. You know, I, I have complete faith that there's an honest and genuine um, confidence that this is working on paper, but I'm also hearing from people who spend time on campuses that they have real concern that it's not going to work when we're when you have thousands of kids and hundreds of teachers and reality of weather and and just that in reality it's not going to work as intended and I just would like to have a sense of how you're squaring what we're hearing from the campus level with what you guys have done on paper. 
and and with a lot of input I know from people on campuses but we're all we're also getting a lot of input from people on campuses and I'm having trouble reconciling that with a big recurring cost so I, I think I think that is I mean that's I think the issue that is before you and and I certainly understand the different perspectives and our teams worked with campuses and, and that's why we ended up with a more localized plan as opposed to the original rollout which was going to be more of each school would have the exact same number of minutes and so on and so forth and in that process it was the campuses who said we really think we need to do this a little differently and so it was in response to that um, I don't think we're going to be able to um, provide you anything other than uh, I think the the challenge that you do have I, I totally understand the communication that you all have received I I I I believe our team really did go and work with campuses. I, I don't think that that's not accurate either. Okay. Um, and I think to to one and to any challenge, there are so many different perspectives because there isn't one right way to do it. And I don't think that this way is the one right way to do it. I do think we let our campuses lead and we let them make the adjustments and we put in those sessions to get feedback starting at the beginning of the year for that purpose to do our best to try to respond to the concerns that folks had given to you all that we've heard in public comment um, and really rely on that feedback as well so that we can help the campuses make adjustments in, in meeting all those needs. All right, thank you for that. Um, I think that's it for me for now, thank you. Thank you. Trustees, other questions? Trustee Sabata. Thank you, um, Mr. Ramos, for um, a very good presentation. Um, one thing I did I didn't hear, and I'm just and I don't have my notebook to see what page, but there we. AISD invests in many partnerships, many programs to help us in many different ways, uh, like literacy, literacy programs, uh, Austin Voices, uh, Sylvan, and many others. So are those, uh, are those programs invested annually, or is there a commitment to two years or three years? And is there an evaluation tool that that states how it helped student academically, attendance, behavior, mental health, or any of those areas to recommend continued funding? So it, it's gonna depend on the uh, program that we are looking at because they are grant funded. Uh, so as far as the stipulations in the grant may be a one-year grant, two-year grant, we're about to look at uh, for example, the city of Austin with uh, the, the PSSs in the district, uh, it's a, a multi-year uh, uh, agreement. And so it just depends on where, where the funding comes from. Uh, as far as uh, how uh, we evaluate each program, uh, that is done, again, it also depends on what department oversees uh, that program as well. Uh, and so I know that there has been discussions on uh, do we evaluate the student outcomes, what we are getting for uh, our investment in those programs. And so uh, I can tell you that that is one of the areas that we will continue to look at as a district. Uh, again, because of our dollar, budget dollars becoming so much tighter, uh, that is one of the areas that we are going to have to continue looking at is these programs that we invest in uh, and are we uh, receiving the outcomes that we are expecting as a district. Yeah, I just don't feel comfortable recommitting funds when there's not an evaluation attached to it to see how it's uh, affected or improved our academics, our students' growth in many different ways. So, um, so you're saying that's something that is in that you will be doing, because, uh, or is there somewhere we could look at to find the evaluations that were done? of these, because many of these are invested year after year after year after year, so there has to be some kind of evaluation. So we do have a, a listing now, Trustee Zapata, of 
all, under Michelle Wallace, she put together all of the different, whether they're under directly her shop or someone else's mm -hmm. shop. So this year we did compile what are all the partnerships that, that we do know of, what's the percentage or the dollar amount that we put in, and then how is that program being evaluated. But we haven't brought that to completion okay. in terms of, um, all of them do require some form of evaluation, but sometimes it's an outside, um, we might contract services to evaluate. Some of the evaluations are required to be part of the original grant okay. that, you know, so they are different. And I do think that was the next area of then trying to figure out which of these can we begin to correlate, because we're never gonna have cause and effect, but we can correlate we're seeing benefits in this way as mm -hmm. seen by this evaluation. Okay. So I do think that early next year, um, the team would be able to start bringing you, um, even if it's in a report, mm -hmm. here are the programs, here's the dollar amount, and then what we see as the evaluation informing us of outcomes. Okay, all right, thank you. Tracy's about that. I thought you had mentioned the, uh, the minimum wage. Oh, you didn't ask me about that one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this year, uh, a year ago, when we were gonna pass the budget, <clears throat> I was just very, uh, gosh, I don't know, I don't wanna say real pissed off, but I was. <laughs> <laughs> I was that we were only paying 1350 to our employees, which is poverty wage. And it was too late to make any change. So I am very happy that uh, our superintendent didn't forget that. And really early, early on in the year said, we are gonna increase that wage. So I am very happy that uh, Dr. Elisal did it with her leadership and all the team that we are investing in our staff because uh, they <laughs> deserve it. Um, and this is just the beginning. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Zapata. Trustees, any other questions? If not, at this time, we will adjourn our public hearing, take a short break, and then return to the open, to open the regular voting meeting. Secretary Singh, do I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. Is there a second? Second. So having a motion by Secretary Singh and a second by Trustee, I'm sorry, could I? I just wanna make sure that we get it right in the recording. Just give it just one second. Just, okay. So having a motion by Secretary Singh and a second by Trustee Zapata to adjourn. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. And the motion passes by all those on the dais. The meeting is now adjourned at 8.34 p.m. Thank you.
So when she lowers it, then she. Yeah. Good evening. In compliance with Chapter 551 of the Texas Government Code, I call to order a regular voting meeting of the Board of Trustees of the Austin Independent School District for Thursday, June 23, 2022 at 8.36 p.m. A quorum of the board are physically present at AISD central office to conduct this meeting. Board meetings are open to the public based on space availability to ensure social distancing and the health and safety of our community and staff. This meeting is streaming live on AISD TV and Apple TV. It's also being broadcast on cable channel 22 through Spectrum Grande and on channel 99 through AT&T Uverse. Closed captioning in English is available on these platforms for individuals who are deaf or hard of hearing. And to our audience tuning in remotely and here in person, welcome and thank you for joining us. We will move to the approval of the agenda. Secretary Singh, do you have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Is there a second? Having a motion by Secretary Singh and a second by Trustee Zapata to approve the agenda. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. And the motion passes with all those on the dais. And I'll recognize again, uh, Trustee Letitia Anderson is joining us by Zoom. Oh, she might be joining us via Zoom with a beach, on the beach. <laughs> or a desert. I think or a, a desert. Is that cactus in the I background? It's cactus. I, my apologies. Maybe the beach is where I was dreaming of being. So, uh, Secretary Singh, will you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance and the Pledge to the Texas flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag, I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. Honor the Texas flag, Te juro lealtad Texas, un estado bajo Dios, único e indivisible. Tonight is the last meeting of the 2021-22 school year. Just four weeks ago, Austin ISD celebrated 4,677 new graduates who will now go off to colleges, careers, training programs, the armed forces, and other next steps. We are so proud of our graduates and our students and very grateful for every employee who helped prepare every student with the knowledge and skills to thrive in college, career, and life. On behalf of the Board of Trustees, we wish all our students and staff a safe and exciting summer. We cannot wait to see each and every one of you back at your campus this fall. Typically, the Board doesn't meet in the month of July, but additional meetings may be scheduled during July to discuss facility and bond planning. So when additional meetings are scheduled, uh, this will be included on the board docs website, on the AISD calendar, and communicated through, is it the Twitter or Twitter? Twitter, Twitter sorry. <laughs> through Twitter and Facebook. We look fo I, I needed an English lesson there for a second. We look forward to continuing to engage in this important work with our community. The other, uh, that's part of the President's report. The other part of the President's report uh, is we made a commitment to keep you all updated on the superintendent transition. So as was shared earlier this week and last week, the board has named Dr. Anthony Mays as the interim superintendent. In fact, he has already been transitioning, working with Dr. Elizalde and the team. And tonight, the board is scheduled in an executive session to discuss his contract. 
And while we're excited to welcome Dr. Mays into his new position, I do want to take a moment to thank our outgoing superintendent, Dr. Stephanie Elizalde. Dr. Elizalde, uh, we've appreciated everything you've done for Austin students over the last two years. You led us through COVID. You led us through a winter storm, online school, a return to the classroom. And most importantly, and personally to all of us on this dais, 85 called board meetings, including tonight and sometimes into the morning. We are so thankful for everything you've done and your commitment to putting students first in every decision you make. And we wish you the best in Dallas and are thankful to have such a strong partner advocating with us for the unique needs of urban schools in the coming years, included but not limited which is always a legal phrase there, including but not limited to uh, recapture. And so I know <coughs> that that is something that you uh, are very well versed in and we've appreciated your, um, your guidance around that. So we wanna just take a moment and say thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So at this time, we'd like to have trustees provide committee reports. So Trustee Ashi, can you share the policy report and the report for the Austin Education Fund? certainly provide the uh, board policy committee. I, I hope I'm not speaking incorrectly when I say I do not believe the Austin Ed Fund board has met since our last report out. Uh, the board policy committee um, has met and they convened, uh, we convened at 12.04 on Monday, June the 6th with trustees Ashi, Foster and Boswell. Also present from administration were, doc, uh, were Stephanie Herrera, I'm Eber, sorry, said that wrong. Dr. Susan Diaz, Leslie Stevens, Eduardo Ramos, Annie Collier, Lavania Horn Williams, and Edna Butts. Additionally, members of the Citizens Bond Oversight Committee, or uh, the wonderful acronym of CBOC, um, we have, um, members were present, and those were Lori Moya, Cheryl Bradley, Alex Winslow, Christy Merritt, and Jennifer Carson. Uh, they were there because we were going to be discussing. The uh, first policy, which was BDF local, which has to do with board internal organization and citizen advisory committees. The committee received comments from some members of the CBOC regarding BDF local. The board approved revisions to BDF local on November 18th of 2021, which among other things provided that a committee member may serve one two year term with the possibility of serving one additional term with the goal of, and the reason for that change was, was the intention and goal of expanding opportunities to members who may not have been um, given the ability to do, to serve on those committees before. Um, and, and not just the CBOC, but um, all other advisory boards. The revisions also provided that changes to bylaws are approved by the superintendent and that changes to those bylaws of a board appointed advisory committee shall be shared with the board and that should three tr board members request that the revised bylaws would also be presented to the full board for consideration. So among some of the feedback that was received from the CBOC members um, were one, that the uh, CBOC is an oversight committee rather than an advisory committee. And so as a result should be considered differently. Number two, that the changes to the bylaws should be approved by the board and not the superintendent because they are a board appointed committee. And number three, that there should be a different term limits for an oversight committee. So this was the feedback that was provided and the policy committee will be discussing this policy again at its August meeting, um, potentially with changes, potentially not, but um, those will be coming back to us for further discussion. Next, we discussed AEHAA local, um, which is basic instructional programs um, and required instruction and revisions to this policy um, are to comply with Senate Bill 9 passed by the 87th legislature in the second called special session, which required the SHAC, the Student Health Advisory Committee, to recommend appropriate grade levels and curriculum for instruction, instruction on child abuse, family violence, and dating violence. So in addition to the revisions required by Senate Bill 9, other revisions included updating the curriculum perimeters section of this policy to use more inclusive gender neutral language and be more in line with the updated Health Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills, um, or some refer to them as the TEKS, and remove any content that does not require parental permission to teach, such as healthy friendships, families, and identity. 
This policy is on the agenda for approval this evening. Um, we also talked about contracts and procurement. Uh, there were several policies around this one. The committee reviewed the proposed changes to CHE local, CH local, and CV local, and they will address um, the following things. One is clarifying the contract approval amounts, um, and it was that, that contracts that amount to more than $100,000 a year, that those will be um, looked at on an annual basis. That uh, The second uh, consideration was prohibiting automatic renewals. The third was notifying the Board of Renewals of contracts previously approved by the board on a monthly basis. And the intention behind that was to let uh, the board know when renewals were coming up, um, that that the, the administration, the procurement department agreed with the renewal of those and that they had been monitoring how they were being executed and performed. Um, and fourth was tightening up the language regarding prohibited contact with board members and staff during the time a solicitation is issued and when a contract is awarded. These proposed amendments to these policies were going to be brought to the board at its August information session and a potential voting meeting in August. Uh, and finally, we discussed FNCE local, which is student conduct um, and has to do with uh, personal electronic devices. Uh, the committee discussed changes to this policy based on the principal's responses to a survey regarding whether they recommended changes to the policy of FNCE local on cell phone use. And most of the comments centered around the fee that is charged to retrieve the phone should it be taken up at school. And uh, the other most common one that you've heard me talk about before is updating the terminology to include phones and smartwatches and exclude the term paging device, which seems to have um, outlived itself. <laughs> um, so uh, the revisions to this policy will be brought to the board at its August information session, as well as uh, put the potential for the voting meeting. We adjourned at 1.55 p.m., and our next meeting will be on August 9th um, uh, at 10 a.m. Trustee Ashley, didn't they also um, decide to delete any references to pay phones? <laughs> <laughs> Booths? <laughs> they, there was not an, a reference to a pay phone, so I think we're okay on that one. Thank you very much for that update. Trustee Boswell, can you share the intergovernmental report? Yes, I can. No pagers or pay phones in this one. Um, so the Board Intergovernmental Relations Committee met at 10 a.m. on May 24th. Um, Trustee Zapata, Trustee Singh, and I were there. And from an administration, uh, Dr. Jacob Reach and Edna Butts were there to work with us. Uh, the committee discussed several priorities to be presented to the board um, at tonight's meeting. And it's a short list of priorities, our preliminary priorities related to school finance. Uh, and we chose to focus on that first because we know that conversations are happening statewide about vouchers, um, recapture, obviously, uh, the basic allotment, and we wanted to be able to advocate for those as a board. So that's why we're doing those first. But um, those are our preliminary list, not our full list. And we'll be coming to the community to work with us in, in the fall to help shape the rest of our priority list of priorities. Um, the committee also discussed recommending the board make a statement requ regarding its support for the original intent of recapture and, and our values around recapture that we don't support, that we understand recapture has a very important place in our state and that we feel like it's out of whack and you'll see that at the top of our legislative priorities that we are looking at tonight. Um, we also discussed the possibility of a board appointed advisory body that would com be comprised of campus staff, community partners, families, students, and others to abide, advise us on legislative priorities. So we'll be discussing that. Um, and we briefly discussed continued pers participation in the Raise Your Hand Trustee Advocates Program that we have spoken with you. It was for a team of 10 and with Dr. Elizalde leaving. Um, we can no longer participate in that program, but we talked about how we can carry some of that good work forward. Um, and then I also want to let people know um, there will be an orientation session for people interested in running for trustee seats. There will be five seats open for election. Um, we're going to have two orientation sessions, one before the filing period opens and one before the filing period ends. We have a date for one of them. It's on July 21st at 5.30 p.m., open to anyone who's interested. 
um, you can either email Dr. Reach at Jacob, J-A-C-O-B dot Reach, R-E-A-C-H at AustinISD.org, or you can go to the trustee webpage, AustinISD.org forward slash board forward slash elections, and there will be information there. There is not information there yet that I can see. Dr. Reach, correct me if I'm wrong, um, but there will be information on joining that meeting, and it will be both in person and by Zoom. Thank you. Thank you, trustees. Are there any other uh, committee or training reports to share tonight? Okay, if not, I'm going to move us to the superintendent's report, but I just want to recognize Trustee uh, Wagner for a point of personal privilege. Thank you, um, President Rodriguez. Um, I did want to just take a moment, a personal privilege, to thank Dr. Elizalde at her last board meeting for um, her contributions to our district um, during her time here. I do want to make note that as we talk about superintendents coming through our district, um, Dr. Elizalde is actually only the 15th superintendent in Austin ISD's 141-year history. Um, she's the second woman to serve. and. More importantly, the first Latina to serve at the helm of our district. I do want to honor that because that comes at the 100-year uh, anniversary of the hiring of the first Latina teacher in our district, Consuelo Mendez. Consuelo Mendez. So that you have come here not only to make history yourself, but you came here at a historic time. and. I cannot think of a more challenging point in our history for somebody to take over a school district. You joined us at a time when we were trying to find our way through the start of a pandemic, uh, trying to navigate virtual learning, trying to understand how we make sense of changing state laws, underfunding, and increasing mandates coming at us every day. Um, and you navigated it with strength and with grace. There have been times where I think you've been caught behind community concern about the environment that we find ourselves in. But what I have seen from you is a consistent commitment to doing the right thing for students every day. I've seen you take it on the chin many, many times, but never waver from that commitment. Um, in your time here, you stood up for our, the safety of our students and put yourself in harm's way by requiring a mask mandate. You brought our minimum wage up to a better level. You've definitely zeroed in on making sure that we have supports in the classroom for our classroom teachers and making sure that our SEL and health curriculums continue to support students. There's a lot of contributions and a lot that you've navigated in two very quick years. And I will say for me personally, I'm truly sad to see you go and would have loved to have the opportunity to work with you more in this district. But if you can't be here, I'm thrilled for the students of Dallas will be able to benefit from what I know is an incredibly deep passion for pedagogy and a very deep commitment for students and academic success. So thank you for your time here and we wish you well in Dallas ISD and we look forward to continuing to work with you in many capacities. I know we'll see you at the Capitol advocating for recapture and, and things that our students need. So. The next item is the superintendent's report. Dr. Thank 
Last weekend, Navarro's Viking Barbecue team, yes, we're gonna talk about barbecue, because one thing Dallas doesn't have, and I'm sure they're listening to me, but nonetheless, <laughs> they don't have good barbecue. So um, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm gonna have to tell them that, and um, I'm sure I'm not gonna get off on the right foot there either, but we'll, we'll continue on nonetheless. Uh, Navarro's Viking Barbecue team competed in the National High School Barbecue Association's Championship, and yesterday morning, they found out that they placed seventh nationally. Woo! That deserves a round of applause. The Viking Barbecue team was awarded second place in the nation in the categories of ribs and brisket, my two favorites, and finished in ninth place for their chicken, which I'm good with because I don't really care for chicken, so I really needed them to finish in the ribs and the brisket area anyway. Um, I, I wanna extend humble congratulations to Agriculture Department head Tracy Cortez and his team, including Jose, Natalie, Luis, Leo, and Eno. Enjoy. <clears throat> Y'all deserve it. But it hasn't uh, all been about smoked meat around here lately. We do have other things. Last month, we had a ton of celebrations to mark the end of our school year. And I, too, am so proud of the 15, was it 15 graduations? Mm -hmm. I think it's 15 yeah. when we add in Rosedale. Mm -hmm. um, and just to be able to be at every one of those. I did tell Dr. May, since I had started the, you will wear the high heel shoes of the school color for each of the graduations, that I will leave him a pair of mine. Um, I think he'll look great in high heels. Um, so to mark the end uh, of this school year, Mills Elementary School, I was. this is really just tells about our community. The fifth grade class presented a donation of more than $1,500 to the International Medical Corps for Ukraine. Congratulations to Mills Elementary <laughs> fifth grade class of 2022 as they move on to their next adventure in middle school. And thank you for your empathetic leadership. Three McCallum senior student artists received honors at the 2022 National Scholastic Art and Writing event in New York City. B. K. Campos received a gold medal in drawing and illustration and a gold medal for the 2022 American Visions Award for their artwork titled Puppet String Lifestyle. Um, and I know it never does it justice on the screen, but these are just, they're beautiful. Um, absolutely fantastic art. Grace Minix received the painting gold medal for artwork titled Sweetness. Marina Garfield was awarded the Mixed Media Silver Medal for their for the artwork titled We Are We All Bleed. We all bleed the same. Look, this one is another one that just can you see that hanging in someone's um, I mean really it's just congratulations to these students as well as their educators. Jeff Sekar Martinez and Carrie West. A lot of you have heard of Minecraft. You probably have your kids maybe even getting you to play from time to time. It's one of the most popular video games in the world and we are super excited to offer the Minecraft Education Edition is now available to all Austin ISD students and staff. This software supports creative problem solving, STEM curriculum and student voice through building models of learning products and more. This May, in partnership with C40 Cities Global Network and Mayors, Minecraft Education invited three cities from around the world to participate in a Minecraft Build Challenge to create more sustainable cities. Austin ISD held a citywide build challenge, giving students the opportunity to address local sustainability and climate issues. The goals of the challenge, to educate people on what they can do to combat the climate crisis, engage city kids in designing and building solutions for climate resilience and action, and celebrate student success and give students a platform to showcase their ideas. More than 50 student videos were submitted, and on May 25th, 19 finalists were announced. 
Congratulations to our student finalist teams. The top four team finalists were Keeling Middle Schools, Carbon Eating Bats, Zilker, I mean, the, the titles are already, Zilker Elementary's Green Builders, Doss Elementary's WPMP, Go Valley Elementary's Go Valley Roadies. To learn more about finalists and see their videos about the projects, please visit the Austin ISD Technology webpage. And congratulations, kiddos. Last Friday at the Juneteenth Music Festival at the Performing Arts Center, the first ever winners of the Austin All-Star Band Scholarship were announced, with each winner getting a $500 scholarship. The winners are Johanna and Janelle Tristan, or Tristan of Northeast Early College High School, who will be attending the University of North Texas to major in biology, will be close to me, and a biology major. Two good things. Uh, Julian Perez of Northeast Early College High School, who will be attending Austin Community College to major in accounting, and Christian Perez of Northeast Early College High School, who will attend Prairie View A&M University to major in music education. This scholarship was created to expand the participation in the Austin All-Star Band, as well as to help some students with some of their college um, fees that they may not have had all the financial support for. So congratulations to these students for their musical and academic talents that will take them far as they continue to college. I also want to sing the praises of one of our award-winning music teachers, Thomas Mann, orchestra director at Aikens High School. He has been named quarter finalist for the Music Education Grammy. Congratulations, to Mr. Mann, for this amazing achievement. This is a really big deal. And I saved this one for last because there really are no words sufficient to show our appreciation for the members of the Long Range Planning Committees. I am absolutely floored by their passion and dedication and truly the sacrifices they have made to progress this critical work for our district. And I'm not using the word sacrifices lightly. Since October, the P LPCs have met 31 official times, because there's a lot of other meeting going on, but there are 31 we can talk about that we know for more than 100 hours more than 100 hours per person. In case that's not impressive enough, it should be, but in case it's not, let me add that more than 50 of those hours have all been just since the end of May. We're not even done in June. So I don't know when they sleep or eat or take care of their families, but <clears throat> we're thankful. And that doesn't include the co-chair or the subcommittee meetings. Dozens of those. I truly know that the amounts of things that you missed out with family and bedtime rituals and personal downtime, we're truly, I am truly grateful. Very few people will be able to do what you have done and you're doing it in a way that ensures voice for those who cannot be able to be there. And for that, I am eternally grateful. Throughout this past school year, the LPCs have followed the equity by design process to create strategies to address many of the challenges our district has faced for generations. This is the first time, not just in our district's history, but I think it's safe to say in our country as well, that any school district has endeavored to follow the equity by design model at this scale. It wasn't perfect. We've learned together as we've moved along this trajectory and thank you for extending us grace on the multiple occasions where we needed to circle back and make sure that we got it right. I also want to recognize the members of the Bond Steering Committee who have put in more than 20 hours over the course of just nine meetings. And if you thought I was done singing the praises of the LPC, let's not forget that 11 of the 17 bond steering committee members also serve on the long range planning committee. So just add up the amount of time they're doing double duty and have been doing so for several months. I know that we are working on a compressed timeline to ensure that our high priority long range planning strategies that require the possibility of a bond investment will receive that funding. 
but I want to take this opportunity to acknowledge that the long range planning is about so much more than a list of these important bond, proje bond projects, although that is very important. It's also about continuing to set the vision for our district about analyzing our policies, our practices, and budgeting decisions to ensure that we are disrupting inequitable outcomes across our district. So while I know we've kicked it into overdrive for the last few months and we cannot thank our committee members enough for going on that ride with us, I want everyone to know that we are committed to thoughtfully completing the part of the long range planning work that is not tied to bond in collaboration with our committee members on a timeline that's more appreciative of everyone's schedules. Again, I really can't thank our committee members enough for participating on this journey with us. It speaks volumes about your commitment to our students and to our public schools. And for that reason, we are a better school district. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lizalde. Trustees, any, any questions? I know I, I just I know I had one uh, comment, Dr. Lizalde. I'd be remiss. Um, this year, I was able to attend all 15 of those graduations, and um, out of all the accomplishments, everything, I think one of the ones that I, I think um, I just wanted to raise up was the 13 young men and women from Aikens High School who graduated a year early from high school, so it took three years for them to go to high school, and also received a two-year degree from Austin Community College. And I think that those 13 are such an exception to the rule that we need to learn from them about how to make this district theirs. And, and the, what they did becomes the rule and not the exception. And I think that's where this board is headed with your help and your direction and, and the board with the district scorecard and everything that we're doing. So I, I really, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that. And um, and thank you for all the, your other um, comments about our long-range planning com, uh, committee and bond steering committee. Uh, I think uh, Trustee Boswell, you might want to invite each and every one of them to the uh, to the uh, potential trustee uh, training uh, <laughs> meeting. Um, they can what, join Trustee uh, Ashy as the nice fat back lady. Yes. That's yes. <laughs> yes. Um, any questions, trustees? Bless you. So thank you, Dr. Isade. I think we're gonna move to item 6.1, our next item. Speaking of the scorecard, it's a scorecard discussion and review on the scorecard indicator goal number four, grades six through eight, the map end of year in regards to reading and math. So Dr. Isade. Thank you, President Rodriguez. Um, while the team gets up here, um, please know that um, we, and I, I'm, I'm I am um, a little under the weather. It is not COVID. I tested every day hoping it would be positive so that I would not have to come to this meeting today. Um, no, it was not positive. So, um, but I'm not contagious as told by my doctor. Um, um, and we seem to have it going around right now. So Ms. Casas is going to be represented by our team in front of us this evening because she is under the weather. Ed Ramos has been under the weather. Dr. Mays has been under the weather. Um, so I'm sure there, those are just the ones I know about. So that is why as soon as I, they, as soon as uh, trustees uh, Boswell and Singh heard me say one word and I was congested, their masks came out and put them on. So uh, perhaps it was something I said or how I said it, but nonetheless. Um, I did not get the memo. <laughs> and I will say, it's, I know you don't have COVID, but I have seen you guys very sick and I don't want it. <laughs> so thank you. So um, so with that, um, I know that Ms. Casas, you have no idea how many times she kept texting me, okay, I think maybe my voice is rested and, and I'm like, sick is sick, just, stay home. Um, so um, we're in capable hands and I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Dr. Diaz who will start us off. 
Um, good evening, President Rodriguez, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Elizalde. We are here tonight to present to you an update on scorecard goal number four. I am Dr. Susan Diaz. I am the Assistant Superintendent of Academics, and I'm here with Dr. Stout, the Associate Superintendent of Secondary Schools, and Dr. Drew Robinette, who is the Assistant Superintendent of special education. And anything else, or is that it? Okay. So first of all, we're, I would like to just remind you of what score called, scorecard goal number four is. And this is, it has to do with students identified as economically disadvantaged demonstrating achievement on state assessments for grades six through eight reading and math at the meets grade level will increase from 30% to 60% by August of 2026. So that is our long range, um, that is our long range goal. So as you can see, the goal is targeting um, uh, economically disadvantaged students, and it is based on state assessment, but our progress measures 4.1 through 4.4 are based on MAP, and we are hitting the um, achievement level performance. So this would be at meets or master's level, but what MAP would refer to as on grade level or above. So just to um, remind um, the people at home, because I'm sure you all are very familiar with this, um, the first uh, page we're looking at is just the goals that have been set, not just the goals, but the goals that have been set for the scorecard starting this year and ending up in 25-26. Um, Dr. Reach, next one. This is something that you've seen before, um, but again, this is just to remind everyone, especially the community members, what you're looking at at the top is um, performance from our standardized assessment in regards to reading and math, sixth through eighth grade, and it's focused on our econom economically disadvantaged students. So you'll see longitudinal, longitudinal data that starts in 1819, where we were below the state by six percentage points. And then in 2021, we were below the state by 10 percentage points. But as you all know, AISD's participation rate in 2021 was 38%, while the state was at 85%. So we had a much lower participation rate. So now I'm going to draw your attention to the progress monitoring, which is just underneath that. And we are going to focus, uh, this is like a summary of <clears throat> where we are right now. So uh, progress measure 4.1 is about our African American students who are identified as economically disadvantaged and their achievement on reading map. And again, we're looking at on grade level or above. The beginning of the school year, we are at 20%. The mid year, we were at 21. At the end of the year, we were at 16%. So we did not meet our target. Um, progress measure 4.2 it was Hispanic students identified as economically disadvantaged. This is reading map at the on grade level or above, beginning of the year 23%, mid year 22, end of year 18. Our target at the end of the year should have been 23%. We did not meet. Our progress measure for um, 4.3 is math, African American students identified as economically disadvantaged on grade level or above, beginning of the year 10%, middle of the year 12%, end of year 9%, our target was 11. We did not meet our target. I do have good news. 4.4, Hispanic students identified as economically disadvantaged, again, math at the on grade level or above, beginning of the year we started out at 12%, mid-year 13%, our end of year 13%, we did hit this goal, the, this target, the target was 13%. Dr. Reach, next. So this is a more in-depth breakdown of the previous summary slide. So what we're looking at here is performance in reading, and I would like to draw your attention to the right hand, the right hand two columns, and so if we're looking at our, we're tracking our African American students, the target was 20%, and we missed that target by 4%. 
in regards to our Hispanic student, our students, our um, target was 23% for reading, and we missed that by 5%. Dr. Reach? Oh, are you clicking? Or no, it's Dr. Reach, okay. So then um, in regards to um, performance at math, again, if we're tracking our African-American students, we, our goal, our target was 11%, and we were two percentage points away from achieving that target. And for our Hispanic students, um, the target was 13%, and that is the one target that we did hit. So now I would like to transition us into solutions. If um, Dr. Elizal did, do you have anything you'd like to add? Okay. So um, Dr. Reach, can you um, go to the PowerPoint, please? Okay, so um, we, we know that there's, there's a problem, right? So what we did as a team is think reflectively, same, kind of the same way that Dr. Um, Robinette presented this information to you all on Tuesday. So what we wanted to do is think about what are the root causes and what, are, what areas are in our wheelhouse that we can um, look into. So the questions that, uh, the, the three core areas that are in our division are curriculum, instruction, and um, assessment. So we came up with some guiding questions to delve into the data and think about possible solutions and adjustments we needed to make. So our first question was, does our curriculum provide teachers with um, the supports they need to be successful? In regards to instruction, how can we create a model of um, instruction that differentiates for all learners and um, closes opportunity gaps? Whoops closes opportunity gaps before they become too wide. And for, in assessments, we wanted to create a balanced assessment system that provides just-in-time data to teachers so that they can make just-in-time adjustments. So again, these are the three areas in our wheelhouse that we believe will impact our, um, our results. Next slide, please. So here is just a reminder of where we are in the implementation of um, MAP. So we have had MAP for one, this is the second year for elementary campuses, and you'll see that listed on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, you will see that this is the first year that we have adopted it for middle schools. Some of the problem with the elementary campuses, that, not that there's a problem, but uh, it was during the pandemic, and so the attendance is sporadic, and it's hard to get really reliable results when the kids are in and out. Again, that did happen to us this year as well. So we know that we um, have some we have some compa capacity building to do. So we've kind of sketched out a plan for how we're going to get to the sustainability phase where we will hit the scorecard targets. Next slide, please. So the, these are the adjust, uh, just a high level look because in your um, packets you, there's more detailed information. But again, these are aligned to the three things that, it, that are in our wheelhouse, th things that we um, n know can move the needle. Um, first is we want to have our, uh, our curriculum audited either using TASA or Region 13. Most likely we'll use Region 13 because TASA has a waiting list that would take years for us to get on that. Um, but we definitely want to have an outside company look at our curriculum and ensure that we have all of the supports necessary included in the curriculum that will help our teachers and students be successful. We've also made revisions to the curriculum, such as spiraling com um, complex uh, concepts, co what we call hard to teach, hard to learn. So those concepts will occur multiple times within the math curriculum. And we've also made adjustments to the scope and sequence that's based on data. We've moved some of the things around to scaffold from easier concepts to more complicated concepts. We're in the process of creating an equity reflection tool that um, PLCs can use when they are planning out their units. And this tool will help them 
as they're looking at text to read or products that they're asking students to make and ensure that there is not any kind of unconscious bias within the, the lessons and the units they're planning. And finally, we will add reading and writing across all content areas, and this is gonna be a big push because the state assessment is changing in a way to where um, there's gonna be writing in multiple content areas, so we wanna ensure our curriculum reflects that. In regard to instruction, we wanna shore up um, our learning on objectives, learning objectives and success criteria, and this is super important because the idea of a learning objective is what a student is supposed to accomplish that day. What am I going to learn today? But the real um, meat of it is the success criteria because the success criteria is the cognitive scaffold that the student will need to make in order to achieve the goal. So in, in a way, it's like the kids will start here, and then once I have that mastered, then I move up cognitively until I reach the target or the goal or the objective for the day. The great thing about that is it'll help our um, emerging, emerging bilinguals. It's gonna help um, our students with IEPs. Um, it's gonna help students that are GT because you can scaffold up and down within success criteria. Additionally, um, we are working on um, a one-day PLC training with the Office of School Leadership and Professional Learning to provide, um, it's, we're hoping it'll be a make and take where the, we're, we're gonna train every principal and a AP on the PLC process, and we're hoping it's something that they can be able to turn around directly on their campuses. And um, we are also taking every principal and AP through um, a MAP training in where they are going to learn how to use reports from MAP to shore up tier one instruction. And then we are, are also working with um, the Office of School Leadership to think about the way we structure our support from our specialist. In the last meeting, you all did mention that um, we're, we're kind of short-staffed right now. And so Dr. Robinette talked to you all about what we're gonna have to do with all of our specialists is they're gonna have to be able to collaborate and cross-train and know each other's contents. So therefore, they know a little bit of, of uh, enough to be dangerous and can support um, P, uh, the campuses in multiple areas. Um, and uh, again, this has to do with the service model that um, we have been collaborating with Office of School Leadership to create a new service model that'll better serve our campuses. And then finally, in regards to assessment, um, there, what we're, we, while my map data is wonderful and while our short cycle assessments are wonderful, I did hear you all ask last time what happens in between. And those are the gaps that we need to fill. The teachers need more frequent data and uh, in order to close those gaps more quickly or in order to prevent those gaps from happening. So we've got um, some training that we're going to do on common formative assessments and then also students being able to set their own goals to monitor their learning and that is connected closely to the learning objectives and success success criteria because using those things they can um, see where they are within their learning on a daily basis next slide please and now we open it up to you all for questions. I just want to emphasize, if you'll go back to that very last slide, because I want to make sure what people did not hear, because if we're not explicit, <clears throat> when we say formative assessments, we're not talking about another standardized a set of assessments. We know that is not what teachers need more of. Um, it's what, what systematic kind of activity um, that has a rubric or that has a performance measure, it can be short, but it connects with the longer term type assessment. So you do something in your classroom that you can evaluate the student work and you can identify, oh, this student needs me to intervene here and then instruction improves. Um, so it's to help them not have to do a one size fits all for everyone, but it's also intended for them to be able to um, do this in a way that's not, this isn't more testing, it's the actual work that instructionally you're doing in your classroom. How do I use that to inform 
my next set of instructional delivery. And, and so I want to make sure our community did not hear. We're not they making heard formative more assessments. Assessment. What? More tests? We want less. And, and so we are very, very connected with the whole assessment. And, and we like to much. call those things um, micro-interventions, and they happen on the fly during the classroom. So a, a formative assessment can be something as simple as a teacher walking around the classroom listening to the kids have conversation. Right. I hear that Dr. Elizalde doesn't get it, and her partner, I need to go over there and address that misconception right away. So I know that sometimes assessment gets a a bad rap, but it's really just monitoring learning. Thank you for the presentation uh, this evening. So trustees, now is the time for us to ask questions on the current vision. Our goal tonight is monitoring and ensuring our reality matches the vision presented. When asking questions, we should try to focus on the data presented, asking questions about who, what, why, and how. So first up, I uh, see uh, Trustee Anderson on Zoom has raised her hand. So we'll start with Trustee Anderson. Dr. Stout, Dr. Diaz, thank you for this presentation. Uh, I have a couple of questions and a comment. So my first question is, and it might seem kind of strange, but I have not heard this in years. Do students still do book reports? I'm not sure the answer to that question. <laughs> and I know, I know it's, <laughs> I know it may seem crazy, but it goes into my next question is, um, how are teachers ensuring students retain the information that is learned. Can I start? You, so. Trustee Anderson, thank you for that question. And um, although I, I wouldn't say that uh, we could say unilaterally that our, our students are, are participating or creating book reports, it is common for us to have students substantiate um, in, in sort of the writing process and the critical thinking process where they're using text evidence and responding to particular prompts or questions, justifying their thinking and using particular excerpts from a text to be able to substantiate what they related to or those types of things. It's hard, I don't know where to look, Trustee Anderson, so I'm gonna look over here at the monitor, but then I won't look at the camera, but um, know that I'm looking straight at you, ma'am. Um, um, and then the other component, um, the question, uh, what was her, her second question? So I, th I think also I'd like to add about um, how you retain information, oh, and thanks. I think a lot of that does have to do with those learning objectives and success criteria, because that's what connects the learning from day to day. Sometimes when we don't leverage those objectives and kind of remind the students of, remember this is what we did yesterday and this is where we're heading tomorrow and in, in this entire unit, those kind of things help build the hooks that allow kids to retain information. So we are, we are working on that, ma'am. Trustee Anderson, Drew Robinette, Assistant Superintendent for Special Education, just to clarify um, further, if I may, ma'am, um, the other thing that we started to really emphasize, and it came up again this evening, is around that strong tier one instruction. So when you have the frequency of assessing students, that's part of the teaching and learning cycle. It doesn't mean that you're giving a paper pen, pencil test, that when you're planning as an educator, what you're doing is you're thinking about, what am I seeing my students do? What are the particular standards that I have in place? How do I help them approximate that standard with just-in-time adjustments, whether it's looking at their samples of exit tickets or looking at things that they're doing, or if you're in a primary classroom, monitoring sort of how they're engaging with the learning. And so that's a, part, a critical part of that tier one instructional process. I'll speak from a special, uh, a special education department lens. One of the reasons we're working here collaboratively and, and trying to work across our system to think about what are the appropriate differentiation strategies and instructional accommodations that need to be met for students. <coughs> What we're thinking about is what is that just in time? Sometimes the mindset, again, from the, the lens for the special education team is, what are those testing accommodations? 
that's a, that's important. But what we're trying to think about is what are the just-in-time <coughs> instructional accommodations that can help students better access learning? And that's part of doing that more just-in-time to ensure greater retention of those inform of that information. I just wanted to add, as Laura Stout, Associate Superintendent for Secondary Schools, that you know a lot of what we've seen as we've walked through classrooms is a lot of short answer and summarization, uh, Trustee Anderson, and also uh, in reading, um, we've got to figure out how to, you know, what the what the author is trying to say. So, sh so a lot of inferencing, you'll hear that a lot and see that a lot when we walk through classrooms. Is we, we have discussions about inferencing when we're reading and trying to figure out what is the author trying to say. What trends are you seeing in the data? I think one of the trends we see in the data is, um, and it's something you all have obviously seen before, is um, sixth grade uh, is across the district it is struggling, but that that's common across the state, across the nation. It has something a little bit to do with the academic, the jump in rigor from fifth grade to sixth grade, but it also I'm sure it has to do with emotional development and switching into from elementary to um, middle school. But we also saw that our reading is lagging more so than the math, um, and that could possibly be because they had more ground to make up in math, so they're, they were doing quite a good job of growing in regards to middle school. They were growing quite rapidly in math. What interventions are being put in place to address the missed targets? So our, we did create an intervention lessons that is within the curriculum, but um, once we, uh, we, we get the, the teachers more adept and we roll out a solid training about the learning objectives and the success criteria, it's that kind of intervention that happens on a daily basis that we, we know, the research says, if it's done right, we'll close the gaps. I'd like to add. Mm -hmm. Were you not finished? No. Uh, go ahead. Uh, so <laughs> I, um, I wanted to bring you some feedback from some of our principals, you know, because, of, you know, we want to know, and that was a question that we had. So um, we want to give teachers access to this year's data for planning for next year. We want to set goals for our uh, campuses and individual student goals as well. We want to identify students for HB 45 tutorials. Um, we want to provide additional enrichment uh, in courses through scheduling in, in, their, in their classes. Uh, we want to pair up uh, uh, our wonderful teachers, our great teachers, with students who, who need the most intervention. Uh, for professional development, we'd like to provide for, uh, professional development so uh, across all, across all uh, subjects, even electives, so that um, the, the standards and the needs that students have can be planned into lessons. We'd like to align STAR uh, map and telpass data to look for trends there and see if we can identify uh, areas of most need. Uh, students have the opportunity to self-monitor. Uh, a few meetings ago, uh, Chief Casas um, gave you some examples in, in one of our uh, uh, meetings, and uh, she talked about uh, how students um, were, uh, we discussed having a growth mindset and how uh, map data lends itself to having a growth mindset so students monitor themselves. So that was done and that's something that we wanna really continue to do uh, so that students um, own it, they own their, um, their data and monitor. Um, in PLCs, uh, we wanna uh, determine areas of priority and uh, we want to uh, assist students in uh, advisory, for example, uh, in small groups and through programs that allow us to, um, uh, to teach students uh, in the areas of need that they have. Like, for example, one of our programs is uh, IXL, and in that program, students, um, you, you put in the data of the needs that students have per standard, per se, and uh, they're able to learn and uh, progress from there, and it adjusts based on the questions that they get correct or not. And then we wanna have, um, 
We want to celebrate the wins. We want to celebrate the wins and make sure that we are encouraging our teachers and our students in continuing to try to help students reach their or close gaps and, and reach goals. So here, here are my comments. Mm -hmm. So I believe it is a missed opportunity mm -hmm. not to work with elementary. Right? If you're struggling when students get to the sixth grade, like, were they struggling prior to? And if that's the case, there should be some kind of connection with elementary so you're, you're bridging that gap. Because you're going to keep, and, and I know you said it's, you know, it's not something that's just only specific to Austin ISD, but I do believe there is more than one way and I'm going to go ahead and use this phrase. There's more, there's more than one way to skin a cat. And, you know, I, I hear everything that you're saying. And one thing, I, one thing I haven't heard that I was really looking for, which is why I asked about a book report, right? If I'm on a computer or getting a packet reading, you know, a little paragraph, right? How is that really encouraging me to read? Which is why I asked about a book report, right? This is how we get students curious about various things. I don't know what happens when you get to middle school and, you know, I'm not saying it's all students, but somewhere it just starts to get very packet heavy. And how can we expect students to retain things if I'm just giving you a packet to tell you, hey, this is what I'm hoping you can do and not actually looking at a book to get curious about various things. Like, I can go on the whole rant, but Please consider what I'm basically asking. Please consider working with elementary to address the sixth grade. Because if you're getting students who maybe they were struggling or whatever the case is in elementary, and then by the time they get to sixth grade, they've fallen through the cracks. So if you want to address that, work with elementary. And I think it would have been a really good thing to have elementary up there and say, hey, you know what? This is what we're doing to address that. So maybe that's something that you can look at. Just a thought. Thank you. So Trustee Anderson, you're 100% correct uh, that we should be working together. And, um, for, and we've been having discussions about that. Um, for next year, we are structured a little bit differently, where uh, right from, from uh, the associates and uh, the executive directors, we're going to be working um, with our, uh, so executive director for secondary with executive director f for uh, elementary, planning together, working together, looking at the data together. And it's a start. Well, there's a long way to go, Trustee Anderson and, and, and trustees. There's a long way to go. But it is a start that that is what we're doing. So it's you know great that you brought that up. It prompted me to, to go on and tell you that we're structured differently, and we're very excited about it. And so starting with the EDs, working together, secondary and elementary, planning together with uh, uh, Mr. Hicks and I also working with them. And then we take those plans to, um, to the elementary and secondary principals, and then we work together with them. So it's kind of a cascade where we work together, start with the plans, get their feedback, and, and then they have work sessions where they can plan forward how that's going to look on their campuses. We're excited about that, Trustee Anderson. It's a start. Thank you. Thank you guys for, for, uh, for this. Um, I'm wanting to kind of double check my understanding, particularly of MAP. Um, as I'm, and for anybody who's, I'm looking at the second page of the official report that has the graph at the top and then the MAP scores right underneath that um, for our goal progress measures. And it's the, be the beginning of year, middle of year, and end of year, and it's growth percentages. And 
and I'm checking for understanding in that, am I correct that your beginning of year uh, goal in order to say, yes, I'm at the meets level is different than where you would be at the end of year, meaning it's not a, a stationary goal, but yet moves with the student throughout the year. Is that, am I understanding that correctly? Yes, Trustee Ashi, you're correct. So just like over time, at my age, I, mm -hmm. hopefully I know more things than I did uh, even six months ago or earlier. There's progress that should be happening over time. And so they're calibrating, um, of course, it's ad adaptive, but they're calibrating that based on the, the time of year and the windows that we're providing that for students as well. Um, you're correct in that understanding. Okay, so when we are looking at the middle, the mid-year, those were looking like we were going to be on targets um, for, our, for our goal progress measures. And so my, my question is, is there something, because, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, we actually saw this trend with the special education data as well, where it was a drop from middle of year to end of year. And so my, my question that I have is, is this a trend you are seeing in all of the MAP data, meaning all of our economically disadvantaged students, whether they're in elementary, secondary, special ed, what, what have you, are you seeing the same trend and do you have any initial thoughts on why that might be? Yes, and I forgot to mention um, something very vital, but um, Dr. Robinette did bring it up on Tuesday, but one of the main things we did was move the timing of map so it was very close to the star administration so what we we realized after hearing let's talk we had kids sending in messages we had parents sending in messages and realized that they were too close together and there was testing fatigue so now we have moved the end of the year uh, map assessment to be in March so that way it's not going to conflict with the state testing and so there won't be that fatigue the other element of that, Trustee Ashi, goes back to, again, with Tuesday, the, the relevancy of the data is also connected to the timing of it. So if we're going to make adjustments and, and just-in-time instructional adjustments in our plannings and our, in our PLCs, if it comes after we've sort of buttoned up, if you will, sort of those larger assessment buckets, there's not the relevancy understood for teachers or students, and that's not our intent. Our intent is to continue to work on that growth, growth um, and progress measure. So um, that's another component that's associated with why that recalibration of the timing. So um, but when I hear you say that, what that makes me think is there's that there may be, you guys may, because I know that the star data is starting to come in. Now, granted, I do think the sixth through eighth grade isn't due until July the 1st, so I don't know if y'all have seen that data, but I was curious if you are seeing differences in the star data that you have received versus the map data. Does that make sense? If it, if, if the, if one of the potential influences is these were too close together and the map was after the star and they were tired. Maybe they weren't as tired when they took the star. So are you seeing that trend? Is that one of the reasons why you're thinking that that, does that make sense that, that it is testing fatigue for this piece? I, mean, I don't, does the question make sense? I'm like, are you seeing maybe better performance in the initial star data that you have? What is the star data? <clears throat> I can jump in on that. Um, I don't know if you can hear me, uh, Trustee Ashley, um, but we, we were actually having that conversation just this afternoon and just looking at it um, because we do get a chance to see growth uh, with STAR and preliminary data is kind of telling us that we are seeing growth, but uh, Ms. Stevens and I were actually having this conversation how STAR uh, measures uh, growth at two, different, at two different points that are different from what we're taking at MAP. And so playing with uh, where the map is assessed is something that we're trying to do to uh, figure out where's the best place uh, to use it to support what we're trying to do with STAR. Uh, but the two tests do measure growth at two different points, but we do see uh, progress uh, in the way of growth with preliminary data that we're looking at with STAR right now. Okay, and um, is there, I mean, 
Well, I think Trustee Anderson kind of asked that as, as far as the interventions, and you guys have spoken about that. And thank you for bringing forward the things that you're actually hearing from the principals. I do think that's really helpful. Um, are there, um, so <laughs> I, I certainly am a big believer in electives, and, and I know that y'all have heard me say this, is that I feel like our, our students go to school for the electives and that the, the reading and writing is kind of the happy accident that that math is the happy accident that helps because they're excited to be there for their art class or for their robotics class or for their other CTE class or band or music or choir or whatever those may be. So what what are some of the ways that we embed this work into those targeted areas of interest? And I'm kind of coming back to something Trustee Anderson was saying, which is, if we want to get a kid excited about reading and they're super involved in choir, how does a choir teacher bring in a reading passage? I don't know if that makes sense or if that's even appropriate. I, I'm just curious like how that all so, kind of is, works together. So uh, one example uh, would be if it's about measurement, math and measurement, that that could be um, a particular um, learning objective that they could embed into their art class as they draw and measure or as they sculpt or you know whatever they're doing with their art that they um, use that particular objective to create that lesson and it's embedded not necessarily that they're going to teach that and and you know not do the art but it's the other way where they just embed it and it's it's a part of the work that they're doing in that art class so do the the PLCs the uh, professional learning communities mm -hmm. have the opportunity to cross plan, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Meaning, we know that the, like I said, we are leaning on our on this idea of a, of a PLC to improve instruction and, and improve those things. So, all of the sixth grade English teachers that are on a campus are having a PLC together. Are there opportunities for yes the, the other those other entities to also have those professional learning centers with those teachers as well or do the all the CTE teachers have their own PLC so does that make sense it makes it makes sense and so the opportunities are there the opportunities are there it's just a matter of planning and making those those meetings for that collaboration to happen that could happen during a PLC it could happen during um, a planning period it could happen uh, before school, after school, anytime, whatever the teachers, because as a principal, I would give teachers that choice of when is it that you would like to collaborate with with uh, the elective peers or other peers outside of your content area. So the opportunities are definitely there. It's just a matter of how are we going to make that happen. And I also think, though, right now, to answer the question mm -hmm. even a little more direct, mm -hmm. <clears throat> right now the initial plan doesn't, like a campus, certainly has the ability to create that. Do we have a systematized way right now that we've said, this is how we will ensure that that integration takes place? No, we have not systematized that. We've systematized right now just grade level or content level. Um, so during a PLC, I could have all the math teachers could be there together and we might say, how could we embed some music? But truthfully, you would want your music teacher mm -hmm. to actually guide what what makes sense and vice versa. You want the math teacher meeting with music teachers to say, when you're doing music, because it's it's a double edit double headed arrow. Math can be embedded within music, music can be embedded in math. And so there's really it's a both and one is, <clears throat> and I know we, we just hired Dr. Diaz not too long ago, and from a curriculum standpoint is what lessons are we creating already at a central level that someone could pull down and say, hey, I think this one might work, and then they can give us feedback on it, and that then we can then decide, is this even something we wanna replicate some more? So I think we're gonna need to approach this from a systematic, from both ends, mm -hmm and eventually create where art and music and all of those electives, um, debate, um, are all wherever we have opportunities to do it. We also have to be careful of not forcing, because there was an, an, uh, an old model 
of where we had thematic units. Some of you may remember thematic units. And on, again, on its face, it can be very, very helpful, you know. On the other hand, there were sometimes we'd take a theme and we're foreseeing some content that didn't really align to that, and then it didn't feel authentic, and the kids are like, this isn't real. And so I think it's in between that it's le from lessons learned of what things were really beneficial, and then what are the things we know about today. But I do think your point is very well, um, it's an excellent viewpoint, and we need to work on creating something that would be more, um, that would be, something that we could create some equitable access to everyone. If I may add one other thing, Trustee Ashton, to that question. Um, in the curricular materials that are being created by, um, and, and other resources by our teachers and by um, doctors, Dr. Diaz's team, they're, they're a part of that process. We've talked a lot about the, the value of our elective and, our, and, and particularly in this space around our essential areas teachers. Um, and so our, my experience in looking at those materials um, and are, are working with particularly our essential areas teachers and thinking about where can we bring in authentic literature where can we bring in connections for students that bring those pieces to life you you've seen that in our schools learning out per about particular artists with more depth and complexity talking about and what was happening at a point in time when some of the art you shared this evening dr. Ellie Salde what was sort of the sentiment of the community or the and so that connects to sort of the historical connections so would it would be authentic not not superficial connections in our in our um, in our units of study or those collaborative pieces where we can focus on that instruction together, but where there are those authentic connections. And so I've seen um, those adjacencies really happen, and, and with intentional planning. And I know that our curricular materials certainly call out um, to a limited extent thinking about how to make some of those cross curricular connections, which is part of the emphasis about also additional reading, writing, and mathematics across the curriculum to the extent possible that Dr. Diaz alluded to earlier. When um, w connected to what, what Trustee Anderson and you were asking, not only in peaking interest of students, but our students are involved in, in, in you know, authentic reading, independent time, book clubs, um, more authentic novel studies. It's a variety of things in terms of genre and text, and music is connected to things that are happening in a period in time. It's a form of expression. So valuing all of that, I think that's what the intent is to continue to strengthen, particularly to Trustee Henderson's question earlier in your question now, building upon where that has been more integrated perhaps in an elementary setting and strengthening that through the, the secondary literature and the secondary curriculum as well. And I would just like to add that we do have the creative learning initiative that's going on. And so that's exactly what you're speaking to where we're using art and music and dance to teach um, the concepts of math and reading and writing and science. And um, that has taken a hold. We just hired a new director and she um, is amazing. And she's scaling it up with her team. So it's exactly what you're talking about. Oh, that's super exciting. Mm -hmm. I love to hear that. Um, and then my last question, and this is, um, may not be the easiest to answer. And I'm, so I say that in that if you don't have an answer, this is okay. Um, but I'm, when I look at, again, the middle of year to the end of year and I see the, the dip, the first thing that I kind of think of from a trustee perspective is what barrier showed up between January and May, and is there, the, the, is there one that you guys have identified or some way that we as a board can help with the, the removal of a barrier that seems to have shown up at this point in time? So I, I, I did step out for a minute, so I may be repeating, but one of the areas that showed the more correlation is that in January and into February, we had the Omicron Delta, the percentage of kids in attendance, if you all recall, dropped all the way to 80%, and it happened more at middle schools than it did at other grade levels. And so there's a correlation. What we have to do now is, is there a correlation of individual students that didn't perform well and what was their attendance, right? Like, we see it globally, but that doesn't still give us enough, uh, it's not enough support for me to call that a correlation, 
but once the team, which is what they're doing now, is, okay, so here's some students that dropped this many points. What did their attendance look like? What was their attendance rate? So <clears throat> that's the first big variable that changed from what we started seeing in the, in the fall, where we were seeing this growth kind of coming across and it was increasing. And then come January, and we started looking, that's when we had the two six weeks of, of just one student's out, one student's coming back, another one's out. So it was a, a, I do think it had an effect, but we'll know more as we disaggregate it. Thank you, Trustee Ashy, Trustee Foster, and then Trustee Boswell. So uh, along that same line, what's, what's the impact or role, or are you finding anything about teacher absences and teacher shortages mm -hmm. and the role they're playing in these data? We have not looked into that, but you, uh, you can assume that that did have something to do with this. And then again, it was the absenteeism of the students as well. Mm -hmm. Again, then there's the factor of where the state assessment was and where, um, mm -hmm. where MAP was, the testing windows were too close together. And then we, we can see that just in the data. So at the beginning of the year, um, 13,000 kids took the boy in the middle. There was 12,000 that took the moy, and at the end of the year, it's 10,000. So it dropped about 3,000 kids, and that can be, a, it's going to be a combination of those things, but we need to dig deeper to uncover those answers. But I, I would venture to guess that it's going to be all of those things contributed right. to the decline. Right. So all the, this perfect storm. So perfect storm. Have you ever experienced a sort of teaching moment or a, a time in where you need big gains, your students aren't where you need them to be, and you're trying this and you're trying that and you're getting these like little incrementals, but then over a weekend or something you have an epiphany and you change something and all of a sudden you have huge dramatic gains and it's like, wow, problem solved. Um, I'm thinking and, and excited to hear the, the work that is done with the focus on instruction, instructional strategies, instructional competence, et cetera. But then I also think about, so we'll call it like the micro, but then I also think about the macro. So you mentioned sixth grade, and you say, okay, well, sixth grade, you've got um, a jump in rigor, yep. and you've got like all sorts of things that make middle school not my favorite teaching space, even though there's like teachers that just love teaching at the middle school, God bless them. Um, some of that could be solved. Some people say, some people argue, that the kids are in the wrong building. Right. K-5, they jump to the middle school, and that where we might focus on what can that sixth grade teacher do, if that sixth grade teacher and that whole classroom are in a different building in the K-6 through six setting, maybe you get you know a different outcome and we'd have to look at the research and see what the research really bears out but that would be a macro adjustment right and so i'm wondering about our space to do the both and of like what's happening at the classroom level but then also what are the structural adjustments that we need uh to make the the reason why i asked about teacher absences and teacher shortages is that <laughs> It's quite likely, as I was sitting, you know, kind of depressed about our data and trying to like tease out and understand why some cells seem to stay steady and that other cells we were experiencing drop. I was saying, well, you know, what could contribute to that? And then I'm just kind of thinking out loud. I want to be careful about my thinking out loud because it can be dangerous and dangerously wrong. But I wonder about how many spaces where we have the greatest needs and the greatest challenges, we also have the greatest teacher shortages. And we have classrooms being combined and we have, you know, Fridays, forget it, it's just not happening in terms of the number of people in our building that should be in the building that aren't, but they're fatigued right. and they're trying to make it through the school year. So what I'm getting at there is that here again, the, the micro adjustments to, hey, tweak instruction, think about this, pay attention to your assessments, mine those data, uh, are, can be nothing 
or very little compared to this bigger picture challenge around our teacher shortage and around the stresses that our teachers are under. So I, I guess what I'm asking about is the extent to which we do the macro evaluation of the bigger picture, the bigger structures. So even then we focus on the micro and we mine the micro, what do we do on the other side? How important is the macro to uh, writing the ship in terms of these spaces where we're clearly not where we need to be? And quite frankly, never have been in the history of our school district. So let me start by saying the, um, the only way, which is the next, I mean, we, we provide you the data um, consistently in the same method. Behind the scenes, in order to get to what you're talking about is we have to go, now we have to go campus by campus. Um, then from the campus level, be able to then begin to look at, let's take that example. <clears throat> teacher absences, um, student attendance, um, what, what other factors, um, how much, uh, how many students are involved in extracurricular activities? Is that something that we should like, should we be committed to ensuring that every student in middle school is participating in some form of extracurricular type activity? Um, and from there, then be able to say, you know what, we do see some macro patterns, but they also aren't happening everywhere. Because it could be something at the structural level, but it might be at certain schools with certain, where we do have more um, challenges with staffing. So I think definitely one of the lessons I've learned through the last two years is when we identify that macro, it doesn't mean that the application has to then be wow. district-wide. So part of that, is coming from, well, let's take our entire district and let's work to identify some smaller um, learning networks. So we'll have like uh, the north part of our school district, the central part of our school district, and the southern <coughs> part of our school district. So we still get some characteristics of schools that are on either side of 35 or Mopac. But at the same time, because we can learn from each other. Just because we're different doesn't mean we can't learn. Mm -hmm. At the same time, <clears throat> something that we do see somewhere doesn't mean we have to put in the treatment, if you will, um, at every single school. What were those indicators that we saw that were common? Now, how many of our schools, let's take that example, oh look, it's seven. Well then maybe we only need to do that restructuring at seven and whatever that restructuring would be. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I think that's really on the school leadership side much more than on the curriculum side um, because those are the people that are actually in the school buildings and they can see those whereas our academics office is really working on what's the alignment of the lesson to what the student expectation um, the text essential knowledge and skills yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. So how do these these uh, so I guess I guess where this is going then is the partnership mm -hmm. That, that has the different units in conversation. So, so maybe I was kind of unfairly asking because I was asking in a sense the wrong group, I don't know. But I feel like we're all the right group. No. You know, yeah, yeah, I feel like we're all. So, um, and, and I wanna make clear in this that, that what I wanna be is, um, I don't know, to the extent that I'm qualified, like a thought partner mm -hmm. and, and throwing this, this stuff out because I'm really trying to understand uh, why our data isn't always where it needs to be when we're all working so hard. You all are working so hard. So it's like, where are the tweaks? And you know what? What I want to see is the day, and I've seen it many times in my career. I, I know you all have seen it many times where we've had a persistent problem that was with us for years, and then when we figured it out, our gains were dramatic over a, a short period of time, dramatic gains, and then sustained. Like, the, like my prayers at night are for the moment when we have that in special ed with our good desk kids, with our kids who are recent immigrants, uh, et cetera. So I, I want to be um, supportive and I'm grateful for the work you're dying, doing. And um, so I don't want my words or questions to come off too harsh. They're really just trying to 
to understand where we are. And one of my enduring points of praise for this outgoing administration has been the, the courageous embrace of our data, even when our data is not where it needs to be. So now the new corrective is to never normalize these data as acceptable, right? Like if we see these data enough, at some point we're like, well, that's just the way it is. <coughs> no, right? So, and I, and I love that vociferous shaking of heads, no. Like the whole dais did it and you all did it. Um, so we're not gonna normalize this. <laughs> we're gonna figure this out. Um, and thank you for your ongoing work. Thank you, Trustee Bosman. I just have a couple of quick questions. Thank you all so much for this, for um, your thoughtful explanation about all kinds of ways you're gonna attack this different ways and creative learning and um, incorporating across and, and just rethinking the timing, you know, kind of start to finish. Thank you for that. Um, I have just a couple of questions. One is, um, have we seen, have, internally, have you seen the STAR data yet? for this and seeing if it correlates with what you're seeing on the end of year? Do you know how that aligns? I think, when are we going to see that publicly? Well, And what we, do you know? We have seen some preliminary data, but it's not complete. And just TEA today, TEA said that they were still working the numbers on the middle school data. Okay. So we have incomplete data. Okay. And when the danger with that is you can actually put a story together that looks fantastic, and then you get the other data, and suddenly it's not fantastic at all, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. We can put something out that looks really terrible, and then we get some more information, and then people will be like, well, was, mm -hmm. it, was it really, is it really good? Because first they said it was terrible. Um, and there are a lot of issues going on with the testing company right now um, for multiple school districts mm -hmm. from lost tests to found tests um, to, um, well, we were going to have all the paper ones scored by this date. No, it's going to be this date. Now it's going to be this date. And then none of that even includes then that ultimately it's the accountability subset that matters. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna get initial data once it's finally complete that will be every single student in our district that tested. But that doesn't mean every single one of those students counts in the accountability because it depends on when they entered the system. So right now the reason you hear hesitation is it's not complete and we're very wary of putting out partial yeah. information. A, a solid answer and I will wait patiently. Thank you. And we really do wish it. we had it. I mean, we do. Yes, yes I, I am sure you do. So yeah, I will, I will wait until we have real solid, <coughs> reliable information. Thank you. And then um, the second question, we had talked at one point with a different um, report about looking at either statewide or national data from the map to see how we were performing relative to that. And I'm wondering if that's the kind of thing that we might consider adding and looking at in the future, um, just to kind of see how our students are doing relative to others. Because I know when we got the presentation from NWEA and we heard that was one thing that they were very excited about the potential for. Um, so I just, I don't need necessarily an answer right now, but I would love to put that out there. That as a trustee would be very helpful to me to see how our students are doing at any point in time relative to all the students who are using this tool, either in the state or nationally. I certainly don't want to commit future leadership, yes. but I think that it is available. The challenge we've had right now is there's been so many different windows, uh -huh. and so when you're doing comparisons across the nation, you have to, you have to find school districts that tested during the same period of time when you're doing those comparisons. Otherwise, you're not, you know, and, and so, but I think it's a very, very realistic, um, and Dr. Mays is listening, so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure he, he is, he's, I, I think it's a great thing to compare. Okay, Dr. Thank you. Mays? No, I, I'm, Dr. E just said it as best we can provide that national data. We want to be able to grab it. It's just a matter of trying to find something that's aligned with what we're currently doing here in Austin ISD. Okay. 
Okay, perfect, thank you. And that's it for me for now, thank you. Great, thank you. <laughs> Trustees, other questions? Trustee Singh. Just one quick comment. Mm -hmm. um, I love what I've been hearing from all of you, and I just wanted to say, yay, Dr. Stout, I loved what you said about um, the growth mindset and the power that comes when students actually start looking at their own learning. And I'm um, excited to hear about that. Thank you. Any other questions, trustees? Trustee Sabata. As um, you were talking, uh, Trustee Ashley, about um, combining the arts PE to also be part of the, you know, how do you embed all that together to help reading and writing? But also the after school programs were created to support the learning day. So it was an extension of enrichment activities that really would would give the students that desire to participate in that soccer program or basketball or ballet or whatever. But it was tied to the specific math goal for that campus and their CIP or uh, their PE goals. So it's holistic. It's not just what's going on during the day, but also what's going on after school. So I'm curious if that, because a lot of times there's programs are like, they're there, but they're over there. And they're not, they're not really being used to see how that is also uh, helping our students uh, academically. And that's why the question earlier about all the programs that we fund to support our students, you know, they're like in solo by themselves doing something, but really could be helping and are, but we're not seeing any data that says how it's supporting students. And maybe that would also uh, help our, our numbers. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Zapata. Uh, trustees, any other questions? <coughs> uh, well, I wanna thank our trustees and Dr. Lizalde and our team here presenting. As part of our commitment to monitoring, the last question is to ask if trustees accept the report presented as it aligns with our goals and constraints. And if not, to ask if this is still the right strategy for the district. So trustees, would you please raise your right hand if you're ready to accept tonight's report? Thank you all very much, trustees, for taking part in the shared commitment to students um, and student outcomes. Thank you all very much. <laughs> trustees, we're now going to move to public testimony for items on consent agenda. Members of the public wishing to participate in the public testimony portion of our meeting call the dedicated AISD phone line in advance of the meeting to sign up to speak in person or to audio record their remarks. And tonight we have seven individuals who have signed up to speak in person and we have 37 who have left a recorded message. So we will begin with in-person testimony in order to provide as many opportunities for input as possible within a, within a limited time period at this meeting. Each speaker will be allotted one minute, so no substitutions or yielding of time to others is permitted. Callers who signed up to speak in person are welcome to come to the microphone when their name is called. We will call three names at a time. And as you come to the microphone, there's a device that will light up as you move through your one minute of allotted time. When the buzzer sounds, please make a final thought in one sentence. And again, we ask that whether you come to give a complaint or praise that you reference the staff member by position or by abbreviated last name unless referencing a potential interim superintendent tonight. We ask that all audience members, whether speaking or not, to please show respect for others at all times. And if I'm correct, uh, I was gonna ask Christine, did the comments have to be related to the topics that we're voting on tonight. That's our policy, thank you. I just wanted to, to, to remind our speakers that they have to be related to the, co to, the, uh, to the agenda items for tonight. So tonight's speakers are um, Suzanne Kearns, Alex Stringer, Addison McKenna, those are the first three. And then the next will be Candace Hunter. Uh, Kensa Ferris was on here. I believe that he had a family emergency, so he had to leave. 
And so then we have Emily Sawyer and Emily Sawyer. She's speaking, uh, just to clarify, she's speaking on two different items, 9.1 and 14.7, so. So Suzanne, whenever you're ready. Hello, my name is Suzanne Kearns. I'm a parent of two AISD students and I'm speaking on behalf of the 1,800 members of the Informed Parents of Austin. I wanna thank AISD for their hard work in creating such amazing, comprehensive LGBTQIA plus inclusive sex ed lessons for grades K through 12. I am here asking you to vote yes to implement these lessons which will prevent sexual abuse, pregnancies, promote respect between students, and even save lives. The process of updating sex ed lessons in AISD started in June 2016, and we've had six years of parent input sessions, public forums, and comprehensive surveys. The most recent survey showed that more than 80% of parents want their kids to receive these important lessons. And to ensure that all students have access to these lessons, I wanna echo the SHAC recommendation that these lessons have the turnkey modifications and accommodations for kids with disabilities who are seven times at higher risk for abuse. Please vote yes and don't make kids wait any longer to receive these critical lessons. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Alex. My name is Alex and my pronouns are he, they. I'm speaking in support of item 9.1 and the need to improve our sex ed curriculum. The biggest problem that we are facing is toxic masculinity and cisgender bullying. And the only way to truly destroy these oppressive systems is to destroy masculinity and stop it from happening. And that is why we need to mandate puberty blockers for every child in the Austin Independent School District. You know, toxic masculinity, it starts with puberty. And if you guys are truly committed to stopping at the gender binary and destroying these oppressive systems, then you should not allow any child to go through puberty or choose their gender until they reach the age of 18. You know, toxic masculinity is the cause of all the problems that we are facing today. Just look at what happened on January 6th. Look at the epidemic of gun violence plaguing our country. Every single one of those mass shooters and right-wing extremists, all of them went through puberty. They went through puberty, okay? Just think about that for a minute. Think about it. You guys are the most progressive school district, not only in Texas, but in the United States. And each and every one of you has the opportunity to groom our children to be more loving, tolerant, anti-racist, and more gender neutral. Thank, Thank you for hearing me out on, on this, and I can't wait to see how progressive you truly are. Showtime Alex Stranger on Instagram. Thank you. Thank you. Addison McKenna. Addison. Hi, my name is Addison McKenna. I am a junior at the Lassa, at the, at Lassa Liberal Arts and Science Academy and a student member on SHAC. Um, I also identify as an LGBTQIA student. Three years ago, when I was an eighth grader, I was struggling with selective mutism, which I still work to overcome today. Back then, I spoke in front of the board for the first time in support of the human sexuality curriculum. When I was exiting this board meeting, opponents of the curriculum shouted at me and told me that I deserved to burn in hell and that my parents should be ashamed of me. Fortunately, there was a strong, inclusive community made up of parents, AASD staff, and AASD police there to be supportive. I am grateful that three years later, the district is still working on inclusivity. The proposed human sexuality curriculum focuses on keeping kids safe and healthy, protects kids from sexual abuse, helps us learn about healthy relationships, and teaches diversity and inclusion. I wanted to thank you all this evening for supporting the human sexuality curriculum and continuing to make the district more welcoming and inclusive for students like me. Thank you. Candace, and then Emily, and then Emily. Good evening. I'm before you to speak on 14.6 BE Local. I would like to first say placing some of the more innocuous changes without the weightier changes to BE Local on the board's policy page and asking for input and listing a meeting that never occurred on May 27th is not good community engagement. Under the headline, Determination of Agenda Items, I'm curious as to the board's motivation in prohibiting items regarding personnel and vendor implementations. I hope this is not an attempt to veil dealings with both the superintendent or vendors. Under the same heading, subheading governance, these changes seem designed to discourage trustees from doing what they were elected to do. Subheading top timelines, again, it seems as though these changes are an impediment to getting items on the agenda. 
What is the goal? To have fewer items on the agenda, only items the board deems suitable for the public? If you need to streamline the process, then by all means streamline it. But this is not streamlining, it's gatekeeping. Thank you. Emily. Good evening, I'm Emily Sawyer. I have a parent to five AISD students and I'm speaking on agenda item 9.1 in support of the board approving the AISD human sexuality and responsibility curriculum. I support our students being taught honest, age appropriate information about their bodies, about relationships, and about the vast beauty and variation of human ex existence. Recognizing our society has long accepted and perpetuated norms that harm and dehumanize LGBTQIA plus folks is of utmost importance as we seek to cre create a more just, loving, and safe world where everyone can learn and thrive. Thank you. And I also am speaking on agenda item 14.7. Uh, the Student Code of Conduct. I want to start by thanking district staff and the community uh, members who worked tirelessly on the Student Code of Conduct that is before you today. It is an, a vast improvement over um, what we've had in the past, and I'm very grateful. Um, recently, I heard someone say something that I can't forget. Quote, we cannot end the school to prison pipeline if we are unwilling to burn the bridges between schools and prisons, unquote. Punitive punishment for childhood behavior, police and policing do not keep our schools safe, nor teach our students to be good humans. Rather, it teaches them and us to be afraid only of getting caught, afraid of accountability. Any sense of safety rooted in control and coercion is a false sense of safety. I implore the district and community to continue the work of burning the bridges that funnel students out of the classroom and into the criminal legal system. We must invest in alternatives like access to mental health professionals, training for all school staff in mental health response, restorative practices and de-escalation, in robust staffing for campuses so that we can address the root causes of behavior and not punish the symptoms. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all of our in-person speakers. We will now play the recorded messages for public testimony, so colleagues, please listen carefully. Hi, my name is Mary Chisholm, and I am a parent and community member, and I am calling on behalf of BASE regarding agenda item 15.1 to advocate for decreasing police in schools in response to mass shootings. We have experienced 2,032 school shootings in the U.S. since 1970, and these numbers are increasing. We need to shatter the myth of policing as the number of school shooting as Sorry, as the number of school police has increased over the last two decades, so has the number of school shootings. And as we have seen, police do not prevent mass shootings, stop mass shootings, or address the root cause of mass shootings. Therefore, I ask you to take action towards removing police from schools and create safety by implementing district-wide culturally responsive restorative practices with integrity and increasing mental health support for all students and staff. Thank you. We do not need police in schools. Police do not stop crime, and they don't help. Thank you for your time. Greetings, trustees and interim superintendent, Dr. Mays. My name is Stacy Smith, and I am a parent, uh, have been a parent, and a staff member of children in under-enrolled Title I schools for the last 15 years. I'm calling on agenda item 11.12, the contract with outreach strategist. I'm asking you to reconsider that $650,000 contract and invest that money back in the staff at these under-enrolled campuses. Um, we had a skinny jeans and smarty pants campaign years ago for $850,000, and I don't think it was a great return on investment. It didn't really net that many long-term gains. Why don't you use that $650,000 and target uh, campuses and pay the staff? to have summer events, call families, get block walking, maybe have an enrollment incentive for these targeted campuses. If the campus hits their enrollment incentive, you pay the principal all the way down to the custodian. Um, I really think you need to invest in your campus staff that are returning um, instead of outside contractors. Thank you so much. My name is Tracy Dunlap. I'm a teacher at Maplewood and a leader with Education Austin. I'm calling regarding agenda item 15.1, budget and the essential areas redesign. 
The new plan for essential areas isn't equitable since many students would have less time in music and art. It's also not safe since our facilities were not meant to accommodate so many students all at once. Would we adopt a plan to put all the students on a grade level with one classroom teacher and a TA or two? That would be ridiculous. And yet we're willing to do that for PE? One excuse I've heard is that all the other districts already do this. Well, all the surrounding districts are also giving bigger pay raises, if you want to make comparisons. Rather than aim for parity with other districts, let's keep our current music art PE rotation, which is better. And let's keep looking for other ways to give elementary teachers more planning time. The $8 million budgeted for this plan could be better applied towards compensation. Please approve a contingency budget to allow the district time to get this right. Thank you. Hey, my name is KB Brookins and I am a community member. I'm calling on behalf of BASE regarding agenda item 14.7 to advocate for restorative discipline policies and practices. The mythologies of the necessity of punitive discipline systems and policing in our schools are because of our divestment and lack of support for alternatives that would make policing and punitive discipline obsolete, such as community building, restorative practices, authentic accountability and responsibility, and redistribution of power and resources. The, de the desire we share to build strong communities can no longer be merely a noble aspiration. It must become our moral imperative. Thank you. My name is Kelsey Hughes and I'm a community member. I'm calling on behalf of BASE regarding agenda item 15.1, advocating for decreasing investment in police and policing. Police are foundational to the school to prison pipeline. Police in schools disproportionately punish students with disabilities and BIPOC students. The odds of a student being accused of an offense in schools with police is 1.5 times higher than in schools without police. Children should be educated, not incarcerated. Of the 197 incidents of gun violence in schools, there have only been three where an SRO intervened successfully, which is a 98.5% failure rate. Police do not create safety in schools. The path to creating restorative, safe, just, and equitable schools does not involve police or policing. I ask that you take action toward removing investments in school police officers, increasing investments in mental health support, and creating restorative cultures in our schools. Thank you. Hi, my name is Nicole Trulock. I'm the parent of an AISD student and I reside in District 5. I'm calling about agenda item 10.1, the budget, specifically the essential areas redesign. Good evening, Superintendent Elizalde and Board of Trustees. Austin is a vibrant and unique community made up of creative, independent thinkers. Exposure to the arts is crucial to the development of our kids. The proposed essential area redesign costs too much and delivers too little. Please do not invest $8 million into a plan that is one, highly inequitable, and two, unsustainable with our current facilities and staffing levels. I urge the board to reconsider an essential areas redesign without evaluating and documenting the effectiveness of the current ABC rotation. I hope that you can ABC that the current system is working. Thank you guys, have a good night. Hi, my name is Frank and I'm a community member. I am calling on behalf of BASE regarding agenda items 15.1 and 14.7 to advocate that the district's budget, student code of conduct, and staff training reflect an investment in and a belief in restorative practices. Even though we have to abide by state law and the Texas Education Code, our district documents should reflect our values, not theirs. We will never create a more inclusive and humanizing school environment if our systems are based on outdated and ineffective punitive and controlling policy practices and expectations. Simply because funds are available and plentiful for school hardening and, po and policing does not mean that we should use them. Thank you. My name is Amber Watts and I'm a community member calling on behalf of BASE regarding agenda item 9.1 to support the approval of the district's human sexuality and responsibility curriculum. It is essential that students have access to age appropriate, identity safe and inclusive information. This supports the creation of an open, accepting and humane school culture and helps create truly safe environments where children and adults learn to respect others, understand consent and appropriate behavior and know how to advocate for themselves if abuse is occurring. 
I want to recognize that this is especially important for students with disabilities. I request that the dis district schedule a review and information schedule session, sorry, when um, in relation to the toolkit that was mentioned for students with IEPs on June 9th, once that's finished. Um, and this is to ensure that this necessary instruction is being delivered appropriately. Thank you. Hi. My name is Chrissy Haney, and I'm an AISD parent, teacher, and a member of Education Austin. I'm calling to comment on agenda item 10.1 and express concern regarding the elementary essential areas redesign proposal. The three-day PE art music rotation provides equal access to movement and fine arts education to every student in the district and is one thing this district actually does right. The proposed plan would all but eliminate special art and music programs in the majority of our elementary schools and prevent PE teachers from providing safe, individualized PE instruction. This scheme obviously lacks serious forethought and will damage our district at every level, including the budget. Please consider scrapping it and think innovatively and collaboratively to come to a solution that benefits everyone. First, listen to your teachers. They know how to plan their school day and will be happy to collaborate with you on a solution. You can also increase staffing power by raising classified staff pay and a sub pay agreement at the elementary level. Thanks for all you do. Hi, this is Frank. I'm a community member and I am calling uh, on behalf of Education Austin. I'm asking that uh, you do not pass the uh, essential areas redesign, which will cost $8 million and will cause 50 of 78 elementary campuses to receive fewer minutes of art and music education than they did last school year. In the live music capital of the world, the apparent arts capital of Texas, we are cutting arts funding. Uh, instead, uh, and it will, in addition, overburden PE teachers and create an unsafe environment for students and place unnecessary weight on already overburdened TAs, and there's no consideration students who need adaptive PE. What I am saying is that you should take this money and rather than create another unnecessary redesign, instead give it raise to teachers. We all know that the best school outcomes are related to how well teachers are treated. Thank you very much for your time and attention. I hope you have a great day. My name is Angela Pierce, and I am parent of a black student with disability at AISD. I'm calling on behalf of BASE regarding agenda item 14.7 to advocate that district-wide culturally responsive restorative practice be integrated fully into the student code of conduct, all staff training, and at every level of district and campus culture. While the district has done some beginning work in restorative practice, it's clear that overall, the district is still upholding the current problematic system that leads to black students and students with disabilities being overrepresented in discipline rates. We recognize that restorative practice is a culture shift, and it requires that all staff engage in regular training, daily practice, and reflection to implement and maintain restorative practice with integrity. I ask that you take action to implement district-wide culturally responsive restorative practice and create a just, safe, actable environment you say you seek. Thank you. Good evening, trustees. My name is Annalisa Reyes, and I'm a parent of students at Casey Elementary. I'm calling today in regards to agenda item 15.1, the budget and the proposed essential areas redesign. Board members, we elected you to represent us, the constituents, and it's important today that you listen to us in our efforts to support our students and our children. Today, we ask that you not approve the essential areas redesign as it is not in the best interest of students or staff. One component of this plan is the reduction of art and music offerings for our students. Under the proposed redesign, students at 50 of 78 elementary campuses will receive fewer minutes of art and music instruction than they did last year. Art develops critical thinking, creativity, and motor skills. Music supports math and language development. Cutting art and music minutes does not serve our students, especially students who are disenfranchised, like those receiving SPED services and black and brown students, of which I have kids that are both. Imagine a world with less art and music. It's not a world we want for our kids. 
Please do not pass a budget that reduces access to art and music for our students. Pass a contingency budget until we can find a solution that doesn't cause devastating effects for different children in different parts of town. It's not equitable. Thank you. My name is Angela Pierce, and I am a parent of a student at AISD, and I am commenting on the agenda item 11.2, approval of a contract for an equity assessment. Um, hello, Board of Trustees. Uh, I think that we all remember on November 18, 2019, when debating about the school closures, and we all heard a gut-wrenching uh, statement by the equity officer when she mentioned that the math for the school closures uh, is what 21st century racism looks like. At that time, she requested a third-party equity assessment of the district so that you could move forward and not repeat our mistakes. So here we are, and you have an opportunity to fulfill that request that's not just hers, but by so many who actually care about equity in the district. So uh, that's pretty much what I'm asking. Good evening, Board of Trustees. My name is Erin Barbier. I'm a parent, community member, District 7 voter, vocal advocate, and former Austin ISD District Admin. I'm calling about Agenda Item 15.1, approving a budget that includes a complete essential areas redesign. This redesign is yet another policy program change that was pushed through without any meaningful input from input from community members, faculty, or staff. It's time to reflect on the damage this executive leadership team has caused and create a plan to bring this district back together. The Director of Fine Arts and Director of Health and PE positions are vacant. These leaders advocated for their programs and how their programs support academic achievement, equity across the district, and safety. Look at the number of essential areas teachers that are now gone. Actions speak louder than words. These dedicated servant leaders who listen to stakeholders chose to leave or retire after their advocacy and alternative solutions were silence in top-down decision-making and disrespect. The $8 million allocated towards the redesign of essential areas would be better spent on multilingual education, special education, raises, hiring support staff, and so on. This current administration has failed our students. Trustees, please take the correct action so our students don't pay the consequences of arrogance. Thank you. Good evening, Board of Trustees. My name is Denise Sanders. I teach at the Ann Richards School, and I'm a member of Education Austin. Um, I'm calling today about Agenda Item 15.1, the budget, to express concern for the Essential Areas Redesign proposal. Currently, all the students receive the same allocation of art, PE, and music minutes in the three-day ABC rotation. This proposal redesign will remove the system that guarantees equity of access to these subjects that are crucial for students' physical and emotional well-being. Further, entire grade levels will be in PE at the same time in spaces that are not designed for groups of this size. Safety and supervision cannot be guaranteed in that setting, which is reckless to inflict on students and PE teachers. Not only is this bad for students and teachers, it's expected to cost AISD $8 million. AISD's slogan is, have it all. I request that you halt the rollout of this plan and develop one where students can have it all music, art, PE, and teachers who've had adequate time to plan quality instruction for our learners, all of whom seem to be struggling post-pandemic. I thank you for your time and your commitment. Hello, trustees and AISD administration. As always, thank you for your service. My name is Courtney Perry. I'm a former AISD PE teacher, a community member, and a public education advocate. I'm calling in reference to updated agenda item 15.1, the unnecessary and expensive and elementary essential areas redesign. There are many issues with this redesign, including the fact that it requires 102 PETA positions be filled, and we currently have 175 PA vacancies. This unnecessary and expensive redesign will put PE and special education in direct competition for these critical yet hard to staff positions. Considering our current staffing crisis, the rollout of this unnecessary and expensive redesign is irresponsible and could be catastrophic for the Austin community, given the important role of public education. I'm calling to voice support for delaying, if not canceling, the rollout of this unnecessary and expensive program and passing a contingency budget if necessary. Our district deserves plans and options that center our values of equity, inclusivity, and a whole child approach. 
Thank you for your urgent attention to this matter. Good evening, Board of Trustees. My name is Megan Bracamani, and I'm a member of Education Austin. I'm calling today um, about Agenda 15.1, um, the budget, to express my um, deep concerns for the essential area redesign proposal. Currently, all students receive the same allocation of music, art, and PE minutes in our three-day ABC rotation. With this new proposal, there will not be a unified or equitable system. Instead of an organized school district, we will be a district of schools operating by campus preferences. Entire grade levels will be attending PE without enough space to accommodate a safe, quality physical education. 50 out of our 78 elementary campuses will be getting less music and art minutes. This plan will cost $8 million and negatively impact AISD's core values of providing a safe and equitable whole child education. Let's reverse course on this district rollout and instead give our classified staff a $6.50 pay raise, bringing up the minimum to $20 an hour. Let's reinstate a substitute pay agreement at the elementary level and explore other options for elementary planning like early release. We appreciate your urgent attention and commitment to creating a budget that reflects our district's priorities. Thank you. Have a good day. Hi, my name is Linda Rank, and I'm a middle school teacher at an all-girls school, and I am calling um, about the sex education proposal. I have students ask me questions about things they need, should know the answers to. Who is going to tell them if their people aren't talking to them? They ask me things like, can you get pregnant if? These questions are huge signs that they need to know and or they're on their way to risky activity. I vote for sex education. Hola. Mi nombre es Marcela García y soy madre de un estudiante en Dobby Middle School. Y um, soy, estoy hablando hoy a ustedes nomás por, por que estoy enterada que están buscando a uh, destruir su título al señor que fue un excelente director en Dobby Middle School. Mi hija es el, tiene el programa de educación especial. Y desde que entró a Adobe, ella ha mejorado mucho su comportamiento y su y su académico. Ha tenido, salió con muy buenos grados, a pesar de tanta ausencia que, que ustedes nos quitaron al señor. Y tanto que nos afectó en recortar tanto dinero para educación especial. Y a pesar de que los maestros que estuvieron ahí siendo maestros y siendo ayudantes de educación especial, tuvo un rendimiento académico exitoso. Y pues yo no sé qué están tratando de hacer con el señor. Si ustedes no quieren que siga trabajando en nuestro distrito, déjenlo en paz y pues déjenlo que él tenga un trabajo en otro distrito. This is an interpretation into English of Marcela Garcia's message. Hi, my name is Marcela Garcia and I am the mother of a student at Dobie Middle School and I am calling you today just because I found out that you are trying to destroy his title. And he was an excellent principal at Toby Middle School. My daughter is in the special education program, and since she started at Toby, she's a, she has improved her behavior and academics a lot. She got very good grades despite all the absences that you took Mr. from us and the big impact of cutting so much money from special education. And despite the teachers that were there being teachers, being special education teaching assistants, she had a successful academic performance. And well, I don't know what you are trying to do to this man. If you don't want for him to keep working at our district, leave him alone and well, let him have another job in a different district. My name is Bree Ralt and I'm a teacher at Bowie High School and a proud member of Education Austin. I'm calling today about Agenda 15.1, the budget, and I'm asking the board to consider the unintended costs of redesigning the essential areas. In a time where we keep asking for stability in the district and there's been so much upheaval, this upheaval will cost the district $8 million, but the cost to our students and community will be much higher than any dollar amount. Fine arts will take a serious hit under the proposed redesign. Students at 50 out of 78 elementary campuses will receive fewer minutes of art and music instruction than they did last school year. Art develops critical thinking, creativity, and motor skills. Music supports math and language development. Cutting art and music minutes does not serve our students. The lack of instructional time for our young students will create ripple effects all the way up to our award-winning high school programs that our district takes so much pride in. Please do not approve this costly proposal. Pass a contingency budget until we can find a plan that works for all of our students and schools. Thank you for your time. 
Greetings to the board, the outgoing superintendent, and the incoming interim. This is in regards to agenda item 15.1. What are you all doing? An outgoing superintendent the superintendent suddenly decides that we haven't been following the law all this time, so she comes up with a plan that erodes essential areas of the curriculum. And then when teachers and union members speak up with simple solutions like, let's count wow time, she says, oh, I can't do that to those poor overworked teachers. What? Teachers are doing wow time already anyway. You might as well give them credit. Texas Education Code says that you can easily add to programming, which is what you're planning to do, but you cannot undo or take it away. Conduct a town hall meeting if it helps. Invite the TEA and have them clarify the wording of the law. Whatever you do, you must reconsider how your actions will hurt the children. Do not pass this budget without first eliminating the plan that will destroy movement and fine arts programming with little hope of restoration. Remember the children. I'm Clay Ruder, and as far as any further relationship to AISD, there's a proverb that goes like this. Examine what is said, not who is speaking. And if you can't do that, then let the people you know as direct care staff and the union be your guides. And please look at how this is Sharon Bain. I'm the parent of an AISD high schooler and an AISD graduate. I'm calling about agenda item 15.1. I urge you to reconsider the essential areas redesign. At meeting after meeting, you have heard loud and clear from families and educators that this is not the way our community wants to balance this budget. Under the current proposal, students at 50 of our 78 elementary schools will have less time in art and music. Too many PE classes will be overcrowded. I urge you to pass a contingency budget and reconsider this while reallocating money into much needed raises for classified staff and necessary hiring to fill vacancies. Thank you. Hello, my name is Larry Chauvin. I've been teaching in the district for 17 years. Seven of those as a classroom teacher and the rest of them as a PE teacher. I'm worried about the redesign. I'm calling about item number 15.1. I'm worried about the redesign and what the impact will have on our students. As a former classroom teacher, I know that teachers are doing wow time with brain breaks, uh, marathon kids, go noodle, and many different other options throughout their wow time. They may not call it wow time, but they're definitely doing that wow time. Um, so I think it's real important that we reconsider this redesign I go back to our three-day rotation. Uh, I would love pl more planning time for teachers, but it really needs to be um, actually thought out and have all the stakeholders' opinions and, uh, and brought forth. So I appreciate your time. Hi, my name is Stacy Gardner. I'm a parent and an employee in Austin ISD. I'm calling about the budget vote today. I've been a substitute teacher in elementary schools for the last six years, and several times over those years, as a substitute PE teacher. I'm calling today to voice my concerns over the special areas redesign and, effort, and an effort to provide PE every day. The consequences of this redesign will limit art and music on many campuses in the district and cause a lot of harm to students who engage more favorably in art and music than they do in PE. This will also further impact the special education students immensely as adaptive PE coaches are only available to attend up to three PE classes per week. Finally, most elementary campus gyms are not big enough or equipped to handle so many students at one time. Wow time more than covers the required physical activity needs of children currently, and I respectfully ask the board not to approve the additional budget needed to put this plan in place. Thank you. My name is Matt Gordon, and I'm a teacher as well as a proud member of Education Austin. I'm calling today about agenda item 15.1, the budget, to express my deep concern for the essential areas redesign proposal. Currently, all of our elementary students receive the same allocation of music, art, and PE in a three-day rotation. This new proposal is not going to be unified or equitable like what we currently have. Instead of an organized school district, it will be a district of schools operating by campus preference or availability. Entire grade levels will end up attending PE class without enough space to accommodate a safe and quality physical education experience. 50 of our 78 elementary campuses will be getting less music and art minutes under this plan. It's gonna cost us $8 million and negatively impact our core value, which is providing a safe and equitable whole child education. I do not think this $8 million is responsible to spend on this plan when we have over 500 teacher openings and 170 TA openings with only 53 days till the first day of school. Please do not approve this proposal and pass a contingency budget until we can find a plan that works for all of our schools and students. Thank you for our time. 
My name is Rebecca Forcioni. I am a parent of three students at Austin Schools. I wanted to call and I wanted to um, ask the board to reconsider the essentials area redesign as part of voting the budget tonight. Last week, one of the things that was repeated over and over was stability needed for our children. And in making this plan, this is not stability for our children and taking away many of their minutes for PE, for art, and for music. Uh, it's, an it's an inequitable plan. There are going to be difficulties for our special education department. And it's not very safe for our kids to be put in such a small space. Some of our schools are very old and we do not have room to accommodate plans like this. <clears throat> Keep the stability for our children next year. Do not vote on this plan. And once we get a permanent superintendent, then we can discuss a new plan. Thank you. Hi, my name is Melissa. I'm a 14-year AISD veteran educator and physical education teacher. I'm calling about agenda item 15.1. I urge the board not to approve the current budget proposal, which includes an essential areas redesign that will only exacerbate already present inequities across the district. Many campuses are not yet staffed to implement this design. There are currently 14 PE teacher vacancies and over 50 PE teacher assistant vacancies. The district is not ready to roll out this unsafe, inequitable redesign. So I implore the board, the board not to approve the current budget proposal. Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Elizalde and trustees. My name is Abby Burnham and I'm a proud member of Education Austin, a teacher of 16 years in the district and a parent of a rising second grader and rising kindergarten student. I'm calling today in regards to item 15.1 and the proposed essential area redesign. As it stands, our youngest students have access to the EA classes on a three-day rotation that is consistent district-wide. The proposed changes cost eight million, cut art and music minutes dramatically, and create system-wide inequities and safety concerns. Please do not pass the budget as is, and instead consider a small pilot program to test this. We cannot keep building the plane as we fly it. These disruptions cause havoc in the lives of our children, and they are the ones that suffer. And it continues to disenfranchise our most vulnerable population. Please do not pass the elementary area redesign as planned. Thank you for your time. Good evening, my name is Jen Krieger. I'm a District 3 resident, former employee, and AISD volunteer and advocate. I'm calling to comment on several items on tonight's agenda. Regarding item 10.2, I am in support of the district's initial legislative priorities. Regarding item 15.1 on the budget, I'm appreciative of the board and administration's efforts to increase transparency and address community concerns and questions. However, I continue to have concerns about how the budget is distributed among campuses. I noticed that the two million line item formerly referred to as an equity allotment appears to be relabeled as a campus supplemental allocation. I believe this allocation should be distributed only to the schools where poverty is most concentrated rather than using a sliding scale that allocates funding to all schools regardless of the percent of economically disadvantaged students. I also support community calls for AISD's budget to divest from school resource officers and to increase spending for mental health and restorative justice. Regarding item 11.2, I support approval of the contract to complete an equity assessment and suggest that it be an ongoing practice. I would like to see the assessment do a thorough analysis on the equity implications of our budgeting process. Regarding item 11.4 on parent support specialists, I would like to see sufficient funding for a full-time PSS at every qualifying campus. And regarding item 14.7 on the student code of conduct, I do not support adoption of the revised code of conduct unless and until the recommendations submitted by several community groups interested in moving away from punitive practice. My name is Lockney Minis, and I'm a parent. I'm calling on behalf of BASE regarding agenda item 14.7 to advocate for a student code of conduct that is wholly student-centered. Not only should, should students take a part in leading any revision or rewriting of the student code of conduct, but it should prioritize protecting the student, their rights, and their well-being. This means it should clearly define and provide transparent policies and processes to enable a student and their caregiver to be fully informed and empowered to assert their agency and rights. In order for students and caregivers to have agency and partake in co-development with the district, the district needs to first have a foundation that describes all parties' rights. 
strengths, expectations, and avenues for action. We cannot have an equitable district if we aren't giving students and their caregivers the opportunity to justly partake in the processes. Thank you. Hello, my name is Robert Kibbe. I'm a concerned community member. I'm asking you guys to please give prayer raises to all staff, including the classified staff. They've forgotten, they're forgotten about quite a bit. Also, you need to fund parent support specialists full-time, none of this part-time stuff. Also, trustees, please don't, please vote for this. Please don't abstain like two did the last vote. Also, Dr. Elizade, we will miss you. Thank you, y'all have a good day. Good evening, trustees and Dr. Elizalde. My name is Megan Foskes, and I'm a proud member of Education Austin. I'm calling today in regards to agenda item 15.1, the budget, and asking you to consider the unintended cost of redesigning new central areas, most notably the effects these would have on our special education students. These changes place unnecessary weight on the shoulders of our already overburdened TAs. For years, campuses have struggled to fill positions for teacher assistance, and this redesign creates more need than ever before. This proposal will request 102 PE TAs. We currently have 175 TA vacancies. This will put PE and SPED in direct competition for filling these hardest staff jobs. Adding a need for even more positions without addressing our current staffing crisis is irresponsible and will be catastrophic for our students, staff, and community. Additionally, there is no consideration for students who are guaranteed the right to adaptive PE courses. How will we serve these students when we only have five adaptive PE teachers in the district as is? These five are able to serve six to nine campuses directly and nine indirect consult campuses in our three-day rotation. How will they serve all their students with daily PE? How many of our students are going to be overstimulated in our full gyms? How many kids will not be given their free appropriate public education? Please stand against this costly proposal and look at the people behind the numbers. Pass the contingency budget until we can find a plan that works for all our schools and students. Hola, soy una madre de familia de la escuela Adobe. Uh, estoy hablando porque uh, quiero decir que el señor cuando estuvo de director fue muy buen director. Uh, tuve mi hija ahí. Ahora va un hijo también y quisiera que se trabajara igual. Él hizo muchas cosas buenas. Uh, tuvo como cómo ganarse los estudiantes, trabajó muy duro, apoyando siempre a los padres, y creo que no hay ninguna razón para que lo remuevan de, de su trabajo. Ah, es una muy buena persona, puedo decir que se hicieron cosas muy buenas aquí en la DOM. Muchas gracias y espero que tomen en cuenta todo, todos nuestros comentarios para que tengan una muy buena decisión sobre este director ejemplar. Gracias. This is an English interpretation of Adobe Parents' Message. Hello, I'm a parent of Adobe School, and I'm calling because I want to say that Mr. was a principal. He was a very good principal when I had my daughter there. Now I have a son that attends there, and I would like that they continue working in the same way. He did many good things. He knew how to make friends with the students. He worked really hard, always supporting the parents, and I believe that there is no reason to remove him from his job. He's a very good person. I can say that very good things were done here in Dobby. Thank you very much, and I hope that you take into account our comments to take a good decision about this exemplary principle. Thank you. Mi nombre es Teresa. Estoy hablando sobre el señor. Yo soy una madre de familia que su hijo salió de Dobby en el tiempo que estuvo el señor como principal. Yo vi el trabajo que él hizo para la escuela de Dobby, cómo cambió el prestigio de la escuela. Ahora sabemos que un juez desestimó los cargos para despedirlo. Es una pena darse cuenta que todavía están buscando algo para culparlo, cuando mi ver es culpa del distrito por no poner maestros cuando se necesitaban. Me pregunto si esa es la razón por la que los principales del grupo vertical de Nortis se están moviendo. Gracias. This is an English interpretation of Teresa's message. My name is Teresa, and I'm calling about Mr. I'm a mother whose son attended Dobby during that time that Mr. That was the principal. I saw the work he did for Dobby School. How did he change the school prestige? Now we know that a judge dismissed the charges to fire him. It is a shame to realize that you are still looking for reasons to blame him for, when from my point of view, the district is the one to blame for because they didn't bring teachers when they were needed. I asked myself 
If that would be the reason because the principals from the Northeast Vertical team are leaving. Thank you. Hola, mi nombre es Marta Leal. Tengo tres hijos en, en Austin, IC. Estoy llamando hoy en, apo en apoyo del señor. Como todos saben, todos sus cargos fueron retirados por un juez. Ahora el distrito ha encontrado un nuevo cargo para despedirlo. El distrito sabe que, en, que al no financiar correctamente la escuela secundaria Adobe, ha puesto al señor en un per, perdictamen para mover a los maestros para ayudar a apoyar a todos los estudiantes en Dobby. Este cargo que ha presentado el distrito es realmente culpa de ellos y no del señor. Así es que necesita que el distrito le pida una disculpa al señor. Esa es mi opinión y que no lo despida. Gracias. Hasta luego. This is an English interpretation of Marta Leal's message. Hello, my name is Marta Leal. I have three sons at Austin ISD, and I am calling today to support Mr. As you all know, the charges were dismissed by a judge. Now the district has found a new charge to be able to fire him. The district knows that without financing Dobie Middle School correctly, they have put Mr. in a predicament to move the teachers to help support all the students at Dobie. The charge the district has made is really theirs and not Mr. So the district needs to apologize to Mr. Hi, my name is Matthew Shedd. I'm an Austin ISD parent, and I'm speaking in favor of item 9.1 on the con consent agenda. Uh, I just want to thank everyone on the health curriculum team for revisiting and tweaking the outdated curriculum uh, over the last few years. Also, uh, thank you to the community engagement team for collecting all the community feedback. Really appreciate you doing the survey in 2018 and this year, and thank you for taking an informed and comprehensive approach to the curriculum. Specifically, um, I appreciate using the proper names of body parts, uh, addressing sexual orientation, empowering our youth with refusal skills, addressing identity, and especially after seeing a lot of the hateful comments on the district's uh, social media, um, I really think it's important and appreciate you teaching our youth to demonstrate and promote dignity and respect for all people. Thanks for your work. Hi, my name is Becca and I'm calling about agenda item 15.1. I am saddened if our district is going to put $8 million towards adding inequity into our programs. The essential areas redesign plan is not thought out. It is not looking at what's best for kids. This is not adding more PE. Daily physical education would be amazing by certified physical education teachers, not PETAs who haven't been trained or are paid a wage where they would be able to live and help the kids. This is not equitable across art and music. This is not supporting uh, the young minds of our future. Please reconsider how we are allotting our funds to best support the needs of students. This concludes uh, public testimony. Trustees, are there any questions or clarifications? Tr Trustee Lugo. Yeah, um, let's see, so item 11.12, that's the approval of the communications, marketing, and student enrollment. Um, the commenter mentioned a previous um, outreach campaign um, and explained that that particular campaign didn't yield the kind of impactful results that the district would, would want to see, which is, right, increase enrollment. Um, and the caller also mentioned some potential alternatives to consider instead of spending the money on that particular contract. Um, and so I'd like to hear any additional information from the district on that. And I don't know if it happens here or when we get to the consent. I can do it. 
I can do it now. Yeah, if you want. Um, the, um, I don't know much about the one that was referenced before, but I did get some um, information that it was not very successful. So two things, this is for all of the schools to have a professional a project manager that would assist with creation of videos that would be authentic to those schools. This would put together a repository of something called a school finder. So what we don't have right now is you wanna find a Montessori school. You actually have to go, let me go to this school. Do they have Montessori? I need to go, do they have, this would be, you could put in, I'm looking for dual language. I'm looking for an early college high school. I'm looking for, so there'd be a school repository that would then have videos, interviews with parents, students from those schools. <clears throat> and so it would create um, um, connections also then with media. So they would reach out to Univision if they thought for this community that would make the most sense. They would work with them in terms of, so right now campuses have to use their own dollars out of their budget to have to go do this kind of work. And then it's done very differently based on how much money they have available. So at, at I think the contract, we uh, procurement wanted to add a little bit more to make sure that we're actually covering the amount, but even at the, if it's 650,000, um, if we recovered 72 students, it would, it would pay it for itself. Thank you, and another clarification. So I'm reading the paragraph that talks about the term of the contract. So then the 60, the, excuse me, the $650,000 budget, is that, okay, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so initial, so that's just for year one, right? And then it says that the, the, this particular contract would be renewed, potentially could be renewed up to two additional one-year periods. Um, and we may not have the answer right now, but I was just curious, like, is the anticipation that the budget would remain the same in year two and three, or would that be basically negotiated at the, I would imagine it would be negotiated at the time of, um, you know, extending the contract term, but just wanted to ask that. Yeah, I don't, I don't know the answer to how that was written, but if, um, if we looked at, I know you all are considering a policy revision mm -hmm. that anything over 100,000 would come back to you. So I would anticipate that either through policy this would come back before it was renewed, or I also think Dr. Mays would not have any concerns with bringing it back to you on, our, on his own. Um, because we also want to know what, what does it generate during year one um, before we would decide whether we wanted to renew it or not. Great, thank you. Trustees, any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Sorry. Um, the other one was, I think there was a caller, uh, at, at, or I think, sorry, tonight's kind of running together. Um, the special education accommodations toolkit that was mentioned during one of the prior board meetings about PE, um, students who are, who are in PE and need some sort of accommodation uh, based on their IEP. And so I think the caller mentioned um, uh, asking if uh, an update could be provided. So I do want to just echo that, you know, I, I certainly think that it would be really helpful for an update to be provided once that toolkit is closer to completion, um, just so that the, you know, parents and students could have a better understanding of, of what that might look like. Yes, ma'am. And I think the term was adaptive P. Yeah, so there's adaptive PE, and then there's um, assistance that a student would need based on their IEP. So I think it's like um, different levels of yeah, right. assistance. Right, thank, thank you. you. I, I think I'm done now. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Trustee Anderson, you have your hand up. Um, yes, mine is really a concern, and it's not about any call that I've um, heard it's more so about my binder, which you can't see because it's too thick. My concern, yet again, is we are on 7.1. And if you look at this binder, 
it's 11.09 now. When we, t I, I hear repeatedly about transparency, I hear about equity. Can you please tell me what is transparent at 11.09 and we're just on 7.1? Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Anderson. Trustees, any other questions? If not, thank you all for the clarification questions. As a reminder to our community, please feel free to share any general comments or questions on non-voting items with the board by email at trustees at austinisd.org. We are now going to move to the consent agenda. Trustees, are there any consent items anyone would like to pull for a separate vote? Trustee Singh. 14.6 BE Local. Hold on one second while I, okay, I'm sorry, say that again. 14.6 BE Local. 14.6 BE Local, okay. <laughs> Trustee Boswell. And I have a question about BED Local. Can I make a comment without pulling it? Uh, y yes. Okay, and the comment I would like to make um, BED Local is the one where we're allowing comments on the scorecard presentation um, during voting meetings, even though it's not a voting item. And I think we can take this to the policy committee rather than making a change from the dais. But um, at our meeting on Tuesday, we had a scorecard presentation at a special meeting and no opportunity for public comment. And I would like to kind of talk about catching that in as we change BEDU local. And again, I don't think we're gonna have that come up between now and August. I think we can add this to our August meeting, but I'd love to bring that to the policy committee so we can fill that hole. Yeah, I think in general, when it comes to policies, I think we, we well, if we okay. haven't said it, it's sort of like there are our policies mm -hmm. and that's really our realm of governance. So yes. if we want to update or change them, as long as they're going through a process with mm -hmm. our policy committee, we can update them every month if we yeah. wanted to. Yeah. But, um, so I don't think there's a reason to, to hold yeah. on a vote tonight or to pull it, but yeah. I would love to, it Tuesday exposed a gap, so I would love to just address that. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Wagner? Um, I guess that we pull 11.4 and 11.5 for separate votes, not out of any concerns, but really for um, my abstention since they're city of Austin. 11.4 and? 11.5. 11.5, OK. Thank you. Trustees, any other items to pull? Okay, if not, let's see. Oh, I'm supposed to get a second on that, so I'm sorry. Trustee <laughs> Singh has pulled item 14.6 with a second by Trustee, who wants the second? Trustee Louisville. Trustee Wagner has pulled item 11.4 with a second. Yeah, 11.4 by Trustee Lugo and then Trustee Wagner, I was just doing it one at a time, has pulled item 11.5 with a second by Trustee Lugo. Okay. Now, Secretary Singh, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Yes. And this is probably the longest one that we've ever no, done. I'm ready. This is your going away present. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, I make a motion to approve consent agenda items. Um, let's see. Eight point. Start with 9.1. Oh, wait, yeah, thank you. <laughs> I already messed up. I move to approve agenda items 9.1 to 9.3. Um, 10.1 to 10.10, .10, uh, 11.1 to 11.5, 11.5 to 11.3, wait, yeah. is that right? Yep. Okay, uh, 11.6 through 11.17, 12.1 to 12.2, 13.1 to 13.2. Wait, 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 wait. Oh, sorry. Uh, 11.6 to 11.17. 17. Sorry. 12.1 to 12. 12.2. Uh-huh. 13.1 to 13.2. Uh-huh. 14.1 through 14.5. 14.7 and 
and that's it. Ooh, is there a second? second. Tr Trustee Ashy K. Trustees, there's any, is there any discussion on any of these consent items? I want to recognize Trustee Foster. So uh, th thank you for um, the indulgence. We, we do so much heady work and um, sometimes it's worth lifting up the small things that aren't small but are actually big things. Uh, a few years ago, a previous board was considering changing the names of schools named after Confederate leaders. I think some of us remember that. And one of the arguments I heard for preserving the Confederate names was that our students didn't know that these were Confederate names and hence didn't care. I was floored that the argument to preserve Confederate names was essentially that it was okay since we were doing such a bad job educating our kids. I believe then and I believe now that names matter. I say this in the context of the proposed naming of our newest middle school after Dr. General Garwood Marshall. And I want to, even though some folks uh, know exactly who Dr. Marshall uh, was and is, I, I want to um, lift him up in his history once again as we have on our consent agenda uh, the naming of this school. Dr. General Marshall was born February 27th, 1936 in Clarksville and he passed away two years ago yesterday. Clarksville was, of course, the historic black freed person town <laughs> founded after the Civil War and, and one of more than a dozen freed person towns that existed in Austin at the time. He went to Keeling Junior High where he met his future wife, Marion LaVon. He graduated from the original L.C. Anderson High School in 1953. He graduated with a B.A. from Morehouse College in 1957 an MA in mathematics from the University of Texas at Austin in 1966, and a PhD from the University of Houston in 1976. While he was gaining those advanced degrees that entire time he was teaching at Houston Tillotson University, he taught there from 1966 to 2009. During his years as a school teacher in Georgia, Dr. Marshall was selected as the Georgia State Chamber of Commerce Regional Teacher of the Year and was a state finalist for Teacher of the Year. He was a beloved member of Ebenezer Third Baptist Church, as many of us learned from all the folks who called in a couple weeks ago recommending the school be named after him. He attended Ebenezer Third Baptist from 1958 until his passing. Dr. Marshall considered himself to be a servant leader in all of his civic, social, and religious organizations. He was a lifelong member, uh, a lifetime member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. He had served as vice chair of the board of directors for the Austin Revitalization Authority, the chair of the board of directors for the East Austin Economic Development Corporation. He was a member of the board of directors for Travis County Mental Health. He was vice chairman for the board of directors for the Greater Ounce, uh, Austin Council on Alcoholism. He was a board member uh, of Save Muni the effort to save the city municipal golf course. He founded the Austin Pre-Freshman Engineering Program, uh, OSPREP, whose goal was to increase the number of minority engineers in Texas. Uh, folks who know him uh, knew him to be an avid golfer. Uh, He's pretty famous for his hole-in-one at uh, Muni, for the uh, camera that always hung around his neck. He was an avid photographer. And he also, as a random aside, had his own personal golf cart and trailer <laughs> when he went on to uh, onto the course. He was a beloved uh, resident of our town. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm just beyond excited to, to get it right in terms of uh, the naming of our new middle school. And so I'm excited for this to be on our consent agenda. Thank you, Trustee Foster. Uh, trustees, any other comments about <coughs> Trustee Lugo and then Trustee Singh? Thank you, um, Trustee Foster, for, for that history lesson. It's, it's good to repeat. I really do think it's important to do that because um, it's easy to forget. 
not because the person isn't important, but sometimes we forget to tell the stories. So thank you for that. Um, my comment is about um, consent agenda item 11.2, the approval of the contract for an equity assessment. Um, so, you know, I could probably spend 30 minutes talking about this, but I'm pretty sure Trustee Anderson would um, have my head, so I won't. <laughs> Um, I'll only take 20. Um, I, I so, do want to note, Trustee Anderson agrees with you. <laughs> she, I believe her. I will not. I, I, yes. Um, so, no, in, in all seriousness, this, uh, the equity assessment, you know, it, it is a long time coming. I know many folks who have followed AISD for decades um, know that us voting on this particular item is not um, the end, but simply a beginning. And it and um, just wanted to call out some former trustees. So trustee um, Dr. Ted Gordon and trustee Paul Saldana, uh, along with community members such as Roxanne Evans and um, the Texas Civil Rights uh, Project and all the other folks um, who I, I'm not able to name, but who really kept pushing for um, our district to, to face the reality. And in fact, you know, do, do exactly as, as what we often say, right? Does our reality match our vision? Um, so I'm um, grateful to see that um, we get to vote on this tonight. And I am, um, I, I think we're all committed to ensuring that even that once we get the assessment, that again, that that's not the end, that it's really the time to, to dig in, be honest, and start to um, do things that are different. Hey, so there's a person in the audience, um, I know their name, um, Emily Sawyer. What does your shirt say? It doesn't have to be this way. <laughs> so thank you. Trustee Singh. Thank you so much. Um, I don't know if you said Dr. Holly's name in your list of names, but I wanted to make sure she got her shout out as well for um, the work in this. Thank you so much, Dr. Holly. Um, I did want to so switch subjects. I did have a comment about um, item. Oh goodness, it was the audit plan, um, 10.1. So just I just kind of wanted to. I, this is not in the plan, but I just wanted to ask and just ask the audit committee and just say for the record. Um, my understanding is that if people wanted to call in a, a concern or a complaint that should that would be part of the audit process. Um, I think currently in the past um, that concern would be routed to our internal auditor, right? Those people who are on that committee. Okay, and I think now it's routed to our human resources. Is that correct? And um, I would just wanted to to request that you all consider changing it out of human resources, given that human resources is one of the, you know, they are, they're part of the organization. In fact, they're one of the, <laughs> the departments that are gonna be audited. So I think just for pure transparency and separation, not that I don't think the human resources department is not doing the job of routing this, but I just think we wanna put in some safeguards and maybe have that, those routed either directly to Gibson Consulting or to some other, maybe our our general counsel or someone who's not, um, who's a little bit separate. So thank you for considering that. May I make a response to that? Okay, um, okay so thank you for um, bringing that up. Um, let's see, so yes, right now, um, uh, anyone who calls in to the anonymous tip line, um, and I, Dr. Reach, you're gonna have to remind me, what web page is that under? Is it under human resources? Okay, so th that particular um, uh, anonymous phone line along with, I think there's a form you can fill out online as well. Um, those um, uh, concerns go through hu human resources. My understanding is that p part of the purpose of that line is to really focus on um, now I'm going to forget the words, but it's uh, so misuse of funds, um, basically e ethical and, and legal problems that um, may stem from, from district staff or departments. Um, so there, there's that piece to it. Um, we did in the last um, audit committee meeting, which was in May, last week of May, um, we did have a conversation about um, a couple of things. One, you know, is that um, hotline 
do people know about it? Do they know when to access it? Um, uh, are people using Let's Talk instead of that? Right, like just taking a look at um, are are we are we hitting the goal that we want to uh, by having that anonymous hotline placed under HR? The other thing we talked about was that um, the so our our contracted internal auditor, Gibson, um, they did agree to um, at least take a first look at what types of um, you know, information is coming in, is being reported, um, so that they could then provide uh, the audit committee with their perspective on, does it make sense for the information to continue to um, go through uh, an AISD department, or um, is there value and, and risk mitigation benefits if those um, complaints or, you know, notifications are routed through uh, the contracted internal auditor. And then the last thing I wanted to say was, um, Dr. Reach, am I, am I forgetting anything about that? Because I think they were going to look at three months of data. OK, yeah, so they were going to look at three months of data from Let's Talk and also um, da um, information from the uh, anonymous line as well, though, right? And so, um, so we'll be getting that information September when I when we have our next um, meeting. Thank you, trustees. Any other comments? I'll, I'll just make one and just a point of privilege to thank uh, um, each and every one of you on this dais. I've always believed that good governance uh, brings about good policy and good work. And tonight, in the consent agenda, we're passing legislative priorities. We are approving the audit plan that we've had a discussion about. We we're going to name a middle school after a historical figure that Trustee Foster mentioned. And we'll resolve any internal differences around redistricting and the representation of this, of this board. That is some tremendous work. Um, and a lot of it has been done by co-creating it with the superintendent and administration and the team as well. So a lot of work has been done um, even on the consent agenda, I know we're going to talk about some other separate item talks, but I, I, I'd be remiss if I just didn't, didn't recognize all the work that you all have contributed and the time that you all have done, both the administration and, and the board. So thank you all very much. And unless there's another comment, I have a motion by Secretary Singh and a second by Trustee Ashey to approve consent agenda items 9.1 to 9.3, 10.1 to 10.10. .10, 11.1 .1 through 11.3, 11.6 through 11.17, 12.1 through 12.2, 13.1 to 13.2, 14.1 to 14.5, and 14.7 to 14.8. So all those in favor, please raise your right hand. And the motion passes by all those on the dais. Congratulations. We will now, I know it deserves a clap. <laughs> we will now move to those items pulled from the agenda. The first uh, item is agenda item 14.6 BE local. Trustee Singh, does the, is this the one where I'm? You're going to talk first. Oh, yeah. Let me, um, I'm going to recognize myself. <laughs> for a motion. So trustees, you have, um, as part of your record, a version two of BE local. And this version has some blue lined um, changes to it, some edits to it. And so uh, what I want to make a motion to approve <coughs> version two of the BE local um, as this is an agreed upon edits from the administration and a meeting with our board council around the, the legal kind of issues around it, Trustee Singh and myself. And so we'd like to make a recommendation to our colleagues that we um, vote on this because we don't think there's anything in here that's controversial. Um, and you know, feel free to take a look at it. 
I think what I also want to share with you is that we're going to have a second motion uh, of one particular amendment that Trustee um, Singh and myself and the administration couldn't come to an agreement on that we thought it was important to bring to the board and ask what the will of the board is. And that item is around the idea of pulling consent items on the day of, of the meeting. And so we'd like to kind of get your input on that. But this, this particular one, we decided to pull this separately since there's really not any kind of concerns or issues around it. And in fact, one part that I appreciate is uh, uh, right now serving as the board president, it actually gives me a little bit more time to respond to written uh, requests or comments from, uh, from you all as, as board colleagues. And so uh, I know I appreciate that and I'm sure the next presiding officer and the next presiding officer would appreciate the time to respond um, to your questions. Trustee Ash. So I have a procedural question, yes. to be honest, mm -hmm. because the original BE local was on the information session and yes. these changes we didn't get until quite recently. Mm -hmm. And so my question would be, um, I guess my preference would be that this, and, and it's not, it's actually not my preference, let me put it that way, but it feels like um, if we're wanting to be really thoughtful on what this looks like, to make these changes in what feels like um, um, a later time frame, rather than being able to have the full board discussion, because mm -hmm. when when these this, these changes were made between yourself and trustee seeing, it doesn't feel like this was a full board discussion, but this is about board function. Mm -hmm. And so I don't want to move this. And it feels like a appropriate move to move it to August or to our next information session to give us the opportunity to have the full board discussion on this policy. Mm -hmm. And I am frustrated that once again, this is a policy we've been discussing for 19 months and yet the changes that we just got, we got like three days ago. So that's, that's, um, so I, I, I apologize for the frustration um, display, and yet it is extremely frustrating to me on that level. Yeah. Well, to be fair, these edits have been made for a while. I think there was a question that we had around governance of whether or not, you know, the item is laid out and it was on the agenda. And the question became, well, what happens if you want to make amendments on the on the dais, right, through through governance? And that's really what this is, is an amendment to it. But I, I mean, I, I will do what the will of the board is. I think if we want to go back and have an information session on all of these, I don't think that anyone's opposed to that, um, because I think we're already kind of in practice on all this. And if you all feel that we need some more discussion, happy to happy to do that. It might get us out of this meeting tonight a little bit, <laughs> a little bit earlier I'll too. Yes, trustees. I appreciate trustee Ashley bringing that up, and um, and actually I think that was the, my preference. And I think we actually had a session with AJ scheduled to talk about this, but we never actually talked about it. Yeah, we ran out of time. We ran out of time, yeah. and so. Yeah. And and I actually gave my feedback to AJ back in February. <laughs> <laughs> like that what you see here so and it's now June so um so I hear you and my preference is that we actually have a board discussion but because we didn't really have it like properly scheduled or and you know I was like okay well like how is this going to get raised up and so yeah. that's when you know we talked to Christine and yeah. so I apologize certainly didn't mean to bypass anything but um I'm, I'm happy if we want to wait till August. So Christine, just a procedural question. So I made a motion, no one has seconded yet. So would I just leave it alone or do I need a motion to table? I mean, your motion can die for lack of a second, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then if you're ready to move on, you can post, you can move, someone could move to postpone indefinitely. And that sounds like forever, but it really just means for tonight. Okay. so. Not hearing a second on my motion, that motion 
dies. Dies. Of the second. So I am looking for a motion to postpone, postpone indefinitely. indefinitely. And then we will so schedule moved. that. Uh, and uh, so it's been moved. Second. Trustee Zapata has seconded. And I see a lot of three, four, and fives. Uh, so Trustee Ashy has made a motion to indefinitely postpone item 14.6B local. Trustee Zapata has seconded. All those in favor, oh, well, actually, is there any questions or comments on, the, on this motion? If there's not, all those in favor, please raise your right hand. And the motion passes and the item is postponed indefinitely. Can I ask a quick question? I didn't catch yes. all the names. So I don't know, Christy, I may have to talk to you. I don't know how to record all of this. Yeah, tr so, uh, trust oh, sure. We'll just chat later. <laughs> yeah, and I'll write the notes down as well in case we need them. Actually, about that. Okay, so now um, we'll move to item 14 point, I'm sorry, 11.4. And should I just take them to get, can I take them together? Okay, so um, Trustee Wagner pulled item 11.4 and 11.5 with a second from Trustee Lugo. Do I have a motion to, um, do, do I have a motion to uh, approve item 11.4 and 11.5? So moved. Okay, so Trustee Lugo, and who would like to second? Okay, Zapata. Okay, so having a motion by Trustee Lugo and a second by Trustee Zapata to approve item 11.4 and 11.5, all those in favor, please raise your right hand. All those against, all those abstaining. So showing uh, Trustee Wagner abstaining and the motion passes one, two, three, four, five, seven. Seven, four, zero against and showing Trustee Wagner abstaining. Okay, now we will move to the items for separate vote. Trustee Singh, do we have a motion to approve agenda item 15.1? Yes, I move we approve item 15.1 adopt. Yes, I move we approve item 15.1, adoption of the recommended FY22-23 budget. Okay, is there a second? Second. So, second. Uh, trustees, okay. So trustees, is, any, is there any discussion on this item? <clears throat> Trustee Lugo. Um, well, actually, you know what, um, President Rodriguez, can, can I see if there's anybody else that wants to speak first? Sure. Before, okay, let's do that. Yeah, I'll do, uh, anyone else want to speak on this motion? Trustee Anderson, I see you have your hand up. So my, my question is about the essential area redesign. Um, I had asked about, is there an opportunity for t elementary teachers to still get their additional planning time while partnering with an organization. And I remember some years ago that we used to have marathon kids. Is that not an option? I, I, think, uh, I think Dr. Reach is gonna answer that question, uh, Trustee Anderson. Yeah, um, so we are still partners with Marathon Kids. Uh, it is true that uh, we used to have a very strong partnership with Marathon Kids where they would um, work with students and basically they would um, keep track of how much they were walking or running um, outside of PE until they had actually run or walked a marathon cumulatively over a period of time. Um, so a great program. I know that we actually had some trustees that would come and run that with us on the first day. Um, and so that, that does still exist. Um, certainly to the extent that it, it may be structured, it would occur, but it would not necessarily meet the total amount of minutes that would be needed um, for those that two week period or that daily period, depending on how you're calculating the number of minutes. It was more of a, um, of a support of an add-on program in addition to the other things we were already doing on campuses. 
Uh, we could certainly have conversations with them. I'm not sure if that's a capacity that they would have to support for that amount of time for our campuses. I think more so what I'm what I'm looking at is maybe not them taking on the full load, but some kind of way structuring it. So because I've I've heard a lot about the current plan being unequitable and how students will lose art and music minutes and you know this negative impact is gonna have. So I'm just I'm I'm asking if some type of partnership that can achieve what it is we're trying to achieve, is it possible or has it been looked at? Can I um, add to what you just said, Trustee Anderson? I think, and I think Dr. Edisa, you, you may be wanting to comment on this. I, I think there is, I think the administration is looking at a systemic approach to relationships and partnerships and discerning how they align to our district scorecard and help support what we're doing. And they push, I guess is the right word, or, or kind of go, they align to our goals versus them being separate apart in an island among themselves and being more about meeting the goals of that organization versus what the needs are of our students. So your, your, your comment is really uh, right on point, but I don't know, Dr. Risada, if you want to add to that. I, I don't think in terms of taking it to scale, we did not look at it. As, as you were talking and as I was listening to Dr. Reach, what we can do is we can go back starting with campuses whose plan did not include the same number of minutes of art or music and start with those schools and see who did have previous relationships already with, um, with this particular one, but now that you raise this, maybe there are others that we might be able to do, do that with as well. So I think we could start at the campus level um, at the end, I think it's going to be about are we able to to stay in alignment with what we do know um, regarding the number of minutes of PE uh, that we do need to ensure our students are having access to. But it's a very well-made point, and I know our, t our team can go back and look at it. I'm not at this point, don't, don't have a scale, taking it to scale that would cause us to um, make a different recommendation at this moment. I appreciate that and, and I would just also ask that as you are looking at and creating this plan and I know she gonna get me for throwing her out here but uh, there is a PE teacher who I absolutely love and that's only because she was my PE teacher when I went to Blackshire. Miss Miss Creighton, <laughs> but I would just ask that if it's possible, if you can include some of our uh, veteran and novice PE teachers in the conversation, as you always do. That's my only request. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Trustees, other trustees, saying. Um, I just have a comment related to what Trustee Anderson was just saying, and I, I love imagining you um, doing PE at Blackshire Elementary. I love it. I hope you have a picture of that. <laughs> so cute. Okay, so I wanted to ask about like the coordinated um, school health report um, that's on, on our website, and this is related to the wow time or, or like the marathon kids and like how that fits into the whole plan to meet our minutes. But when I'm looking at the report for this school year, unless I'm reading this wrong, it looks like 100% of our campuses said that students received 135 minutes a week of structured PE through PE and wow time and marathon kids. And so I don't know how accurate that is I don't know like you know it, it's just another data point as we're thinking about what to do um, and what what we think is happening what is being reported 
and thinking about is this really a question of um, implementation or reporting fidelity or is this of a, a, a wow time and marathon kids or is this something else but that's you know just wanted to kind of bring that up thank you trustees other questions or comments and if <coughs> trustee zapata and then i'll recognize trustee lugo So my comment is around our student health. Uh, with COVID, a lot of our students and families, adults, all of us were in isolation for two years, um, in home, no exercise, no physical activity for many of my, uh, my schools of students and families. Uh, so there's a lot of health issues that have resurfaced um, just about, uh, what, eight years ago, nine years ago, uh, before I was part of creating Go Austin, Vamos Austin, all that was initiated because an optimal health study of, a zip, of zip codes and how unhealthy our students were. And so we really worked hard to create more physical activity. I think this is an opportunity to bring that back to our students. Uh, it's going to help them to be healthier and to be engaged in class. Um, you know, uh, visiting with many parents and students, they love PE. So um, I think that's an area that I have not heard anyone talk about. Yes, we have heard that we need to prioritize mental health, and sometimes this physical activity really helps our students in that area. So um, I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Trustee. About that, Trustee Lou. So one one quick comment, and then my original um, thing. Um, thank you, Trustee Zapata, for, for raising up the issues around uh, health, especially among the Latino population or the Hispanic population, um, and even indigenous, right? Like there are um, disparate uh, health outcomes within those three populations, plus uh, African American and, and, and blacks. And so um, I agree that um, physical movement is um, part of a healthy lifestyle. Um, and I jokingly say, and this is coming from somebody who sits all day in front of a computer, but it is important to move. Um, and in the words of my um, rising third grader, he said, I love wow time. Are you kidding me? They're going to take it away. That's the one time I get to get up and just run around. Now he's got, he's, he's special um, and I love him. And, and I really appreciated the the passion with which he um, expressed his appreciation of wow time. So, um, so all of that, just wanted to share those comments. Um, okay, so I move to amend the motion on the floor to adopt the proposed budget. The motion should be amended to read, we adopt the proposed budget contingent upon revisions made by the administration to scale down the essential areas redesigned to a pilot program at a limited number of campuses rather than a district-wide implementation. Sorry, I had, didn't, I had that off, sorry. So Trustee Lugo is making a motion to amend the motion to adopt the recommended budget is there a second to that? Trustee Boswell. It's an, it's an amendment to the, to, the, uh, to the approval of the budget. Okay, so is there any discussion on the amendment proposed by Trustee Lugo and seconded by Trustee Boswell? Trustee uh, Wagner. Well, I've got a couple of questions for the administration because particularly on something as large and complex as a budget vote. Um, I have a lot of hesitation in making a change at this late of a stage in the game on the dais, um, knowing that there, while I think the spirit of the motion 
is pure. I do think that there can be additional repercussions that we're not aware of um, when we're dealing with a budget with so much, um, so many interdependencies. And so I wanted to give our administration a chance to explain um, any impacts that we may not foresee with that change, as well as um, understand again, um, if we did go forward with that change, what that would mean in terms of impacts for teacher planning time, because the, the whole intent of this was to try and put more time back into our core instructional teachers' days, and I, I wanna be sure that we're not losing that opportunity for our teachers as well if there is a way to understand that more fully. So um, so with that, I would ask um, Dr. Elizalde and anyone from your team you feel would be best equipped to answer those questions. So I, I really think we've got a legal question also because I, I don't know what I recall about creating a contingency budget requires certain criteria to be met. So uh, first, I have a question, and I don't know that we have the expertise to actually answer the question with regard to do, did we really adopt a budget that's contingent upon certain changes? Um, secondly, um, we're, I still have the same concerns with regard to the number of minutes um, you know, I know there's been a lot of talk about equity. We right now don't have equity in the number of minutes that reading is being taught in every classroom in our district. We don't have consistency in the number of minutes that are being taught in mathematics. So I think the isolation of, of, of this is, um, again, I think there's a variety of perspectives. I think it is important to recognize that the budget included um, months of campuses creating these particular plans. Um, it was the campuses who indicated they were not able to consistently conduct WOW across the board in meeting the minutes. So um, the goal was to ensure, and we do think that at the elementary level, I mean, we have one PE vacancy but we have 300 elementary vacancies. And we actually think this could be a way in which teachers might say, if I'm getting a little extra time to do some of the work that I'm doing after school, just as I thought it was equally important, the viewpoint that was brought to me and to our team regarding secondary planning and what would be the effects if we looked at cutting secondary planning and that we might lose teachers. I think it's a great argument and I think it applies at the elementary too. I, I think there could be some folks that might be choosing us for a variety of reasons, and that could be one of the reasons or a, a combination of reasons. So I, I don't, I'm not sure that we are not, we're, we're <clears throat> we would have to commit to something that I don't know that we can do in the summer with regard then to what the plans are what we are, who we are hiring in terms of numbers, um, how do we go about deciding who the pilot schools are. Um, so there are a lot of moving parts, and at the end we absolutely serve at the will of the board and the leadership team. Um, if that is the direction the board gives us, then we will do everything to make it be as successful as we're directed by the board, the board's will. So I heard a request from councils to comment. Do y'all? Yeah, so you can, well, you need to adopt the budget before July 1, right? So that has to happen. Um, the motion, as I understand it, is to approve the budget with, uh, Actually, it might be helpful for Trustee Lugo to repeat it. So the motion would be, uh, the motion should be amended to read, we adopt the proposed budget 
contingent upon revisions made by the administration to scale down the essential uh, areas redesigned to a pilot program at a limited number of campuses rather than a district-wide implementation. So I'm, I'm obviously like you guys would supersede that, but um, my understanding of what is permitted by adopting a proposed budget contingent upon right mm -hmm. X, Y, Z is that you're revisiting the budget. It's, you know, so you are adopting the dollar amount. Right, that, that would be my expectation as well, is that you'd be adopting the budget and what I, the format I think that would take is that it would come back to you in the form of a budget amendment. Um, and it's almost like saying with an expectation to see a budget amendment. You know, so I think then you have some fair questions about you know the practicalities of when when's that going to happen, uh, but yeah, I, I don't think it's a it's a I think it's a motion that effectively adopts the budget. I, I wouldn't have concern about that. Can we separate it? Mm -hmm. Well, could we separate it into two motions? It might be cleaner that way. I mean, I, I think the board could certainly direct the administration to explore this. Uh, but the way, the way it's worded now it sounds to me as though adoption of the budget is contingent upon this occurring, and temporarily that won't occur until, you know, potentially a couple of months. And so does that mean that the budget's not adopted until that happens? And so that, that was the, the kind of question that I had around that. Christine. Um. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, the, cle the absolute cleanest thing is, yes, approve the motion to ad adopt the budget, just unamended. Um, but I think, I mean, I, I think it. It's allowable. It's there, allowable, there, there, yes. It's yes. just a matter and recently of recently there was a school district be done. that um, did just this thing in 2022. School districts frequently will adopt, like particularly if they're going to go out for a tax ratification election, right? Sometimes they will adopt alternate budgets because they've got a compensation plan that's contingent upon additional M&O dollars, right? So the, you can do it. You've just got to adopt a budget. So this is going to be your budget. And if what you're saying is there's a line item in here for a program that you'd actually as a board, assuming your, your motion to uh, amend passes, um, if the notion then would be we've adopted this budget, we would like to see this program scaled back. Um, you've adopted the budget basically as is with an expectation. Yes. And so then the question is, is that something the administration could do? And they've got to tell you that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So any other discussion from trustees? I have five points that I can share. Um, I doubt that it will persuade anybody, but um, <laughs> I, I can share them. Yeah, yeah. if you don't mind do, one, uh, doing two things, um, Trustee Lugo. One is just repeat the, the, um, the motion to amend sure. and then do the five points, and then we'll open up to any questions, and if there are none, then we'll just call a vote. Okay. Um, so I move to amend the motion on the floor to adopt the proposed budget. The motion should be amended to read we adopt the proposed budget contingent upon revisions made by the administration to scale down the essential areas redesign to a pilot program at a limited number of campuses rather than a district-wide implementation. And I can email the language if it's helpful. Okay. So if I may, Trustee Lugo, maybe, maybe the issue that's hanging, that hanging people up is the use of the word contingent. So maybe uh, you Move could say the, like, yeah. just to say maybe with an expectation, instead of contingent upon this, with an expectation of this. Does that make sense? Okay, give me one second. Uh, okay. Um, okay. Uh, that would. Sorry, I'm trying to. This is what you what happens when you get into legalese. It's like, how do I get that in there? Um, okay, 
So, uh, so here, here's my uh, amendment to the amendment. I move to amend the motion on the floor to adopt the proposed budget. The motion should be amended to read, we adopt the proposed budget with an expectation that the district administration will bring a budget amendment before us that would um, uh, essentially be a, a, a budget for a scaled down version of the essential areas redesign to a pilot program at a limited number of campuses rather than a district-wide implementation. Trustee Boswell, do you want to second and agree to the revised mo agree? I'm sorry, the revised motion. Um, yes, I will second the revised motion. And may I ask a question about it mm -hmm. um, for council? Oh. oh yeah, sorry. I'll rec I'll recognize you in just a minute, uh, Tish. Go ahead. Okay. Sure. My question for council is: Is there anything in this motion that would prevent the administration from finding another way to add planning time? We had talked about early release, some other options. In, in their proposed amendment, they could include a different plan for planning time. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. And then my second question for you um, while we're talking is just can you please clarify just the factual legal requirement for structured physical activity? Sure. Thank you. Uh, the I'll try to pull it up really quickly, but off the top of my head for children in grades six and under, it's 30 minutes of vigorous, moderate vigorous physical activity daily or 135 minutes over a week. So it's, yeah, so, yes. So, and that can that be accomplished through a mixture of formal PE classes and other structured physical yes. activity? Yeah. Okay, thank you. And I know you emailed that to the board two sure. weeks ago. Thank you, I appreciate that. So, Trustee Lugo, you said you had five points you wanted to make. Um, yeah. Oh, oh wait, uh, Trustee Anderson. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, yeah. I'm sorry. I apologize. Trustee Anderson? I've been having my hand up for the longest. <laughs> so, That's how... good exercise. How... Is, no, on the on Zoom, not my real hand. <laughs> so, how... How is what I asked Dr. Alizalde and what she said to me different than what they're talking about. Like, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm not asking for a pilot because what my concern with that is, and I think somebody already said it, how do you choose the campus? And what I don't want to see is, <clears throat> as typical, a campus in District 1 becoming a guinea pig. That's what I don't want to see. So if we talking about, I've been listening to all the comments and looking at all the emails, and a lot of people were saying, well, we didn't get an opportunity to give feedback in the process. So how is what I'm saying different from what you saying, even though you're saying you wanted a pilot at a specific, you know, a, a pilot at some campuses versus what I'm saying, looking at a partnership and Dr. Alizalde saying she wants to go, she wants it to look at those campuses where whatever it was she said, it's late. <laughs> but how, how is that, how is that different? I hope I'm asking the correct. It sounds like a procedural question, President Rodriguez. Um, the difference between a comment versus a motion to amend. That's that's not what I'm saying. I'm I'm basically saying so. You're basically saying that you don't want a large scale. You want a pilot. And what I'm saying is, so I asked something similar, and Doctor, but mine is not a pilot. I'm asking about partnerships and giving the opportunity for uh, PE teachers to come to the table at maybe those campuses, like Dr. Alizalde referenced those campuses that I, I guess she said may not met the minutes or something. It's late, I can't remember. But how, I'm asking how is that different from what you're saying? So I guess more so, 
No, Alita, I'm kind of asking you, how is that different from what I was asking? So I, I think one of the pieces of information um, that I heard when uh, Trustee Boswell asked our board council, you know, does the motion as it reads, does it somehow restrict or prohibit the district from finding some creative way that still meets the goal, right? Planning, uh, additional planning time for elementary teachers um, in the hopes that it would impact uh, student outcomes positively, right? So would this motion, as it reads, would it prohibit the district from doing something creative like what you had taught, one of the examples that you had provided? Um, board Council, if I'm correct, your answer was no. It, it in fact, gives the district um, the ability to come back and, and, and in fact, the district could come back and say, we're not going to put a board a, a budget amendment. Or they could come back and say, you know, after some deliberation, you know, here's what we have to implement right now versus, you know, give us whatever they, they end up asking for. So, I mean, it, it doesn't preclude those kinds of creative solutions. That's my understanding. I think that's correct. I mean, I think to answer Trustee Anderson's question, I really think it's a question of semantics. I mean, if she, what she described and calling it a pilot program or saying this is what we'll do, you know, it's it's just different ways to describe where you get into the same place. So I think it's but okay. The only difference, and and I guess this is where I'm struggling at, right? I didn't mention a pilot. No, Alita did. So to me, words mean everything. So just just say that this passes, right? You hear pilot. And so what would trouble me about that? How is a campus chosen? So to me, words matter. So I'm all for, you know, trying to find another solution and all of that. But pilot, that's where I pause at, pilot. And, it, and if I may um, respond. So Trustee Anderson, I absolutely agree. Like words are powerful. Um, and um, a, as I'm sitting here thinking about, you know, what are the implications of asking the administration to consider piloting the program versus going full scale? I'm also hearing something that you had mentioned um, is that, well, wait a minute, if we pilot this idea, what if um, uh, schools, campuses with majority black and brown students, majority low income students, D1 students, right? Like what if they end up being the guinea pig? And I, in fact, like I, I see us more aligned than not because my main concern is what if this unproven large-scale practice, I'm trying not to curse, um, <laughs> this unproven large-scale practice, um, in fact, not only um, worsens or, or increases disparities in outcomes, right? Safety, special education, all that stuff. But we do it all over town. That, that is my concern at the end of the day. So I absolutely agree. Like, what if this impacts D1 students inequitably? And I think we have plenty, of, my opinion, I think we have received a, an enormous amount of data from deeply committed PE teachers and parents that should, at minimum, make us pause. So I agree, it, you know, whatever the administration, if this mo amendment to the motion, if it were to pass, it really comes down to the interim superintendent and how they approach this particular problem. Well, all I'm hoping for, like, as long as your motion does, like, I just, I can't get with a pilot. I, I just, I can't get with that. Like, I, you had me till I heard pilot. And it, it, it makes me a little nervous when I hear that. So, like, 
if you find something, some different wording, like you got me, but pilot, I like I I I, I can't swing that. Even though I heard, you know, the administration could do X Y Z possibly, but pilot, that's what I'm I'm all about words, pilot. So, Can I ask a okay, I'll okay. leave my uh, rant. Thank Christy you, Christy Anderson. Thank you. So, can I ask, like, what? Do you, so in your mind, like what would be the ideal? I'm trying to understand like your comments now. <laughs> so or I know that you were talking about like, you know, making sure that we bring in um, some of our, our PE teachers um, as part of the conversation. Is your hope that we would have a district-wide um, implementation of this? No. Okay. I'm specifically, so I'm going back to Dr. Alizalde's words when I initially asked the question, which is looking at those campuses that I think she said may have not met the minutes or something she, it's something she referenced. I mean, it's late. I can't remember word for word, but that's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about a large scale. I'm talking about looking at those campuses, which would probably be a lot of campuses in District 1, I'm assuming. But that's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about large scale. No, no. But I do, I do, don't get me wrong, I do believe it's important for elementary teachers to get additional planning time. How that's accomplished, I don't know. This is just my brain at 1210. Would it be better if somehow the motion um, included language that I know I, would, I was thinking okay. of that like you know how do you broaden it so that it's so that would include conversations with the people like that trustee Anderson is referencing as part of that of deciding who and what where all right I'm um, not getting too like no, I, I hear management -y. you. Yeah, no, I definitely I don't, don't want to go down the road of, of management or, or, you know, kind of telling the district how to solve this problem. I think that's counter to what our values are, or, or at least, you know, I, I think these are this is our value, collaborative problem solving. So my hope with the motion is um, twofold. One, a conversation about this and this is not new in terms of like the problem with this particular piece of the budget um, so just having the conversation is important Two, um, if the amendment were to pass it allows more time for the new for the new interim superintendent to just like again pause rethink there's a mountain of data that we have received over the last few months from people who are directly impacted by this redesign. I swear, you know, I carry this equity focused decision making thing with me because I just have to I just have to recenter myself. All of that to say, Christine, I'm in my mammalian brain right now. I'm in my lizard brain. I need help. If if there's a way to broaden the language. <laughs> You, can you take it from the top one more time? Do you have one, it? One more time with feeling. Um, <laughs> um, if, you wanna, okay. if, you, if you're wanting to amend it again, re revise the language of your amendment. Yes, broaden it so that essentially at the end of the day, we adopt the budget, mm -hmm. so the dollar amount, with the expectation that the administration is going to bring back budget amendment solving this issue of give elementary teachers more planning time without what could potentially be large scale unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. I told you I was in my lizard brain. Okay, let me try to, okay. okay. The language is, I move to amend the motion on the floor to adopt the proposed budget. The motion should be amended to read, we adopt the proposed budget with an expectation that the administration will bring a budget amendment showing. And so now I have to figure out how do I, <laughs> you know, I can't use pilot. So is it test? Is it bring back evidence? Um, I mean, honestly, if I could just say my, 
if I could just say my five points, that may actually help. But um, I, 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 I want to hear from you, Christine. Maybe instead of showing, I, I, I think you, it was the last word was showing, and then it was, may, so maybe instead of a pilot program, uh, just a, a plan for a reduced scale implementation. My God bless you. So I, so I, I here I know that you have a motion that's been a motion to amend that's been made and seconded, but we've already revised it once. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Let's kill this one, President Rodriguez. I think, yeah, I, think I accept your rescission. Your rescission? Yeah. Of, <laughs> I don't know what the, it is. Procedurally, I don't know what it is. Yeah. It, so I renounce my renouncement. You renounce <laughs> your you pull, you're pulling back the amendment and you're going and I just Revising. recognize you to make another amendment. Mm -hmm. yeah. Withdraw. Thank you. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's take it all of us. By the way, it's it's Together, no longer. Together we can create one brain. Yeah. Right now. It's no longer. Yes. It's no longer a late meeting. It's a very early morning <laughs> meeting. So I'll recognize uh, Trustee Lugo, who has withdrawn her amendment to the motion to amend, and I'm recognizing her to make a different motion. Okay. All right. Fun times. Here we go. Okay, I move to amend the motion on the floor, which that was the original, right? Adopt the proposed budget. I move to amend the motion on the floor to adopt the proposed budget. The motion should be amended to read, we adopt the proposed budget with an expectation that the administration will bring a budget amendment back to the board, showing a plan for a reduced scale implementation rather than a district-wide essential areas redesign. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Trustee Lugo has made a, a uh, an amendment to the motion. Trustee Singh has seconded the motion. And trustees, are there any questions or discussions before I recognize Trustee Lugo to make five points before we call the vote? So if there's not any questions, do you have one? Trustee Foster? Well, I, I'm, um, I'm, I'm, I'm uncomfortable with a couple things. Um, one is this massive a change like in this moment because of all the unintended and all the things I'm not aware of in terms of the the thought that goes behind this decision or that so I'm a little uncomfortable with that um, but then I'm also uncomfortable because I do feel like this is operations I do feel like this is day-to-day -day of the district and I don't feel so I want to hold our superintendent accountable for student outcomes. But if I say, do it this way, or if, they, if the superintendent says, this is the way I want to do it, and we say, no, 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 don't do it that way, do it this way, then I feel less comfortable holding someone accountable. Because I'm, hold, I'm not holding them accountable not for their plan and not for their implementation. I'm holding them accountable for the way I want it done. Um, and I think we desperately need to be able to hold our superintendent accountable. So I'm, I, I've got, I guess, those two challenges with, with what's, what, what, what's being introduced. Thank you, Trustee Foster. Um, trustees, other questions or comments? And if not, I'm going to recognize Trustee Lugo for the five comments or five points that you wanted to make. I, th I think, you know, it would be helpful for the board to probably have a conversation about when we adopt a budget, we're adopting investments in certain things. So I, I do think that maybe there's further conversation there. Um, all right, my five points really quickly. Um, to date, I have not seen any 
data-backed evidence that a district-wide essential areas redesign would yield the implied goal. The implied goal being to improve educational outcomes for students by supporting elementary teachers with additional planning time. Two, the responses that have been given regarding feasibility of implementation fail to account for the gap between policy and on-the-ground practices. There's nothing that exempts AISD from the policy practice gap. Three, when I hear that the district's plan is to gather feedback once the school year begins, and in the same breath explain that the plan is that the plan to gather feedback is undefined and is not fully baked, I, I can't rely on hope. I have to look at what has been observable patterns when there's not a plan in place. I want to highlight two, this is point four, I want to highlight two questions that I asked the district administration. The first question was, in thinking about the administration's approach to problem solving with urgency and focus, what techniques are working well and what are some techniques that may need to be adjusted? No response. Of, I think a couple of months ago, uh, Trustee Foster, you used the word managing disruption. And I loved that word. And in fact, I remember saying I loved that word uh, or that phrase. Um, because when I hear managing disruption, I essentially, I think that essentially what we're talking about is high stakes change management, high stakes transition management, right? You're trying to transform, right? So, so uh, in that same vein, I asked the administration it, through the tracker, I said, is there a transition management plan in writing? If not in writing, how is the transition management being monitored for progress, success, failure? Who's overseeing each piece? Is it multi multidisciplinary or one or two people? The response was, we do not have a transition management plan in writing. And while those responses were at best underwhelming, they are telling. Point five, and I get that this may fail, and that's what it is, but point five, how is it a demonstration of good, steward good stewardship of public funds to spend millions of dollars on a significant yet unproven practice? Thank you, Trustee Lua. Trustees, any other comments before I call? Okay, I'm going to call the vote for the for the amendment. So, Trustee Lugo has made a amendment to the budget. Trustee Singh has seconded the motion. And all those in favor in favor of the amendment of Trustee Lugo's amendment, please raise your right hand. I want to. Make sure, okay. All those for it, all those against the motion, please raise your hands. Okay. Wait, I counted wrong, sorry. Why well, you got to 11? That's not good. Six, I got, oh, oh, I'm sorry. I count, yeah, I counted four, four, sorry. So the motion uh, to amend the budget fails with three for the uh, amendment and six against the amendment. So now we're back to the original motion to approve item 15.1, adoption of the recommended FY 2022-23 budget that Trustee Singh moved and Trustee Zapata seconded. So any other discussion on this item, trustees? Tr Trustee Singh. Um, I don't know if this is possible, but would, would Dr. Mays be comfortable? Just, I'm just curious to know if he has any comments on any of this. I would welcome hearing him. Sure. Dr. Uh, I think we've had a number of different conversations. Can you all hear me first off? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I can hear you. Hold on one second. We've had a number of different conversations, I know. How many board uh, meetings are you in? <laughs> <laughs> I have multiple devices on them, so. That's why we need that policy on those devices. <laughs> so, no, but uh, we've had this conversation a number of times. I know I've, I've spoken with Trustee uh, Singh and uh, 
a couple of you all about this. And so, you know, one of the things that I've share with you all is that we are committed to having these conversations ongoing uh, as we monitor the, the implementation of it. Um, and I've shared with you all that, you know, the district is, is a tugboat, it's not a Ferrari. And so I know that we made a sudden, uh, a pretty significant sudden turn uh, when we pivoted from the original plan uh, regarding secondary planning time uh, and the early release. And so uh, that was four to five months uh, worth of you know work uh, amongst principals again not you know administrators myself or Dr. Elizalde said this this were principals working on this uh, we've had that same effort uh, with principals around this initiative uh, as well as communities as they've engaged their CACs uh, and you know PTAs around those conversations at the local level and so I said even as I spoke with you all individually, that I would be encouraging the, the board to adopt a budget, uh, but hold us accountable to, like you said, monitoring the implementation. Uh, we talked about surveys, we talked about focus groups, we talked about that uh, taking place pretty consistently to be able to bring uh, back the feedback with you all uh, regarding the implementation. And then if we need to pivot from there, uh, we'll do what we need to do. Uh, but right now, I would say we need to go ahead and move forward. Uh, with the work that's been put in uh, from, you know, again, the whole entire AISD team, not just this administration. Thank you. Yeah, Trustee Foster. So uh, I really appreciate your invitation um, to have our, our, our chief of schools a comment. And I'm going to be, I'll, I'll just speak with candor. Um, over the last several months, we've had lots of 9-0, 9-0, 9-0, and maybe an 8-1 here or there in terms of the, the decision-making of, of the board. And here we have a moment where there are principal differences that are arising that produced just in this moment, I guess, 6-3 or something like that. And um, while this is semi out of line to speak this way, I think this is really an important moment. We're about to transition from one superintendent into another. And I think what we're hearing loud and clear are concerns that are being expressed. And I think Dr. Mays, and again, this is a little maybe paternalistic or patronizing or, or something, but, but it's important. I think we're hearing clearly. So for me, you say, we're going to do this. This is what we are now we're going to do this. This is what we recommend. This is where we go forward. I'm willing in this early hour to say, all right, this is your plan and absolutely say you are now accountable for the outcomes associated with this plan. And what Trustee Lugo offered was a kind of or, or what's being offered is is a, a way out when you say um, if this doesn't go well, we will pivot. How do we know it's not going well? We're committed to, you said, listening sessions. You're committed to surveys. Trustee Lugo said, well, you know, specificity? Specificity wasn't there yet. So all I'm hearing are all the ways in which you could get back to 9-0, which is to say, to, to, to find that ground where if in the end this budget is approved, whether it's 6372-8154, it's approved, that those dissenting voices are heard and honored, especially where there's some really great opportunities for us to continue our march forward with improvement in terms of this relational side, this collaborative side. So um, again, it's, it's, a, it's slightly out of line for me to be speaking this candidly or to be speaking this way. But I think it's an important moment. Um, for my part, I, I'm in approval. But I'm in approval as an expression of faith of a likely incoming. But that faith does not extend beyond accountability. And the accountability will absolutely be there. Thank you, Trustee Foster. Uh, Colleagues, any other comments about this item? Trustee Singh. I appreciate your words, Trustee Foster. And um, I, I am thinking about the budget as a whole. 
and I really, really appreciated um, the investment in our staff. You know, we saw increases in pay that I never thought I would see during this term. So when, when I'm thinking about the budget, I'm thinking about the whole budget. Um, I'm, I'm willing to vote yes on this budget, but I'm gonna hold you accountable, Dr. Mays, <laughs> to two things, not only, the account, not only the outcomes, but also what's on the sheet of paper, okay, which to me is more important than the outcomes. This, these are our values. Caring for every child to be healthy, safe, engaged, supported, and challenged. And I'm, I'm glad I heard no, no PE is gonna happen in maker spaces or libraries, which is different from what I heard about 10 hours ago. So I appreciate that. Um, educational equity, to ensure every child receives what is needed. And that means no kid is gonna get less special ed. We're not gonna have special ed TAs being pulled out to help kids in their daily PE. Like those are things I'm looking for. So it does go beyond the outcomes for me because if you get outcomes and you violate our values, that's not good either. Like we spent months, we spent a whole year coming up with this list of values. So those are the things that, um, that I'll be looking for. But as a measure of, of good faith, I'm, I'm willing to vote yes on this budget because there was enough good stuff in the budget that I really appreciated. And, um, and I'm looking forward to um, a, just an opportunity for us to um, start off strong. So, thank you. Thank you. Colleagues, any other comments? Trustee Lugo? Um, so I just wanted to briefly say, Dr. Mays, I really um, admire my colleagues who um, are able to take the positions that they have articulated. Um, and you all know, you know, I what, grew up in a family with domestic violence, so they're definitely trust issues, right? And I worked for state government for 20 years, so you know I know how the sausage is made. Um, <laughs> and I saw this quote the other day, and it said, unconditional love does not mean unconditional tolerance. For me, for me, when I hear unconditional love does not mean unconditional tolerance, just like I had shared with you the other day or last week, whenever it was, I will not be a cheerleader for the sake of being a cheerleader. I love Austin ISD. My babies go to Austin ISD. I believe in public education. I believe that there is a, a, a purposeful division between board governance and administrative operations. I, I do. And I, I will always vote my conscience. Thank you, Tracy Puzzle. Um, I've said before that process matters greatly, and I think process matters, especially when we're making hard decisions. And this budget, we all know, we've talked about it um, over and over, is filled with hard decisions. People who love this district, who had given this district a great deal, um, who were cut from central office to give us the freedom to support campuses. Um, the knowledge that we can't pay our classified workers, our teachers, anyone as much as they deserve or enough to, to really live in Austin. Lots and lots of hard decisions and very few of them made with deep engagement with our community. Um, and in response to, to saying I, you know, that I think the hardest decisions need community engagement the most. I have also heard said that when we have to make really big cuts, it's just more than the community can have a voice in. And, and I push back on that as a public institution in a city that cares deeply about our schools that has a lot to say with everything I have. Um, and there is a lot of good in this budget and I have no doubt that, that this is being put forward, the, the plan here, the, the plan that, that we're really debating the most tonight is being put forward with the best of intentions. But I also have heard for four months consistently from hundreds of people who are closest to the problem on our campuses that they have grave concerns about student safety, about the practicality, 
about the ruptures this will cause, about equity, about a lot of things. Um, and, and, you know, I'm not just asking tonight, and, and I know that I will not, you know, it's not going to go my way. Um, but I support the planning. I just, I cannot vote in good conscience to allow, to support it in this way at this cost. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Boswell. Trustees, any other comments you'd like to make? Okay, if not, having a motion by Secretary Singh and a second by Trustee Zapata to approve item 15.1. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. All those opposed and all those abstaining. So the motion passes seven, four, two against and zero abstaining. I do just wanna make one note about this budget just as a board. We have just voted for the first time since 2017 for a balanced budget, which hopefully will allow us to spring forward with as many of these opportunities that we can uh, meet um, around all the challenges that we've all talked about tonight. So um, I think that is a, um, a one uh, item to, uh, to note. Trustee Anderson. I just want to say, like, I want to be clear about my vote. Like, my vote is a vote with the expectation that <laughs> current and soon to be administration will circle back around and have those conversations with, as me and Dr. Alizalde discussed, those campuses that will have the greatest impact. That is my hope. And so I'm hoping that sometime soon we hear well, not sometime soon, because I know it's going to take a while, but the expectation hearing back on, hey, this is how we collaborated with, you know, so-and-so campuses. And yes, campus administration should be included in the conversation, but the people that's actually going to be <laughs> the PE teachers, that's, that's who I'm hoping to hear from. So that's my vote. That's my expectation that this is done, that, that you revisit this and include partnerships and all of that. That's my, that's why I voted the way I voted. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Trustee Anderson. Do Dr. Mays, did you have your hand up? I, I didn't count your vote there. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I was not. <laughs> I was not voting, but uh, just wanted to reiterate, you know, kind of what Trustee Lugo was saying. I mean, it really is important that you all are a part of the process. And so as we think about, you know, again, going back out there to re-engage and try to work on co-creating surveys or even co-creating the design of monitoring uh, this system, you know, that is something that we will be communicating to the board. Uh, just so we can get you all's feedback. And so, again, we want to let you all know that we appreciate you all even uh, being a part of the process up until this point. So thank you all. Uh, trustees, any other questions, comments? If not, I'm going to move us to two last items before we go to executive session. One is one of our, uh, one of the last item on the agenda before we go to exec executive session is a consideration of argument item. And after a discussion with legal counsel, this item is being delayed to a future meeting. So I wanted to make sure that you all knew that. And then, uh, which got some time from our meeting. And then uh, we'll, we're gonna go into executive session in a minute. I just wanna just take a last point of privilege, Dr. Lizalde. You know, thank you so much for your service. I know um, you started with us in 2020 during the pandemic, and 
there's a song that I like that I was just sharing a little while ago. My, Miley Cyrus sings a song called "You Came In Like a Wrecking Ball," <laughs> and oh you you challenged the state to protect our, the health and safety of our kids. You went after systemic racism and disaggregated and helped us disaggregate data on the scorecard, and you helped us focus on student outcomes and when 50, less than 15% of black and Hispanic kids graduating from Austin ISD are getting two-year degrees or higher after eight years of going to high school. And when our scores for white students, poor white students for math and reading are better than economically advantaged Hispanic and black students, you're putting us in the right direction. And I can't tell how much I appreciate that, including all the recapture comments and subject matter expertise around that as well. So thank you very much for your service. I know you're gonna continue it on in another place in Texas, but thank you very much. Thank you. We will now recess the open meeting at 12.39 a.m. and move to executive session pursuant to Texas Government Code sections 551 551.072, 551.073, 551.087, 551.076, and 551.071. For our viewers at home, this concludes our live broadcast. When we're finished with the executive session, we will briefly return to open session to formally adjourn the meeting. The adjournment will be recorded and be included in all replays of tonight's meetings. Thank you for joining us and have a good evening.